It's a tit for tat, and I can't wait to have some fun trivia games with you. Our hashtag of the day, Safaricom Decode. Whenever you want to get in touch with us, on the comments section, up on YouTube, up on Facebook, send me an emoji. If you hear something you like, let me know. If you hear something you don't like, also let me know. But, you know, be nice about it. Also, tweet us at Safaricom PLC, only the verified account, please. We'll be having a bunch of giveaways, so make sure you're speaking to the right account when you are on the Twitter streets. We have hackathons. We have speakers from all over the engineering world. We have master classes. We have giveaways. It's going to be a day full of wonder and excitement. I'm excited to learn, honestly. You cannot see it, but I have a little notebook on my, on my chair so that I can get to know as much as I can about the future of engineering. We're all about problem solving. Safaricom is all about problem solving. And you can't do that without involving as many stakeholders as possible. So that's why we're gathered here today, to make sure that the engineering community and Safaricom engineers are speaking the same language on creating software that is the best for our future. Okay, that's what we're set to do today. I know you're set from all over the country, campuses everywhere, so do not worry about it. Tech is here with us. Just let me know what you're feeling. Stay ready for trivia. Get your, knowledge, your general knowledge going. You know a bit of tech, Kenyan tech, the startup scene. Let me know about the founders of the engineering world. I'm just giving you tips so that in the next 30 minutes, when I have a trivia game for you, okay, you are set and ready to go to win a bunch of airtime. I'm also going to be speaking with some people here. We'll have a nice fireside chat on what the future of engineering looks like. We might even have our own little masterclass. Who knows? So do stay tuned and do stay with us. I'll also be speaking with a Safaricom rep on exactly what it takes to be a member of the Safaricom engineering community. How do I get in there? I'm a student but I see my future and I want to be at a place like Safaricom. How do I get my foot in the door? Is it an internship opportunity? Do I volunteer my time? Do I just go straight to HR and ask for a job straight up? Please do stay interactive with us. Like I said, we'll have a lot of trivia questions. Before we get, we get into all of that, send me an emoji 
emoji. Send me an emoji. Let me know how you're feeling today, okay? And I just might select you. I've got my tab ready. I've got everything ready. So just send me an emoji for what's your vibe for the day. What's your expectation? You can type that out and let me know. And I might just give you airtime for the hell of it. The questions will get harder as we go. But I want to get to know some of the expectations we have. And I have some people coming in to join me on my little beautiful set. And there's students here. I'll welcome them and let them introduce themselves so that they can tell us what they expect from the very first Safaricom Engineering Summit. Karibu, Karibu. Have a seat, guys. Have a seat. Oh, man. Do you want to take my seat? I'm a gentle lady. <laughs> Here you go. Have a seat. All right. So I'll begin by asking you to introduce yourselves, please, and what university you're from, what course you're studying, what your basics. Let's get the ground covered. Can we hear you? I just completed the form. I th try this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Brian, congratulations. First of all, when is graduation day? In December. Okay, I've got a, hopefully I've got a, a little graduation gift for you later. Um, you can introduce yourself as well. Yes, um, Amos Mara. Also completed uh, my computer science studies at Masen University, yeah. awaiting graduation. Okay, yeah. so we've got December graduation set and ready to go. Let me ask you guys, first of all, the very first Safaricom Engineering Summit. When you heard of that, what was your immediate expectation, Brian? I'll start with you. Immediate expectation when you're like Safaricom Engineering Summit. Yeah, it's really mm -hmm. yeah. What about you? Uh, the, the time I had about this, I actually thought and expected to see the state of art in the engineering community. Yeah. When you say state of art? Like what projects maybe Safaricom has and other engineers mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. And more specifically, I wanted to witness how telecommunication industry work because it fascinates me so much. Yeah. Okay, I like that you said the telecommunications industry fascinates you. Have you thought of a career in telecom or what we're now calling, you know, techco? Because Safaricom is aiming to move from a telecommunications company to a techco company. So first of all, have you thought of working in the telecommunic uh, telecommunications industry? And what do you think about this shift from telco to techco? Yeah, sure. I have uh, thought about working in a telecommunication industry. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that uh, technology is advancing greatly. Mm -hmm. Now we have, for example, 4G and 5G, mm -hmm. which use maybe the messages are sent through IP, which we as the software engineers are quite conversant with. So I, I really want to, to be part of that journey yes. and to witness the next revolution in tech. I, I like that. Um, I'll ask something uh, so, so controversial. Brian, first of all, do you see yourself working in the telecommunications industry as well? And then I'll ask about conspiracy theories that you've heard because when we started 4G, well, 5G was launched and when it made its way to Kenya, there was a lot of talk about, oh, 5G this, 5G that, it's brain waves, it's controlling you, it's this. Did you hear any of those conspiracy theories? Um, sorry, so you're saying you're in a program that's teaching young engineers about 5G? About telco uh, staff currently doing the SSL protocol. Let me ask you to repeat it just one more time with this microphone, please. Okay. I'll hold this one. Yeah, so we're part of... Oh, which part? Uh, the whole thing, the last thing you said. Okay. Yeah, so we, we, we are currently in Meliora running a program called Natujenga, where people are... Where, where the young engineers are being equipped with knowledge about some of the telco stuff. Currently, we're doing the S7 protocol, trying to see how SMSs flow and all that. 
Yeah. Okay, that's very interesting. I also want to get to know you guys a little bit better, okay. and I want you to know each other a little bit better. And our online audience can also get in on this. So I'm going to play a really interesting game. Yeah, it's okay. called Two Truths and a Lie. Okay. So Brian, I'll ask you to tell us two truths about yourself and one lie. Don't tell us which one is the lie, and see if we see if we can get it right. Sounds okay. fun. That's right. Yeah. Okay, let's go. Uh, if you're at yeah. home as well, please yeah. try and see if we can guess what Brian's yeah. lie yeah. is yeah. and what's, uh, what two uh, are his himself. truths. It's election season, so we see if, we can, if you're good at sniffing out lies and nonsense. <laughs> okay, let's go, Brian. Um, so three statements? Yes, three statements, two true, one false. I am a Manchester United fan. Okay. I... I do not love. Uh, I do not love Python. Okay. <laughs> and the last statement is. Um, I'm 21. I'll, okay, I'm gonna guess first. I'm going to guess the last statement is the lie, because <laughs> I think you do love Python like the programming language i hope not the animal mm -hmm. um and i do think you're a manchester united fan that's my guess what's yours uh, please pass me the mic yeah yeah he's not a manchester united fan so uh -huh. that is the lie okay and then the other things are yeah. are true yeah, okay sure. so am i losing or am i winning here how am i doing I'm losing. Oh my gosh. Okay. Okay. Your turn now. I think I still have a chance to redeem myself on the 50-50. So your turn. Two statements. One false. Two true. Okay. Uh, the first one. Mm -hmm. I'm not from lower land. Okay. Uh, I'm a football fan. Mm -hmm. I love Java. As a programming language. As a programming language. You know, I think it's a good thing I've eaten breakfast, but my mind just went to the restaurant. <laughs>
Welcome, welcome to our virtual um, Safaricom Engineering Summit and thank you to all of us joining us. Like I said, keep very interactive online on the Facebook and YouTube Live. Let me know who you are um, and what you're feeling so far and what your expectations of the day are about. On Safaricom, hashtag Safar Safaricom Decode. Let us know. Tweet us at Safaricom PLC. My handle is Mariam Bisharpia. I might read out some of your tweets. But first, introduce yourself to us and tell us uh, what's going on and what to expect from this beautiful day. I think this is the perfect place. If ever there was a place to look for the most brilliant tech minds in Kenya, I think this would be the room, virtual or otherwise. So I'll begin by asking you, how did you get interested um, in tech and you know in cloud computing, and how what pulled your interest and drove you into this world? Uh, what pulled my interest in tech is that I've always been um, interested in engineering aspect of life, and uh, at the time when I was doing No problem. <laughs> um, the world is currently having a lot of data getting generated and this is useful data that can be used to give us insights and a lot of information. So cloud computing is the way to go. Absolutely. Yes. And you mentioned that part of the reason why you got into the game um, really early was because at the time people were making a lot of money. And then there's, also, there's always this question of ethics when it comes to tech. Yeah? Have you had any ethical struggles in your career so far? that have made you be like, whoa, should I have maybe gone into like a social science? <laughs> oh, maybe. Uh, the, only, the only dilemma that I've had is um, given the opportunity to go into making a lot of money in corporate yes. and doing a, a, social, a social, social work, um, a social entrepreneurship, which is what we do at Mkuli Mayang. And well, in, a, in as much as the money was attractive, I had to do something that makes more impact. Yes. So, yeah. And you said you're an agri-tech platform, right? Yes, yes. So, tell me about young people and agriculture. Is this what was needed to get young people interested again? Because for the longest time, everybody moves to Nairobi and forgets about that food, like we get sustenance from literally Ashamba, you know. Is this what we needed, tech, to at least get young people back onto the, the agriculture wave? It's not a wave, it's sustenance, but yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, really, so that's what Mkulimayang, that's what the aim is to get young people interested in agriculture because we are not feeding ourselves. The average age of a farmer is 65 years in Kenya. 65? Yes, and you can imagine that over 75% of Kenyans yeah. are under the age of 35. So we are young and we are not farming. farming yes. So who is feeding us? Yeah. So yes, so this platform was, uh, was brought forward to attract people towards agriculture. Mm -hmm. And yes, it has given a push because uh, we, we've seen a lot of people join agriculture and use our services uh, and, and they get interested. We are not there yet, but we are getting there. Yeah, more young people need to get invested in agriculture. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And I, you've already told me your expectations for the day. I'll ask you just one off the cuff question um, to wrap up this interview. Is there a person that you've had your eye on? Maybe you see them on LinkedIn, on Instagram, on something. And you're like, you know what? I hope to bump into them into this room today. I hope I can get like five minutes with this person, either to network or to just be a fangirl or, you know, to build with them anything. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. yes, you said that was going to be a tough question. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope it, I know the answer will be juicy. Um, so there are a lot of people that uh, I have been following in the tech ecosystem of Kenya. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of people building and doing a lot of uh, cool work. Um, I think one of the persons that I have been following since my campus days uh, is uh, Techie who does Android. His name is uh, Juma. Mm -hmm. And I hope he'll be here. 
Yeah. I've seen such a name on the program, so <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you get to meet him. Thank you so much for making time for us and joining us. We'll now um, hand over to the main audience. I'm going to hand over to my main host, Mbugwa Njihia. We are just about to get the fun started and see all the master classes, see all the live demos, hear about um, Safaricom engineers and what they're doing to make tech and to make software and to make engineering that is better for you, that takes care of you. Like I said, keep it interactive. I'll be back here with trivia. I'll be back here with giveaways. I'll be back here with fireside chats. So keep all of that interactive. YouTube, Facebook, the emojis, the comments, everything. Keep it coming. Hashtag Safaricom Decode on Twitter. But for now, let me hand over to Mbugwa Njihia. Karibuni, 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 and good morning. May I request that all my lovely backbenchers to move in front, please? There may be goodies, there may be not, but kindly move in front. Thank you so much. You're welcome. It's great to see everyone, despite the July chill. I know yes. you're going in a trying to speak a Which one is it that's not? But it's fantastic that you guys have been able to make it. My name is Mbogwan Jehia, and along with my co-host, Mariam, who's been outside engaging with the virtual audience, we will be your facilitators for the next two days in what promises to be a really amazing uh, set of hours, you know, with master classes, with fireside chats, and insightful sessions, and hopefully also networking ones that, um, that essentially form part of what is the first ever Safaricom Engineering Summit. First, a bit of housekeeping. On your, on your right is where the bathrooms are, if you need to go, on your right. And also, in case of emergency, you can either go to your left or your right. You can clearly see that um, it's marked as, as, um, as exit. I would like to recognize our host this morning as we get to start. I see George Njogona, who's the Director of Information Technology at Safaricom. I see Paul Kasimu, who's the Chief Human Resource Officer. And also in the crowd, I see Elizabeth. Elizabeth, where are you? Elizabeth Anguli, who's a HOD. Engine, HOD Digital Engineering. This event is both in person with you guys here and also live. So we are streaming on the Safaricom handles on, on YouTube and Facebook. And please be part of that conversation by following the hashtag Safaricom Decode. Engage, participate. There are lots of trivias going to be happening and, uh, and uh, lots of prizes to be given. So now, interestingly, Safaricom is on this journey and you've had Mariam uh, mention it for those on the online audience looking to transition from a telecommunications company to a technology company. And this summit in many ways is an invitation to you guys and also to you guys virtually to join in that journey that essentially encompasses many people. You know, they're designers, they're software engineers, they're um, product managers, they're ops people, essentially growing and lifting and lifting that ecosystem to where, to where we need to be or where we can be. I see George is keen and excited to get us started with our, first, with our first keynote. But before he does that, in true African fashion and flair, and to also chase away some of this July chill, welcome on stage the Sarakasi dancers.
ladies and gentlemen, George Jogona. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be here. I think uh, I'm sure you all enjoyed the fantastic dancers. One thing I'll tell you is I will not be dancing, although I have my favorite DJ here. But I'll start with a quote from Steve Jobs. He said, we're here to put a dent in the universe. Otherwise, why are we even here? I believe today, all of us here together, Safaricom, engineering community, our sponsors, our guests, and you, the developers, you've joined us to put a dent in the universe. But at Safaricom, this dent did not start today. It's been building up over time. As I've listened to the stories of this great company over 20 years, really a telco, but the early software engineers were creating USSD solutions. They were working on vast value-added services. They were working on interfaces, but they were not called software engineers. They were just part of the telco engineering community. And so many of the products and services that have made this company great were really done by a handful of people who are somewhere there behind the scenes but mainly building integrations, uh, working on interfaces, but really, for many years, leaving a lot of the development uh, to big vendors and partners who were working with Safaricom. But several years ago, we began our agile transformation, and all of a sudden, we started putting a community together and started talking about digital engineering being its own unique capability. And we said that it's not just integrations and interfaces and batch jobs uh, that the teams can do. And we trusted them to do a lot more. And I'm so happy right now to note that there are so many developments, releases of note, and you'll see many of them across the room. Many we've worked with our partners, including on the M-Pesa ecosystem, on the consumer business side and enterprise side, including Safaricom app which for many years had been done by a vendor, but we said so a few years ago that it was possible to trust our local engineers to develop it. And I'm very happy to note that that app is the highest rated app on the stores within Kenya, on both Android and iOS. Please give a clap to the team that took this bold step. It no longer has downtimes. We're able to respond and react to the customer quickly. We're able to integrate our various business teams. And it was the UX, UI work, front-end, back-end development is all being done. We've taken it a step further, and we're looking at big data and integration of machine learning, artificial intelligence. And again, all of this is being done by our software engineering community. We've built the team to about 500 right now. And we feel it's time to at least announce that we're making a dent, not just in Kenya, but in Africa and the universe. So I'm so excited for, to be standing on this stage, really excited about the, the teams who've come together, our partners, we'll be mentioning them later, to really make this a success. I know many times people look at Safaricom as a telco with a fintech, but we've really said that we are going to be a purpose-led technology company. And so this is just the beginning. 
And we're going to be giving not just our software engineering community, but our partners uh, opportunities to display some of the latest technology. You don't always have to build everything from scratch. You can build on platforms that have been made. We'll be talking about open source. We'll be talking about low code, no code. We'll be talking about going to cloud. We'll be talking about big data and the opportunities it brings. If Kenya is to become the silicon savanna, it will not happen without a strong software engineering community. Which I've talked about what we've done on the channel side, what we're doing on big data, but also there's a challenge to the team and to this community that we can go into core platforms. And I'm happy about Kamochi is here and he'll be talking about what they're doing. What we call our core platforms, the big systems that run, how can we also do that? And I'm happy that our partners are here, uh, the big partners we work with, because we're going to build this together. I've always said and been very passionate that the challenges that we face in Africa can only truly be solved by Africans. You who lives in that community, someplace in Northeastern, you're the one who knows the solution, where the shoe really hurts the most and the solution that your community needs. I also believe that it's not about giving people handouts, but it's really about empowering people by giving them opportunities to be creative and to build. So with those few words, I'd like to declare the Safaricom Engineering Community Summit open, named Decode. Thank you so much. Over to you, Njay, here. Actually, not, not, not so fast, not so fast. Huh? Huh? I mean, an open we are, but I think it's interesting that um, you, of all people, understand the journey that it's taken us to get here. Because I remember many conversations, both um, in person and also online, mm -hmm. saying that you know, it's, only, it's only the big guys who used to do this stuff. I mean, yes. it's, the, it's the Airbnbs, it's the Facebooks, it's the uh, AWSs that have such communities that have bring people together and say, what can we do together to mm -hmm. build? Mm -hmm. So for me, I'm actually excited that we are, we are here now. Yeah. It's been a while coming, and mm. it's fantastic, like you say, to be on this stage, yeah. uh, to be able to launch this community. And remember, the community is large, and it involves everyone in that, in that, um, in that ecosystem. Mm. So as, as George takes his seat... But Jehia, you've also been part of it. I think you've been part of a lot of the vast work. What, was it just SMSs, or what were you doing? Interestingly, you know, that first ever KCSC, KCP service, yeah. this face, much younger, was, was on TV launching that. Yeah. I mean, we did, we did fantastic then. I mean, the late George Saitoti was the minister then. Mm. And you know, one of the things I remember walking to um, the, the examination board mm. and pitching the idea, they said, but it, 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 it doesn't make sense. Mm. I mean, George's folks will go to school and the results will be on the board. Mm. But then when you look at solutions and, and, and here's where the community comes in place where you know, an engineer can build, but it takes someone else to also connect it to the marketplace. Mm. They said, look at the social dynamics. George is a, is a favorite, is a favorite uh, nephew to someone. George has an arch enemy neighbor. You know, that, 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 that lady says, that, that, that George, that Jogona, nothing. You know, and then of course there's the several other dynamics. So one person has a network of five people that would be interested in those results. And not everyone can take leave and travel to, if you went to Kamusinga, mm. and take two days off yeah. to go. Mm. So the ability to now see solutions become visible or become a bit obvious is, is fantastic. Yeah. So it's great to see this community come together and hopefully you know, we'll create what you call that collective lift and take yeah. our industry to the next level, not only in Kenya, but, but across the continent. And, Help I, me. and I think also it's, it's, it's key for people to see what we are doing. And I think so many times, I think as, as engineers, we don't tell our story. And uh, the story of Africa in many ways is told through uh, pictures of, of starvation, of drought, corruption. At least it wasn't in Africa where people were storming a swimming pool. But I believe the story of developers and engineers also needs to be told. And I hope Jay here, and I trust you, you are great at telling stories, that you and others who have a very large platform will be able to help us tell the story of the engineering community in Kenya. Because it's big, and they've done big things. Correct. But Safaricom, I think, with the reach we have, and the way we are able to do connectivity, we are then able to, to prepare a platform uh, together with you and others mm -hmm. where the stories can be told. But it's not just the stories of the past. Everything in, is behind us. 
it's also the stories of where we're going. And also sharing failures, you know, as, as yes. engineers, I mean, we're going to have a session on, on chaos engineering. Mm. It's not only the successes and, you know, this went well, but mm. also this went really badly. Yeah. Yeah. So those, those use cases, both good and bad, will serve us all well. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, man. Aribu Sana, Asante. help me give uh, George a round of applause as he sits down. Now, unless you've been living under a rock, one of the conversations that you must have heard of, and it flares ever so often, is that of technology talent. Every three months, there's something that comes on Twitter, and it blows up, and it's like the guy's big tech is in town. And it's taking everyone's talent, you know, from SMEs to, to, to big corporates. You know, LinkedIn nowadays just buzzes. Brrr, happy to announce new, new job, leaving, going, which is exciting. But there's no one best placed to tell us what are the real things happening within HR than Paul Kasimu. Paul Kasimu is the Chief Human Resource Manager at Safaricom, and I'd like you to help me welcome him on stage as he talks to us about the future of engineering talent in Kenya. Paul, stage is yours. But I was having a chat with the Michael, who will soon be speaking after this. And it reminded me of uh, Chinua Achebe, an African writer of those days, prolific writer, who said, water, water everywhere, and not a drop to drink. In Africa, we have certificates, certificates everywhere, and I'm still struggling to fill some positions. So you ask, where is the disconnect between the spend we are having in education and skills development and the lack of jobs that we can't fill today. We're also talking of the landscape and I, I said let me see whether I can uh, speak to a few things and I'm always reminded something called uh, user, user challenges but if you ask me today we're in the fourth industrial revolution and in the People are talking of COVID, and I say, no, 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 no. This was there before you even came in. So the first industrial revolution, I think that was long before our time. But you can remember the physical labor, basic engineering, learning a skill. That was it. Those years earlier on. Then we came to the second industrial revolution, where the sociologists and the economists would tell you of Mike, um, I mean, a Taylor, division of labor, specialization. Perhaps. Some of us will, have, will know our fathers or our uncles who were there during the third industrial revolution, the computer age. And the computer age is known for, and I'll, I'll tell you this because I, I think I, I was there when it happened. Don't ask me in what form or shape. But I'm told computer age came in and the first thing from an employment bit was, why are you taking our jobs away? Computers are taking our jobs away. But it was also, how do you skill? And when we were in high school, we used to have um, typists. You know, they would type. I'm really boring you with the history, but let, uh, just listen. In, indulge me. And there was something that uh, when a typist made a mistake, they would use a, a whiteout. So one of those typists worked in, a, in an organization. And guess what? Given a computer, she made a, a typing error, and she went for a whiteout to to correct the mistake, obviously, the rest is history. But I think the point that we are making is, long before um, COVID, we saw the fourth industrial revolution. So the digital age, not the information age, and a big one, the learning agility. And that's why we are doing what we are doing today. And I'll come to a couple of slides and then I'll stop there. But the reason we are doing this is that we believe at Safaricom, 
we want to be, and we are actually, a technology company, a purpose-led technology company. And that's why we are bringing the community of like-minded technology thinkers, software engineers, to start driving that conversation. The question is, and as I speak to you, I think I'm speaking to even those not in the room, is why are we spending so much money training irrelevant qualifications, certifications, when we should be asking where is the future going? So I think I thought I would share that slide, just not for anybody else, but for all of us to say we are doing the right thing. If you ask me about what is work, I will say www. So there is work is changing. The workforce is changing. The workplace is changing. I say this. If you look at the five generations in the workplace, so we are now seeing about emerging millennials are coming to about 75% of the workforce. My current workforce uh, average age is about 34, 35. George has messed up the average. I think it was better than that. Never mind mine. But you can see the number of people who are coming in. Average years in a job, this is changing. Not for you guys. I'm told when you work on a project, you have already, that is experience. And you can't be asked to do any longer than that. But I think it also talks of the contingent workers. The gig economy is coming up. This was before COVID. So we are now saying, so what you are doing and why we are here today is the right thing. And obviously, the flexi working now with hybrid working came earlier than ever before. That's a small print. But it talks to what are we seeing in terms of numbers. So a growth in number of uh, engineers. But look at uh, the, yeah, we are saying 716. I was talking to some of the partners. And they said, you know what? While those numbers are there, when you look at the craftsmanship, actually we may end up with almost maybe 10% of those who are real engineers. The rest are wannabe. And I, I'm not saying they are not, but in terms of certification, we may not have. But look at the startups. And I was talking to a colleague of mine in Egypt, and they're saying, you know what? We can't keep talent. They are going to startups. They are not interested in uh, pension. They are not interested in employment bits. And, and therefore, when we are now talking of what we are doing today, we are not just training for an organization. We are training for an ecosystem. The demographic uh, graphics, 80% uh, of deaths are under 35 years. So that tells you again, we must give way. I'm looking at the median age in Kenya is 19 years. What does that tell you? If we can influence that median age to become that, then we have changed the whole bit. There's a player who came and set up an office opposite mine. I will not say the name. And said, I am setting a hub in Africa and I'm looking for 500 engineers. And then I saw people going into LinkedIn because in LinkedIn you can see activity. And my engineering community, when I was talking to George as he was coming, I was like, George, come here. We want to create a big thing. We are seeing now, I was telling Michael again, the ta war for talent is over. And when I look at the battlefield, talent has won, not organizations. So I think it's a case of saying we want to do that. And of course, I talked about remote working. I was looking at uh, what is driving the digital future. When you look at uh, the big four agenda in the government, when you look at big tech firms setting up in Kenya, I think that's a big one. And thank you for those of you who flew from Dubai, from uh, San Francisco, from Southern Africa, from your homes to come here. Because that tells us we have an opportunity to create something bigger than us. And that is why we are saying, let's join hands to create a real place because the problem is if you don't train you end up going into price war and that's why we are even saying as organizations we want to bring a community of all organizations to start talking about can we try start training for the economy can we train for the region can we train for the continent so a big one the digital evolution comes from us and i hope in the next two or three days the next two days we'll start creating something bigger than this as you tweet, let's tweet. Now, I'm coming towards the end of my, my bit. And I'm, as I speak to you, I want you to look at first the forest before you go to the trees of what you're doing. And guess what? If you look at the future, 
we are talking of integrating technology with the human aspect of everything. So open source talent, again, you can't... Before, I used to bond talent. So we train you and we bond. I worked in an airline. I joined when we had 140 uh, pilots, ended up uh, when I was leaving, we had 400 pilots, and we bonded them, so they couldn't go anywhere. I was telling George, I want to bond the 500 engineers. He told me, Paul, what have you been smoking? Because it's not legal. You can't. So I think that piece of um, the bit, therefore, for skilling and reskilling, moving on to the whole piece of uh, the careers, the E-shaped careers is where you come in, but then with agile technology, we are now finding people working across. So it's not a vertical thing. You don't have to be an engineer to be who you want to be later. So you can actually develop more careers as you walk. Soft skill development is still big. So even as engineers, I'll say one of the things when I'm looking for talent, I'll also ask, so who are you? What drives you? We're having that conversation again with Michael. And how do you do... EQ is a big one. We set up an innovation hub. It's a Faricom, four years ago. And we said, yes, come in. And you are brainy. There's no question about that. But then the, how do you also connect with the rest of the organization? Because you can be a nice, great tech. But then you may find you actually just misplaced. And I've seen such in people. And therefore, even as we talk, we are also saying the future of uh, work is such that you must look for ways of how do you attract and retain talent. So I think a big story, the future there is, I normally say three things, mindset, skill set, tool set. And that's why we at Safaricom are saying, how do we start influencing the thinking around growth, employability. I tell guys, don't worry about whether you have job security. Who cares? If you have employment security, you can be anywhere. I would have hoped this room would be full with engineers. They're still sleeping. But I was told, uh, yeah, work is a space, not a place, so they don't have to be here. You get me? And I also hear I don't have to be here. I can be here remotely, which is fine. But I think it's also the mindset that we are seeing in some of you. And therefore, the mindset is as big as the skill set and obviously the tool sets that we give you. I want to stop in this slide. So there is a skill shortage. The reason Safaricom wants to be known as a technology company, purpose-led, is because we want to start addressing the shortage that we have in the skills, if you look at that. If you look at the industry readiness, we were talking of those days when we used to have Kenya Polytechnic, where we had technologies who were fit for purpose. When we talk of tech, the next two days, we want to influence the readiness. And if you can help us do that as corporate, I think that will be a great one. And in our case, we have also started looking at how we address the skill shortage through the digital academy. We train our people but we also partner with some of you to certify our guys. And obviously, collaboration is a thing that we want to play. I don't want to go beyond that. Mine is to say it is an exciting morning, exciting two days. Let's tweet as much as we can and watch this space because one of the things I have done, and yesterday I did a letter to all the big tech companies, all of them who are within town. I wrote to about five universities and we did several corporates. And we want to launch an industry-wide partnership and collaboration where we can start now driving development of future fit talent. I welcome you to this spot. Thank you very much, and do have a good morning. Asante, Paul. I think, I think it's great that Safaricom is not shying away. Just stay on stage, please. That, yes, that Safaricom is not shying away from being a tech, a tech factory. Because, I mean, it's, it's a thankless job, but, you know, someone's got to do it, someone's got to bite the bullet. But let me ask you um, a question that probably not everyone answers properly whenever that issue of talent um, arises on, on the interwebs. Um, on remuneration and compensation, I know you've said uh, we're going into an, a into an age where we look at variable compensation, right? But in this point in time, should we be looking at compensating at global rates or at, at local rates? Because enough people say, you know, I'm an engineer. If I move to Silicon Valley, you know, I'd be earning um, X, 
X thousand dollars, you guys are not seeing the worth that, that what I'm bringing to the table. What's your, what's your opinion on that particular aspect? So I'll say the answer is in the question. Mm -hmm. It depends on what you want to attract. If you want to attract global talent, you must start playing at a global level mm -hmm. because talent is mobile. And guess what? We're also finding with the hybrid working, people don't have to relocate. So they can actually get out of town. One thing we've done with the agile uh, ways of working at Safaricom is we started now looking at profiling our talent based on craftsmanship. So when you look at craftsmanship, you look at level one, which is what you call a, maybe an apprentice. Mm -hmm. The second level is a practitioner. Then you go to professional, expert, and mastery. And we've discovered when you don't place people in the right place, they go. And if you look at the players who have set up in town, um, I was told to speak uh, generally rather than specifically. <laughs> You're finding the, the, their pay scale has a certain number that is not K. It Correct. looks like an S, but it is kind of uh, split. So if you, if you don't do that, guess what happens? Talent moves. I have some of them here, and the question has been, because we saw attrition. Yes. And attrition is like migration. Only the capable migrate. You have people who you want to resign, but they never go anywhere. <laughs> the, one you, the ones you want to keep are the ones who are now, you must do something around them. So we are looking at differentiated pay. Mm -hmm. We are looking at performance-linked reward. But then we are also starting to ask people, what will make you stay here? And we discovered, by the way, two things. Mm -hmm. Workplace, the, con the situation, in terms of the environment you create, is as big as the pay you give. Give me autonomy, self-empowered teams, let me make mistakes, let me grow. The other one is a quality of leadership. Mm -hmm. And that's why I spent so much time spending on how do we grow leaders? Because 67% of people leave line managers, not organizations. So we're also looking at how do we change baby boomers and the others who believe status to allow the talent that we need to stay and, and thrive. So yes, pay, you must be competitive, but also there's more than just the pay that makes people stay, especially also purpose. A purpose-led organization will make people stay longer than just the pay alone. Fantastic insights. As you take your seat, uh, help me appreciate um, Paul one more time. And I think for, 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 those, for those who are in school, I mean, I, I know we have, we have high schoolers who have graced the event. So whether you're in high school or in campus, at least you have a rough idea of where to play now or how to plan your trajectory, right? And for those of us who've already been invested in the space, you know how to maybe level up and how to adjust. I agree with Paul on the, on the element of, you know, this, now we call them TVETs, but you know, when you, you talk about specialities, I think it's important that we go back to those, um, to those basics. Because when I started, in any organization that went in, you actually walk through that journey, and most of the time, by the time you're, you're leaving, you know, you're, you, you, you've been sharpened to a level that you actually feel confident that you can be able to go and create value. But you're seeing cases now where perhaps um, with a erroneous level of expectation, you've got talent that may expect a certain position or remuneration without seeing the exact benefit that they'd be delivering to, uh, to the organization. Now, moving on to the next segment, it's not just enough to build. We can build all we want, but if you build in the darkness and no one uses it, there's, there's, it, it, there's no value there, absolutely zero. So in our next conversation, I'd like to welcome Michael Onyango, the founder of the Forgotten Bottom Billions, who will speak to us about the developer ecosystem and the funding opportunities in Africa. You see, we're coming from a situation where we're looking at the talent, but the talent has to create stuff that then resonates with the market because that's why you're looking for funding and whatnot for that to expand. So Michael Onyango, stage is yours, Karibu. Good morning. Good morning again. I'm a bit offended that when Paul was welcoming the guests from Dubai, from everywhere else, he didn't welcome the guests from Europe. And I flew from Europe last night to be here. So I need to welcome myself from Europe. It's a great to be here. And I'm very excited 
at what Safaricom has decided to initiate because with the convening power that Safaricom has, I am sure that as a country and as a region, we're going to make a big dent. But first and foremost, if I may also just um, formally also welcome all the people who have flown into Nairobi last evening to be with us here, that you didn't make a right choice. And for you, if this is your first time in Kenya or your first time in Nairobi, let me just give you a few tidbits here and there. So Nairobi is the only capital city in the whole world that has the highest number of migratory birds passing through at any time of the year. I'm sure many of you may have not have known that, so yes. And for those of you who do not know a bit more about this country, the only country again in the whole world that has got seven ecological zones. That is from the desert all the way up to snow. So, great place to be in. Really excited to be here uh, because in as much as I've spoken about the geographical and the interesting tidbits about this country, let me speak a little bit about our talent as Kenyans. As you know, AWS is here, Google is here, Microsoft is here, Stanchart is here, and I could possibly go on and on. Visa Innovation is here, and lots of other people are also here. Oracle, anybody who's anybody in the tech sector is actually here, has a presence in Kenya, and there's a reason why everybody has a presence here. The reason is actually those of you who are sitting in this room, and I always, I always want to make it clear to people, to Kenyans who may not understand just who we are and who you are. This is the country that has the best human talent and resource on this continent. And that is a fact. I don't say it because I'm Kenyan. I say it because if you look around the world, and I'll just mention just one or two names here and there. Tesla, for a very long time, the director who was in charge of engineering was actually a Kenyan called Charles Mwangi, who has now left and has gone ahead and started his own venture under a stealth operation. And I could possibly go on and on and on and on and on and speak about other Kenyans who have similar capacity. But what I love about each and every single one of you in this room is that uh, if you look at the primary schools or the secondary schools that have produced this talent that is running some of the biggest things in the world, it has a lot to say about what we still have and must do. So I was asked to speak about community development and what we need to do or what we can or what we must do so that the numbers that we just saw that Paul presented before us can become an opportunity for us to own and take up. Already as 4BM that you probably heard being mentioned before, Forgotten Bottom Millions, we are present in 47 plus one different counties. And I'm um, extremely excited that within our membership, we have people who have continued and are doing big things across the world. And I want to put some names and some faces so that you can all relate with who we are and what we have here. So just about two months ago, does anybody here know of the Y Combinator? Anybody heard of the Y Combinator? Great, I can see quite a number of you have heard of them. So the Y Combinator is actually the biggest um, startup accelerator group in the whole world. And um, if you know Airbnb, if you know Dropbox, 
those were all actually incubated from the Y Combinator before they got the series of fundings that they finally ended up with. Well, just about two months ago, there is our own local Kenyans who have just been also admitted to the Y Combinator. And um, one of them, the high school, or sorry, the, the primary school that he went to is a primary school called, if I can recall rightly, it's a primary school somewhere in deep South Nyanza that nobody has heard of. But the secondary school that he went to was Miranda, which is a national school, and then proceeded to University of Nairobi, but dropped out as he was studying medicine to form a company that's called Kuza Lab and Patika. Patika is run by a 24-year-old who has never completed university, employs 21 people, and everything that he's doing in his company, Patika, that serves 30,000 businesses, is self-taught from the University of YouTube. Currently, only two companies got admitted from six companies from Africa into the Y Combinator this year. Two from Kenya, and the only one from Kenya, and that was Patika. That is P-A-T-I-K-A. You can Google them and you can check them out. This is just an example of why being here today is such an important thing for us and what Safaricom is putting together. Paul, as you write to your corporates and as you write to all the big different corporations that are here, ensure that within your dynamic, you must include all the tech hubs across this country. There's 52 of them. I can assist you with the context of how to get through to them. Because for us to succeed and for this to work out, Nairobi is not Kenya and Kenya is not Nairobi. And I've said this for decades. And there's so much that is happening out of Nairobi that you may not know of and you may have never seen. And let me just show you how vibrant and just what kind of a talent we have that is outside Nairobi that a lot of you may have never heard about. A couple of years ago, when I wore a different hat, and I then served and I worked for the great county in Kisumu, I was responsible as a minister for communication, information, and technology. I had a program that was for class eight leavers. And this is how my program was designed. If you had completed Form 4, you were overqualified and you could not get into my code program. Yes, you heard me right. You were overqualified and you could not get into my program. Why was that the case? Because when I went into the county, and which is also common across this whole country, we have a whole lot of standard eight leavers who never made it to Form 4, not because they were not capable, but because they did not have the money or the financial capacity to complete their schooling. Long story short, we trained 700 young people. Out of the 700 young people that we trained, that was back in 2007, sorry, 2015, three of them, as I stand on this stage right now, are currently working, and were working way before COVID, before online work became the in thing to do, had already started working and continue to work for a company that is based in Europe. And I am protecting them because uh, I know Kerry will, would like to get to know who they are, but they've worked successfully, working remotely from Kisumu, standard eight leavers who never finished Form 4, and they're earning in that sign that Paul said, that S with a slash that goes through it. What's my point? Paul has made a very important point that we all need to know. Paperwork is just paper. 
just because you sat in a classroom somewhere and you came out with that paper that says, that has some letters before your name or after your name, doesn't say too much. It just means that you can sit in a room like this, listen to what I'm saying, and later on you can tell me back what I said. And that's where it ends. It doesn't go beyond that. So please, young people in this room, don't come flashing papers to people. It doesn't mean anything. And I've got to tell you the truth. There are many people who work in different hubs. I'm very closely associated with Swahili Port, which is in Mombasa. And I'm glad to know that um, Ashley, one of our members is here, mining the stand for Mozilla. But we continue to work with communities. Oracle, for a very long time, has continued to work with us in Mombasa in terms of training and ensuring that people have the right skills. Note, not the papers. The right skills that can enable you to be able to actually work. We do understand, of course, that there are some challenges. And earlier on, I was speaking to Paul. And one of the things that I would be asking for from Safaricom within this whole equation is that can there be a way in which the hubs, especially those that are not in Nairobi, can get affordable internet connectivity. Note, I didn't say free. I said affordable internet connectivity so that we can be able to develop communities within that level and not everybody having to migrate into Nairobi. Because the result of this will therefore mean that the numbers that we want to build up, we can build up. Again, let me go back to the paper that I keep talking about and why a paper is not that relevant. But again, I want to give a story. So a couple of years ago, in another job that I had, and I was sharing this with Paul earlier on, we needed to hire somebody to come and help us serve one of our clients. Again, um, names we've held. And the client was fairly large, still is fairly large, they've continued to grow. And amongst the people that brought in the applications were people from some had graduated from the UK, some had graduated from the campuses here locally, and some even had master's degrees. But the person that I ended up taking was a gentleman who had never been to university and had only been trained at KIMC, Kenya Institute of Mass Communication. Um, he came, worked with us for about three years, but I told him, you'll have to go back to, to college because not everybody's like me. You must get a degree, otherwise, Career-wise, you will not be able to move, which he did. Long story short, the gentleman right now, and you can all Google him, his name is Paul Baraza, and is the head of Novartis East Africa Communications. I could not emphasize more that it is the skills and the soft skills that you pick up that are most important and that will get you going forward. Things are changing rapidly and quickly. I am extremely excited about our population numbers. I'm extremely excited about the number of young people they are. I'm extremely excited about all the problems that we have because that simply means opportunity, 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 opportunity. Young people, with access to the internet, with access to the right mentees, with access to the right communities, it is possible to actually stay where you are and develop the right skill sets that will continue to drive a lot of these huge corporations that are now setting foot and setting place here. But let me also be honest and very selfish. I want to see more particulars coming up. 
I want to see more of you here setting up startups. I want to see more of you going head to head with Huawei, going head to head with Oracle. And I'm not ashamed to say that. I'm not ashamed to say it because it is you who are currently driving whatever it is that they're doing within the corporations that they're running here. So never forget that. Remember, it is your brain power. It's your ability to see things differently. And that's why you're, they're here. The fact that you think differently from the young people back in the US, you think differently from the young people in Belgium, you think differently from the young people in Hong Kong is what is bringing them here. So you must also, as you learn to be developers, you must also ensure that you're studying about IP, intellectual property. Extremely and extremely important. Every single Thursday, as 4 p.m., we have something called Knowledge Thursdays, where we ensure that our young people are taught for free the skills that they need so that the next oracles, the next Huawei's, the next Safaricoms must be indigenous businesses that are owned and driven by us. This is our time. This is your time as a continent. And there is no way, there is no way things will ever be the same. The continent with the largest growth in terms of population is this one. As a country, we're literally geographically about four to six hours by flight to anywhere across this continent. There's so much going for us and there's so much going for you that you must know. In terms of funding, which I want to touch slightly on, funding will never be a problem and funding will never be something to worry about. There's enough capital around the world that people are looking for where to invest their money. Many of you may know or may not know that in Europe, if you put your money in a bank, you actually pay them to keep your money for you. The investment is actually zero. You're actually losing out. So people are looking for investments where they can actually put in their money and get better returns from. So back to the community develop developers. Young people do not work alone. You've got to work with each other. When you work with each other, we become stronger, bigger, and better. There's many hubs, like I've said, that are around the country. And I want to encourage you all. I know, for example, in Eldred, there's Eldo Hub that exists there. I know that um, up in Western Kenya, there is Lake Hub that also exists on the other side. I know down on the coast, there is Swahili Port Hub that also exists. But there's many, many more from those that I've just mentioned. Is it important to learn how to become a developer? Yes, it is. It is so important because it's now going to become second nature. And all this time that we've been speaking here, we've not even spoken about the metaverse. And I'm not here to explain terminologies to you because those are the things that you can get from Google. But I'm here to let you know what you must do so that when we go into spaces like the metaverse, we actually have ownership of the things that are there. So I'm going to encourage everybody here, you must go and study the basics of what NFTs are, the basics of what blockchain is, Know it, own it, 
And at any time, when you're negotiating with the various talent seekers who are here, I ask and I advise, do not rush to sign anything. Do not rush. I have to look after you. This is my home. You're my people. You're the ones that I know. Their interests, when they've come here, they're also looking after themselves. Safaricom, I am confident that they are and they will continue to look after us because government also has a major stake in Safaricom. I'm also a shareholder in Safaricom. I also have shares in Safaricom. So there's ways in which we can continue to partner and to work with them. But young people, I want more particulars out of you. I want you developing the platforms that go head, on, head to head with Oracle. I want you to develop the platforms that go head to head with Huawei. I know them and they are my friends. I know senior people that work in all these companies that I'm speaking about. But that does not mean that we must not think about the future. I am so happy that as 4BM, Forgotten Bottom Millions, we have continued to ensure that we've provided a place where we give people access to fully funded scholarships and training opportunities, to grant opportunities, the ones which are genuine, so that none of you here can ever say that you're stuck and you do not know where to get resources from. I am looking forward in the next couple of months, in about six months or so, that we shall and will be able, together with what Safaricom has started as the Safaricom Engineering Summit, to exceed the 500 that Paul is looking for. And Paul, a secret, to help you get your 500, let's move out of Nairobi. Let us go into the counties. I am glad that in a couple of days' time, we're going to elections. Young people, you must vote. You must vote. You must vote. If you don't vote, you must shut up. You must shut up. You must shut up for another five years. Because who you vote for will determine what happens in terms of infrastructure, digital infrastructure, in terms of having access to different setups where companies like Safaricon can come and engage with the local county governments that you put into place. But it can only happen if you also do your part. A bit of history about who you are also. The first engineer was actually an Egyptian. If I recall rightly, I think that was 23 BC, if I remember rightly. And his name was um, M. Hoptem, I-M-T-O-H-E-P. That was the first engineer in the whole world. So engineering is within your blood. It's not foreign. It is something which you can, you must, you shall, and you will do. So my request, as I wind up and thank Safari Khan for having asked me to be here, is that so long as, and for those of you who may not be, there's one Bible phase that I really love, and I'll ask you all to check it out. So, you know, um, if you look at Exodus 4.2, just Google Exodus 4.2, it'll give you anything and everything that you need to help you go forward with your life. Anything 
that you want is in the verse Exodus 4.2. Your future is in your hands and it's what you do with your future that will make you where you want to get to. So please go back, rethink, reevaluate yourselves. The metaverse is something which you must all start thinking about now from this second going forward immediately. And let us already start thinking of how we are cornering that particular space. Because as a people and as a nation, we are and we must take our rightful place on this continent as the drivers of technology on this continent and to the world. Thank you. I love what you said about Nairobi should not, rather is not, and should not be the nucleus that we focus on. Because there are a lot of people who are innovating in the, in, the, in the shadows, and they're not in the shadows because they want to be there. It's just because, you know, that is their circumstance. <clears throat> but maybe a question before you take a seat. And you've spoken passionately about the self-taughts. While Paul spoke about, from the 750, when the rubber meets the road, he's speaking about looking at only 10% um, in terms of people who are, who are actually skilled. What's your opinion on how, how do we bridge that gap to make sure that you know, there's no, there are no nefarious actors wanting to bring in some funny bills that were defeated the other day? Like a hydra, we believe it made rare its ugly head. But how do we avoid that situation, but at the same time bring inclusivity into the community so that we don't have people saying, I've got the papers, you don't, so I'm better than you yet. We're saying we also feel that there's a shortage in terms of skills and talent. Thank you very much for that question. And let me give some context to why. Um, so our education system was set up by the British. And our current education system is a system of elimination. Because there's not enough places in secondary school, at primary school, the bar is raised so that only X number of people that can pass can go on. And that continues. When we get to secondary school, again, there's only so many university places. So we cut off people, not because they're dumb, but because of the amount of space that we have. So coming back, and what you're asking to connect with Paul, we now need to be able to show people that there is other ways and places where you can actually acquire talent. In fact, we need to purposefully create these environments and these spaces where people can come in and actually, we can actually direct them and point them towards the kind of talent that is also the people like Paul are seeking and others within this room so that they're able to get skilled in those talents and therefore fill those jobs that Paul says he's not able to fill. So because you people are sitting in this room, I know it's like a reset but um, it is good to go to university. It is not a must. Thank goodness I went to university myself. So you cannot say that I'm only saying that because I don't have a degree. I do have a degree, and by the way, a Bachelor of Science, FYI. So it is more beyond just that paper. So I think, coming back to you, because of the elimination system that we have, we need to go back and rethink. And one of the things that I think the Safaricom and the people in this room can do very quickly and very fast is actually create those spaces with whatever is already in place and just work together in terms of us being able to get that new talent out. That's it. Help me thank Michael as he takes his seat. I see a few yawns in the room. We'll be, we'll be, we're due for a sugar break soon. But speaking into spaces, um, and like Michael has said, we are unfortunately being driven by systems of elimination, right? And one of the things community must do as a priority is make sure that you're inclusive. How many of you know what happened in this past week from NASA? Any idea what happened? 
what's, what's, what, what we've gotten from NASA in the past week. Like we've gotten visibility into parts of the universe that we didn't think or know existed. And the sheer, I mean the sheer gloriousness of it all makes you feel really small. You know, if you're in, in this room, you feel like someone. You, you feel like you occupy space. You know, I, I work for Safaricom or I work for, 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 for Amazon. You feel like you occupy space. But when you zoom out and you look at the larger community or the larger collective, then you realize that you're part of something bigger and that you must play an active role in actually fulfilling your purpose within, within, that, within that ecosystem. And our next speaker um, is, is a man I respect. is called Samuel Kamochu. And he's going to walk us through a masterclass. And this is almost like uh, this pill that you take that is that um, you know, sorts out on a knowledge digest that will hopefully leave you a lot more inspired. And Kamochu is one of those guys who's so passionate about us becoming what I call net creators of value. You know, there's a, there's a, running, there's, there's a running joke in inverse circles that it's usually Huawei or the highway. And you know, Kamochu and the sort of stuff he's doing, and I hope we'll talk about it, is how do we then get to create those sort of systems that can have us being net exporters of value. So help me welcome on stage Samuel Kamochu, founder and CTO, CEO at Meliora. Good morning, everyone. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's a difficult thing to speak after Michael. Uh, but I hope that uh, I will keep you guys engaged. One thing that uh, you'll notice that I carried my laptop because techies need to move around with laptops. Just in case go, anything goes down, you can restart the service. Uh, the other thing, I didn't come in a suit because uh, I was told that uh, for you to be respected, you need to be in a hood and a t-shirt. So. Yeah, so we'll talk about uh, engineering today. And uh, just before that, I'd like to briefly introduce myself. I'm Samuel Kamochu. I consider myself a software engineer. I did computer science uh, from JQuad back, I graduated in 2009. Uh, and I'm also a telecommunications engineer made, made by Safaricom. Kasimo, before you checked in, I used to be in the payroll. And I hear the salaries are quite good nowadays. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to engage you guys a bit. I'll not uh, take a lot of your time, but I know the forum is decode, so I just want to engage your mind a bit. And my objective in this session is just to challenge you guys, uh, and I think we've been challenged enough by the previous speakers. And the other thing is I want you guys to know a little about what you're doing, and I hope that can help us keep the conversations going. So how many of you guys have interacted with a HTTP API, done an integration, developed something? With a show of hands, awesome. I can see majority of you are developers. So this is an easy task and this is home for you. So what you see there on the screen is a HTTP request. Basically 437 bytes, which is a header, and HTTP body is 27 bytes. But what you see on the screen is this is what we actually see when we are troubleshooting our applications. So everything has colored on the left and on the right, you can see. The body that is in a bold shade of blue is the things that you, you've seen on the side there. And what you see there are numbers because we have to remind ourselves that computers basically work with numbers. They just compute. A computer doesn't do anything else. So everything we do must be numbers. And for us to achieve the things that the previous speakers talked about, we must get back to this. So what you see there are hexadecimal symbols. I know you, you understand numbers in decimal format, zero up to nine, but these are good hexadecimal symbols. So let's just take a little exercise to decode this. So the bytes that you see on the left, if I, what the network we receive on the network are those seven Bs and whatever that you're seeing on the left and the seven D. On the right, I have indicated what each of the number represents. So you can see how 
your JSON request was actually decoded from the numbers that we received on the network. So I know some of the engineers, these, you might be wondering how I did that. I didn't invent this. There are standard documents that specify how we are supposed to do that. Now, let's look at something called uh, an IP header. So if you guys are in Kenya, we don't have any guys who create routers today. And the, the header is basically another series of bytes. And I want to help you guys to decode a few of the bytes. The first two numbers, which are four, five, they are hexadecimal numbers. The first four symbol represents the version, which is version four. And the second one represents the header length, which is five words, a word is four bytes. So that gives about 20 bytes. So what you can see there is simple stuff that we guys can do. And I have also highlighted the source IP, and you can see C0, A8, 2B, and D3, and you can see how it's translated. And this is not magic. This is something that all of you can do based on a document that is written, that is open, and all of you can read. Now, allow me to engage you guys a bit. I know you remember something called the place values in class two or grade two. You remember if you have a number 125, the one is hundreds, the two is tens, and the five is zeros. Uh, the five is, is ones, or basically 10 to power zero, 10 to power one, and 10 to power two. So let's look a bit uh, hexadecimal. So hexadecimal symbols are zero, one, up to nine. Then from nine, you start counting A, B, C, D, up to F. And we know that F is 15, and A is 10, as you can see there. So there are still numbers. So I hope you guys are working with me. Now, if we look at these, an IP address on the network looks as C0, A8, 2B, and D3. And please help me decode this with you together. So the key idea here is uh, that if you look at C0, the place value of C is 16. And C, we already know that it is 12. So if you take 16 times 12, you get 192. And of course, then other digit is zero, and you get that. So if you're dealing with network and you receive that stuff, engineers deal with this stuff. And I can do even the last number, and you can get to 11. And basically, when you receive C0, A8, 2B, and D3, that's basically the IP address. And for those, for those of you who are mathematicians, you can confirm that. This is decoding. So basically getting the numbers and creating sense out of the numbers, specified by what? A protocol document that is given there. Now, if you want to create a router, you must read that document that I talked about, the HTTP, or, uh, the IP RFC. So I think, Michael, you are talking about, why don't we have routers from Kenya? Huawei, they have created their own. Here, as software engineers, we can decode the bytes. And we can actually get the source IP and the destination IP. You can check your DB and block the traffic. Whether you call it a firewall or whatever you want to do, but basically it's stuff that you can do. So let me take you now to the telco. Every time when you get billed on the telco, there is something called diameter credit control. So, and I know my friend Duncan Kabira is here. I used to work with him. He's the guru when it comes to this. And look at how the request looks like. Still a series of one, zeros, A, B, C, D. And the first byte, which is 0, 01, is the version. So we are dealing with diameter DCC, uh, diameter version 1. And I can highlight other bytes and we can get value of, out of this. So if you look at the, the AVP value, which is 258 at the end, this is hexadecimal. Again, we said 8s are 1s, 5s are 16s, and you can guess that 2 is actually 256. So if you do 256 times 2, you get 512. Plus 8 times 16, you get 80. That gives us 592. Plus 8, you get what? 600. So if you're told how much was this customer being built, it's pretty simple mathematics that we did in class 2. So why are we not implementing these protocols? Because if we knew this, we'd have created our own SDP. Even GGSNs for the data guys, they speak to the billing system using this stuff. Can we decode them? Yes. So this is the challenge that I want to give you guys. And you don't have to think. There are documents, they are short. In one week, you can finish these documents and you become a master of these things. 
But reading is one thing. We have to see how we can progress now from reading actually to implementation. So let me challenge you again. If you ever dial a SSD code, this is how the message looks like. Still same stuff. And you can pick the section that represents the SSD string, and you can pick the section that represents the mobile number. And as you can see there, you can see my, uh, there is a number there. If you look at how it's represented, some numbers, like the last two digits are 72, then we write it as 27. Then you have 74, you write it as 47. Those are magical things that are happening based on a standard document that is open. So what I'm telling you guys is that we can actually do this stuff. Now, if I, one thing I need to mention is that I know you guys have heard about 4G, 5G conversations. And we have core telco engineers who understand SS7. They are equivalent of TCPIP for us who are in IT world. But the world is moving towards the convergence of the two. And diameter signaling is a common thing. It's our protocol. It's not the telco engineer's protocols. So we as the developers can actually get into that space and facilitate the signaling in 4G networks and 5G networks and 6G and whatever that comes after that. So here I'm looking at uh, another request that looks like a HTTP request, a SIP request, session initiation protocol, which again, the document is out there. If you ever dial into an online call, this thing is in play. Messages are being exchanged from your laptop to the servers with such content. Can we decode this? Yes, the forum today is decoded, and the documents are out there. And finally, I don't want to share more examples about decoding. But technically, anything that happens in digital communication, we can decode. And I'm happy that Safaricom chose to use the word decode for this forum. So what's the common denominator? And what I can say is that everything is a series of ones and zeros. But because we are humans, we cannot read the zeros, so we group them into groups of four ones and zeros, and we call them a hex symbol or a nibble, for those of you who remember the background information. So everything, whether you're dealing with HTTP, you have done, you're dealing with that stuff. Whether you're dealing with SMPP, SS7, Sigtran, all those things that the tech guys keep talking about, they're things that you can decode. Do we agree? How many agree that we can decode these things? Thank you so much. Then the other thing that I would like to mention is that for you to deal with these things, the only knowledge that you need to know is how to decode the bytes and encode them. If I want to send a request to the core banking system, whether you call or to the switch, ISO 8583, the banking guys, all you need to know is how do I encode the message into the format that the document specifies. And we can create a switch from Kenya, we can create a switch from Africa. And this is the basic knowledge that you need to have, and I've shown you today. So the documents are out there, whether you're dealing with IETF, the engineering task force, internet engineering task force, 3GPP, the guys who define standards for GSM and things like that, and ITUT for telecommunication standards and many things. These are documents that we can read, and they, are, they just specify the functions of each and everything, whether it's IP, the procedures that are supported, and the message formats. I can bet if I challenge each one of you to open a specification document and read it from the beginning to the end, you'll get a lot of sense. I have one of the young guys here called Brian, who, is a for, uh, who, who, who joined as he's a fourth year. He finished his fourth year from Maseno University. And when he read the HTTP specification, the, IP, uh, the RFC for HTTP, he came and told me that he felt more empowered to do more because the, the document is very short, and yet we don't have our own web server created from Kenya. So same skills are needed. So for guys who are developers, the lowest you can go is a socket. A socket is a way for us to receive bytes and send bytes. So if you want to send a map request, USSD guys, it's just open a socket, encode your data into bytes, and send it over the network. It's that pretty simple. And this is a revelation, unfortunately, majority of you have not had. And I would like to ask you guys, I know majority of you say they have done HTTP. How many of you have done any S7 integration? You can see there is no one. Uh, I'm actually surprised because there are no core network engineers here. 
but the key idea is majority of us are good with HTTP. We are not good with the rest of the stuff, and it's the same thing. So after you get this revelation, what do you do? And now that's where we are talking about pushing the limit. Because yes, we can build apps, but I believe we can build everything that runs the telco business. So I'll, I'll just uh, tell you a story of how I responded to this reflection. And back in 2018, uh, I, after reading the HTTP RFC, I wrote a web server. Trust you me. And I was able to serve web pages, and those HTML and CSS and JavaScript files were rendered, and the Chrome could not detect the difference. And it's just the knowledge of how to encode and decode. And you guys can do that. Uh, in 2020, 2019, we did a bit of diameter research. I said I have a background in telecommunication. I used to work with Safari, uh, within Safaricom. And we initiated this because we were a bit selfish. We wanted to create our own SDP. For those of you who send messages to Safaricom, you connect to an SDP. The only protocol that our developers don't know is the diameter protocol. Otherwise, they can create the SDP. And the SMPP we know, HTTP we know, so the rest of the stuff we can do. So we did that, and the reason for that was to ensure that we appreciate diameter signaling and uh, do SDP and also appreciate diameter signaling. So this is part of what happened in 2019, 2020. We did our DCC. So Michael Onyango, what I was saying here is that once we learn here, the biggest test is can we create something? So we created a DCC gateway. So we are connected to those billing systems within the telco. And we're able to connect to the Huawei CBS. I think the Huawei team is around. And that was a successful thing that led us to believe in ourselves and know that we can do that. So 2021, after we have had such success, what do you do? You go out and reach out to more people. So in 2021, we ran what we call Natujenga Season 1. And briefly, I'll tell you more about what Natujenga is. And we also did the deployment of the DCC gateway into telcos. The point that I'm trying to make is, if we decode, we can actually develop, and we can deploy, and we can have some of the uh, enterprises running on our systems. I know developers, you don't have issues with threads. You can deal with high performance. You don't have issues with deployment and all that. But what you have issues with is decoding and encoding. So this is what we did. Now, 2022, we are here. And part of what we've been doing is to reach out to more people. So we've done that to Jenga Season 2. We have tried to make as many young guys love the bytes so that they can decode and encode. So that when you see C0, you don't feel like it's a foreign thing. It's basically 192. And you can do the mathematical computation too to come up with that figure. Can we do 10K TPS? Maybe someone doesn't believe. But what we can do is not say that we can do it, but we just demonstrate the same. So this is something that we are working on to ensure that, uh, Michael, as you said, that we can actually have some of these core systems created from here. And in the second half of this year, we are pushing it further. We've started a program called Natujenga S7 Sigtran Challenge. This is basically to help the young guys who have no background in telecommunications but they are developers to actually make the first voice call, make the first SMS call, make the first data call. If you can do that, I believe it has not been done in Kenya with technology stack that is created by Kenyans. And not just any Kenyans, but 21-year-olds and 20-year-old uh, engineering and computer science students and IT students. So at the end of the year, we're also hoping to help as many young guys bridge the gap. I know sometimes we say we need to upskill them. The biggest test is not actually taking them into a class, but having them create something. All of us who are programmers, you know how powerful Hello World was? Yes, it's the thing that made you believe that you can develop. It is also very powerful when a young guy who has done Hello World, they deploy the first API, and they deploy a web app that calls the first API. It doesn't take three weeks to do that. In one week, you can actually move developers from zero to having their web app deployed on OCP and you know, Kubernetes and all those things that you're talking about. The moment you do that, You've just changed the life of that guy. 
So we are hoping that we can reach out to more guys. And please, we cannot do it alone. We need you guys to come and support us. But that's basically what you're doing. 2023, we're excited. We want to get more people to do more. So the key idea is all these young guys who are looking for jobs. I think Paul Kasimu said that uh, there is a big challenge. I also have very many cousins who are looking for jobs. But organizations are crying that they cannot get talent. So we basically need to ensure that our guys do more. I think one of the greatest resources we have as a country is not the, the oil in Trukana, but the human resource. If we can get the guys who are seated out there at Kenya National Archives, uh, put in one brick after the other, we would have fenced the whole of Kenya. We just need to get our guys doing the job. And they don't do the job by just being told what they need to do, but being shown and facilitating the, the programs that put one brick on top of the other. And that's what we'd like to do. We can't do it alone. We need partners for us to have a great impact. And uh, that's where we are. So I mentioned that to Jenga. The whole idea is this. I have been working in the telecommunication industry for 13 years. I, and the basic idea is that we are not able to decode uh, those call traces, the call flows, by the time we get out of campus. Some of us manage to do it eight years into the career. The question is, what I know that makes me good at what I do? If I put it down and transfer it to the young guys, the impact would be really great. That's the whole thing about Natu Jenga. You experienced engineers, you need to step up and help the young guys come up so that we can now say that we have jobs and we have people who are fit for the jobs. So it's about me sharing what I know like I've shared today to uh, challenge some of you. But we can come together, we learn, share, connect. And the most important thing is build. Because we say it, without building, it will en essentially end up being a just, just a class. Uh, so we've been able to do a lot. I won't s s focus so much on what we've been able to do, but uh, we reached out to about 40 guys for six months in 2021 from different universities. And we also invited experienced guys from all these organizations, whether it's Safaricom, Microsoft, Telcom Kenya, Cellulant, all these guys were there. So this is some of the things that we did. And we did it in small scale. It was a live session every week, or every Tuesday, to take them through the whole process of becoming enterprise software engineers. And this year, we have used a different approach. We actually have a YouTube channel. It's called Natu Jenga. So you can go check it out. As I said, it's about sharing what we know. I have done a lot of content that is there. We've reached out to many guys. And we have a community that is bigger than last year. We have about 250 young people who are following what we are doing. And they're doing amazing stuff. So we will be doing much uh, to ensure that our guys are skilled. So last, I think, one month ago, we did a hackathon. The things that I was doing in the first session, these guys are here. I know Brian is there. Uh, he was the winner from Maseno University. But these guys could decode protocols that probably some of you have never had or have never used SCTP, and they could be able to see how those handshakes do happen as far as communication is concerned. So these are brilliant uh, young men and women. Most of them are 21, 19, and, and, and they're doing different things. But the key thing is, this is what we need to do. These guys, they are ready for, for the market. Yesterday we were in a forum where, and I'll talk about it, uh, where some of the guys who came here, actually the, the, the three guys who came here today from Meliora team, they did a challenge yesterday and they were judged by engineers from Safaricom. I know we had Colin Zoluoch, uh, we also had Juliet Ongoro, uh, we, had, uh, uh, we had Walter Onyango who just left Safaricom the other day. And the key idea was for them to talk about Sigtran, SS7. And the guys did well, and they were able to win the tickets to come for this forum today. And this is what you're doing, and I believe by the end of the year, actually in two months, we will be able to demonstrate an SMSC that is created by Kenyans. So this is the stuff that we want to do, and I'm coming to the end of uh, my long presentation. And the key idea is... 
we have known that one of the things that challenges me is that the Royal Technical University, which later became University of Nairobi, had engineering students in 19, about 65 years ago. And up to today, and I think I wrote, I wrote an article at the beginning of the year saying that we still don't have a blender made in Kenya. Well, we know a blender is made up of what? A mortar, a blade, and a container, and maybe a few seals that we can create. And the challenge is we can complain and say, you know what, that you know the power, government policies, all those things that will allow us to move away. But guess what? The government guys are have, the, the engineers are still in government. So I think it's upon us to wake up and ensure that, as Stephen Degwa said at the beginning of the year, that we have to reimagine a different future for our children. So we have to sit back and see what these young guys who are here uh, can create. We have to give them better opportunities. We have to transfer what we know to them so that what um, my brother Michael mentioned uh, can become a reality. So we have to build our nation and um, we hope that uh, you guys can respond to this, our national anthem, that basically calls us to wake up and build our nation. I know Tulifunzo, you know what, Nikujijenga, yeah? So you get your money and you do whatever that you have to do. But you have to open opportunities for the young guys and ensure that engineering will be very different because of you people. It doesn't take a lot of us. It just takes me and you. And we can make a huge difference. We don't even, we don't even need the funds, Michael. We've not been funded by anyone. Seven years in operation. We've just been given opportunities like George Njuguna said during the engineering, the Safaricom Engineering Community Lounge that we don't need handouts, we just need opportunities. And such opportunities as this, me being here talking about these things, um, normally I see so many people and I respond differently. There are people who their voice uh, uh, goes down a bit. Mine is ideas start running away. <laughs> but at least you've given us an opportunity for us to come and share this and challenge you guys to do, to respond to this. Now to Jenge Taifa to Endio, Wajibu, Wetu. May you guys process this and may you practice that space. So in, I know I've talked about what we'd like to do. We can't work together. So we're looking for guys who can help us accelerate this. Can we be having, let's say for example, uh, before the end of the year, what if you can get 500 young guys, three weeks dedicated and they move out of those three weeks having deployed a service that they can use. So for you to run such programs, you need a lot of support. For us to try those SMSs, we need a lot of support from you guys. And this is why we are calling you guys that we work together. And it's going to, to be a fun journey, as you can see from the image there. I guess we are like a small boy in the middle who is uh, enjoying us. Be he's being held uh, by the parents. So that's the my message to you guys and thank you very much um, I'd like to appreciate for this opportunity uh, the whole of the digital IT team for giving us this chance George Kinaliz, Kenya Naisenya, uh, Alan Kipsang, Andrew Masila all those people and many other engineers that have thought about us and given us a chance to to do this thank you very much and I hope that I have challenged you that you've also learned something about us and I hope that we can also move forward uh, together in the future. Thank you very much. Round of applause. I, I, I bet most of you are floating for a majority of that session, which is not a bad thing. Knowing what you do not know is important because then you can make positive action towards removing that, that ujinga. And Kamocho makes it sound so simple. And I, I think another way to look at it, if you look at the body as, as a system, Kamocho is at the cellular level. Most of us guys, we are tailors, right? Yet he's looking at the cellular level. How do we create things that bring into themselves life and, and, you know, and, and, and it creates value? And never have I felt so passionate about that call 
to action that is in a national anthem. And if you sing it in your head, you know, anytime we see it sung during Olympics, we want to cry. Sing it in your head right now, and I promise you you'll shed a tear because it challenges you to actually take responsibility for where we need to get to next. So, Kamochu, I'd like to appreciate you on behalf of the uh, Decode team. And give him another round of applause as he receives this. Thank you. Sante Sana for challenging us and for making us think differently about when we talk about engineering and we talk about being creators of value, what does that mean? You know, the blender, the blender analogy, maybe the light bulb analogy. What else do we, what else are we taking for granted? You know, down to even things like matchsticks. I think that's the one example that people at, say, Kenya Association of Manufacturers say that why do we import? Why do we import the basics? We need to become, and I'll keep saying this, we need to become net creators of value so that we can then export. When you export this stuff, we now start receiving these inflows in, in that S that has a line going through, through it. I think that brings us to the close of this session. Those joining us online, we're taking a, a health break on this side. So ladies and gentlemen, you're welcome for, uh, for tea at the back side of the hall, and we'll see you back here in 30 minutes. Asanteni. I just... No worries. I'm sure there was a lot of traffic from your bedroom to your living room. Y you know how it is. Monday mornings. Today is Wednesday. Anyways, um, any updates on our customer, Bliner.io? Yep. Uh, I finalized the design and the proposal. And later today, I have a design review with the broader team. And then after that, I have a sync with the customer where I'll propose the infrastructure solution. Good. Uh, let me know if you need any support from me, but uh, that's all I have for you today. Oh, yes, um, performance review is coming up. Uh, you said that if I let this project, I'll be set up for a promotion. I, I so was for just the performance. Sorry, oh, go ahead. Go on. So as I was, I was wondering, oh, sorry, please go. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I'll, I'll go then. No, no, that's not why I meant. Thanks everyone for joining. I'll be talking about the infrastructure proposal for the company Blinder. Uh, they make. Um, hey Steve, do, do you uh, do, do you need some time to? Nope, oh, I'm good. Okay. Um, so as I was saying, uh, Blinder uh, provides window blinds as a service, and um, I'm sorry. I just want to say that. It's totally okay if you need to sit this one out and deal with it. Why would I? Uh, there's nothing else I would rather do than listen to your well-prepared presentation. Uh, on second thought, you might be right. Sorry, honey, I'm coming. 
As I was saying, a company offering blinds as a service will definitely require- oh, shoot, am I late? Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I, I thought it was scheduled at 2.35, not 2.30 on the dot. Anyways, so here is my proposal for the infra changes to allow for horizontal scaling. Uh, any questions? All right, well, if there's no questions, uh, you guys can get 25 minutes back. Thanks. Bye. Hi, hi, hey, Karen. Yeah, so that's the high level overview of the new design for Blinder. Uh, do you have any questions? Sorry, it's um, it's not a big deal, but it kind of bothers me. So the company name is Blinder without the E. So it's Blinder. Um, okay, yeah. Blinder? No, Blinder, Blinder. Uh, all right, we, we, we can take this offline for another time. Uh, what were you saying? Yeah, do you have any questions about the design? Oh uh, yeah, here's the thing. I don't see machine learning anywhere in your proposal. Uh, you sell blinds to customers. No, no, we sell privacy. We sell security. We sell the peace of mind. And window blinds are merely the means for that. With, with machine learning, of course. Oh, okay. Um, what what data sets are we working with? Uh, are you collecting their feedbacks, and their returns? Wait, or, um... wait. Did did you not hear a word I said? We are all about privacy, so we would never collect data from our customers. <laughs> Actually, I I think I understand our intellectual discrepancy. Okay, oral communication. It's low bandwidth medium. I get it. It's not your fault. Let me just show you a PowerPoint of our design. I think it'll make a lot more sense once you see the diagram. All right. Do you see my screen? Um, I, I see your screen, but I don't think you're sharing the right one. Oh, there we go. So you understand now, right? The innovation. Uh, just a second. Sorry, I had a delivery come in. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll look into that. Um, do you have a team of machine learning engineers uh, to work with us? No, why would we? Well, how are you gonna maintain all this new technology in your system? Well, that's for you guys to figure out. Isn't that the whole point of your team? Anyways, I gotta go. My masseuse is here. Oh, one more thing. Block changed. We'll talk about that next time. I'm sorry. Yes, uh, sorry about the angle. Um, I don't have a tripod, but uh, thanks for watching. Uh, I have two announcements. The first one is that I'm starting a new channel called Joma in NYC. So it's basically a vlog channel. Uh, unfortunately, it's not about tech. It's more of a lifestyle vlog. Um, so if you're still interested in that, uh, check it out, Joma in NYC. 
And then the second announcement is that I'm starting a newsletter. So I know I don't post a lot on, on, on YouTube, but I still do want to share stuff with you guys. So the newsletter will allow me to do that. I'll talk about, I don't know, my investing strategies, life advice, um, recommendations for TV or YouTube videos. So if you're interested in that, uh, check it out, uh, jomaopa.substack.com. Um, it's free, everything is free. So um, yeah, I'll see you there, see ya. What a morning it's been so far. I told you guys we're in for an exciting one. A masterclass on how to push, to push the limits of software engineering, finding about the developer ecosystem and funding opportunities in Africa. Career opportunities for you guys watching at home and those in live with us. It's been a hell of a morning. I can't wait to see where we go from here. But first, I've been on YouTube. I've been scrolling. I've been seeing your feedback and I really do appreciate it. Like I said, do keep it coming on YouTube and on Facebook Live. Keep them coming. I've also seen a few complaints about buffering do not worry stay easy okay I've got 1 GB at only 10 shillings for an hour for you so you can stream without any worries I said 1 GB at 10 shillings for a full hour so please please make sure you're buying your data here so I don't want to hear about buffering I see the feedback you guys have been giving I see that you feel like we need a Safaricom PLC course just to teach us these things in in-depth and more independently. I absolutely agree with that. Maybe we can do a more quarterly Safaricom Engineering Summit if that's not too much to ask. But like I promised you earlier, I've also got data and airtime because I want to keep you engaged. I don't want to hear that, oh, I dropped off because bundles Elisha. So here's a chance for you to win some airtime. Okay, I'm going to give you a trivia, five questions actually. You just tell me, answer these five questions and I will give you 500 bob worth of airtime, okay? First person to get all five questions gets them right. First of all, these are all questions that have come from our summit, from our summit so far, from the speakers who've been on stage, from the things that we've discussed on stage. So if you are listening, it's gonna be easy peasy for you. If you dropped off a bit, maybe pay attention in the next, uh, in the next section and we will give you 500 bob of airtime, maybe at lunchtime, we'll see, we'll figure it out. Um, first question, what is the theme for Safari Comes Engineering Summit? What what is the theme for the very first Safaricom Engineering Summit? Tell me that. Number two, when was the Safaricom Innovation Hub set up? When was the Safaricom Innovation Hub set up? Number three, which country has the best talent and human resource in Africa, according to Michael Onyango? Which country has the best human resource talent in Africa, according to Michael Onyango? Number four, who said these words, yeah? We are here to put a dent to the universe. Otherwise, why are we here? We're here to put a dent to the universe. Otherwise, there's no point of it. I'm going to give you those four. Let me know the answer to one, two, three, four. Be the first one to do it. And I promise you 500 bob guaranteed airtime, OK? So I've got someone very interesting to come through and talk to us about what we've seen so far at the summit, engage us a little bit, and have a little fun game of would you rather. So please do stick here. I've got uh, Mark, who is the HOD of IT infrastructure and shared applications at Safaricom. Mark, please join me. So we we can have a nice little fireside chat. There's no fire, but Baridia and Ruby, we'll, we'll, keep, we'll keep ourselves warm. Don't worry about it. <laughs> Mark Karibu Sana, thank, thank you for you. joining us. Um, let me ask you, first of all, very, very first Safaricom Engineering Summit. Yeah. So far, so good, in your opinion? I know you, of course, you have a bias, but in your honest opinion, <laughs> so far, so good? No, it's, it's actually super. We're just warming up. Yes. Uh, we've had a very good conversation. Uh, Michael Onyango was uh, super. Uh, you know, a lot of nuggets around talent. Uh, Paul Casimo uh, from Safaricom, uh, wonderful information coming through. So I think we're just getting started. Yeah, yeah, I do agree. We are absolutely getting started. And I want to go over some of the things that we've talked about so far. But before I get to that, I want to just get to know you a little bit better. Okay. So I want to play a game of would you rather tech edition. And you guys can try and guess at home, OK, which would you rather will he pick? Um, and we'll see if you're right. Just see if you can read Mike, uh, if you can read him very well. Mark, sorry. Okay. I'll begin with um, an easy one, yeah? Right. Would you rather have infinite battery life on your phone or infinite fuel in your car for your car? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I'd rather have fuel. Huh? Yeah, <laughs> especially given the prices right yeah, now. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And battery life, you need some downtime. Yes, I agreed. You can always be on your screen. Yeah. Yeah. Would you ever drive an electric car? No. Why not? We need to hear the sound of the car moving. 
<laughs> this is a no. I was hoping you'd say yes for the environment, Mario. Mm, yeah. yeah, we can reduce how much we travel, but we need to hear this. We need, okay. That's an uh, interesting But I'm not thing. a Subaru boy, so. so. I was about to ask that. <laughs> it's okay. As long as you're not polluting with noise, you just yeah. need a quiet engine. That's cool. Yeah. Okay, would you rather um, give up your home theater or your gaming? Do you game? Uh, or did you used to? No, I don't. Okay. I, I used to. Okay, uh, but not anymore. So that's that's an easy one for yeah, you. Yeah. All right. Another would you rather? Would you rather live without the news or without your phone? Without the news, for sure. Because you can get the news on your phone? <laughs> Have you seen the walk around for that? <laughs> no, no, no. Sometimes news is, is toxic, so... I agree, actually. And consuming it a lot can be very overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I get that. Last one. Would you rather Java or Python? Python. Is there a reason for that? I've met so many Python fans today. I'm like, okay, I want to learn coding. I think I'm going to go it's Python. Easier. It's, it's easier. It's easier. Yes. It's easier to learn. I think you can do uh, much more. Okay, Java is legendary. Yes. It's been here for a while. Yeah. But, uh, Python, Python is oh, just Python awesome. Python is yeah. easier. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Now we'll get into some of what we've spoken about um, to the, with the panelists, uh, with those who've been on stage, with the engineers. But careers in tech was how we began this. And it was like, you know, from a human resource perspective, okay. uh, what are opportunities for young people when it comes to tech? And specifically at organizations like Safaricom, because if I'm graduating, I want to be at the top of the game. Yeah. I want to yeah. be at a telco or a tech co that's yes. also at the top of its game. Yeah. So how did you get into, into tech and how would you advise someone to, pre to position themselves strategically to get into the tech game? Okay, uh, no, I, I think there's a lot more opportunity for people right now mm -hmm. than there used to be, yeah. at least when I was trying to get into technology, mm -hmm. because you can learn a lot of technology online, you can do YouTube, you know, you can... Yeah. There, there's Udemy, there's so much opportunity to learn tech. Yes. And right now, so long as you can prove your skill, mm -hmm. then anyone will be looking for you because uh, there's so many tech companies setting up in Kenya looking for young talent. So I would say actually, the shortage is not in the opportunities, mm -hmm. it's in the talent. Okay. So it's just your chance to create your talent mm -hmm. and you get your chance to get in. That's a, that's a good way, that's a good place to be at as an yeah. industry where yeah, it it's, it's more of lack of, ta lack of the talent or availability of the talent yes. as opposed to the opportunities. Um, I've also seen a new wave every time I'm on certain platforms. It's like, here's how to get a tech job without a degree. Here's how to get a tech job without what do you think of that wave if i should call it that's that's happening no okay it's it's kind of true yeah um so degrees are important because yeah. there's a lot more you learn in university mm -hmm. other than the technical mm -hmm. skills so yeah. you learn how to interact with other people mm -hmm. you learn social skills you know there's a lot of other courses that people do in university but if you don't have the opportunity for whatever reason maybe you didn't qualify to join university mm -hmm. or you don't have enough funding to do university you still have a chance because degrees are not critical for the current age of skill sets. Uh, they are kind of necessary, but not critical. Mm -hmm. So you still have your opportunity. But I would say if you have the chance to do a degree, go do it. Yeah. A campus is fun. You know, do, do a lot of young stuff. Uh, you know, have fun. Yeah. Because once you start working, the fun kind of, uh, you know, is drained away. Yeah. It's yeah. also a soft one to adulthood, I would exactly. say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, you can do silly things and have yes. an excuse. Yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah. I'm in uni. Yeah. Okay. And um, we've spoken about how to problem solve. That's basically an engineer's job. You know, you're a problem solver. Yeah. But for a very customer facing company, that's an extra challenge. So I would say what perhaps is the hardest thing when it comes to you trying to make um, software that is as customer friendly as, uh, as possible. And I've seen, we've had conversation about, for example, bias in AI that's been going on around a lot. And it's like, yeah. these are things that you didn't think of when we began the age of technology. Just yeah. like, you're going to make a code that's racist? That sounds impossible, no yeah. sexist. But it happens now. Yeah. So what are the challenges that you specifically as Safaricom face and how do you overcome them? I think the, the biggest challenge is differentiation because Every person is unique in their own way. That's true. So a lot of times we do products that are for the mass, mm -hmm. but uh, what is good for me is not good for you. That's true. So, so when we are building software and we're generating products, mm -hmm. we need to be able to do something that uniquely identifies each and every of our customer. And that is what we are struggling with. Uh, we've been trying to do that. We're now doing a lot around uh, CVM. Mm -hmm. CVM is a more 
uh, product, uh, uh, product generation that is very customer centric. So we learn you through AI, through machine learning. We know what time you browse. We know what time you make your calls. And through that, we can give you a, a Tunukiwa bundle that is, you know, very unique. Curated to, your, to my needs. Exactly. Yeah. Like so, right now, yeah. we have 1GB at 10 bob for an hour yeah. for everyone that's attending this summit virtually. It's, it's yeah. yeah, that's yes. good. And uh, I hope you're giving a lot more free offers, right? Yes, yes. We've got a lot more. <laughs> we've got a lot more. Okay. Yeah, but I get that. So you're trying, uh, using AI to make sure that it, you curate experiences and software to your specific customers. And you have a lot of partners um, and some of them have been part of the Safaricom Engineering Summit. We see Amazon Web Sum uh, Services, M-Pesa, iTalent, yeah. Dell. How do these guys come into play when it comes to putting together a summit like this? And even when it comes to day-to-day -day software development at Safaricom? Yeah, so uh, because Safaricom is a big uh, technology company, mm -hmm. we do use partners for a lot of what we do. Mm -hmm. Now, AWS, Dell, uh, Huawei, all these are partners that uh, are supporting us in the background to run our technology. Our platforms do run on this, uh, uh, on their infrastructure or, or some of their platforms. So I think we do use them a lot um, uh, from a cloud perspective. Yeah. Uh, a lot of our development has been migrating towards cloud mm -hmm. and uh, using AWS platforms, we've been trying to move all our digital platforms to the cloud so that we can give our customers a better experience and also, we can scale whenever we need to. We've seen Kenyans have very peculiar habits. <laughs> uh, we see a lot of growth in traffic yeah. uh, towards the evening. So we, we don't want to buy a server mm -hmm. that covers for all that traffic the whole day yeah. when we only need it in the evening. Yeah. And that's where our partners like uh, Dell and uh, Huawei and AWS come in because they're able to give us uh, opportunities to build technology that fits into the products that we are putting in the market. Yeah, I like that you called um, the traffic building towards the evening peculiar. Why is that peculiar? I thought everyone just has more time in the evening. <laughs> no, evening is supposed to be resting time. You're supposed to be chilling with your family and you know. I think in the 20, unfortunately <laughs> in the 21st century, resting is on, on Netflix or on your or phone. People, or it's <laughs> like people come to rest at work yeah. and then they are busy in the evening. <laughs> Is that what's happening? Um, I think so. I don't want to preempt too much, but in a lesser discussion, this, we're talking about data as um, either snake oil or olive oil. What do you think about that? What's your take on that? <laughs> um, okay, I don't know about it being oil, yeah. but <laughs> I, I think it's uh, data right now is... Uh, you know, it, we can't ignore it mm -hmm. uh, because uh, every single decision that you make is As based on data. Yeah. You know, uh, how you're generating your products, who you are talking to, how you market, you know, which news channel you go and advertise in. That's it's like, it's everywhere. You cannot ignore data. So if it's oil, then yes, that's true. Yeah. But not uh, snake not oil. Snake, not snake no. oil. <laughs> and the entire day we've said Safaricom is moving from a telco to a tech co. For the average consumer, what does it mean for, a, you know, because a lot of um, Safaricom users are still primarily date, uh, text and, you know, voice users and things like that. So what does that mean for the typical customer, the typical Safaricom user, when you say, you know what, we're migrating from a telco to a tech call? Yeah, you know, the truth is that a lot of people know Safaricom for making calls mm -hmm. and M-Pesa mostly, mm -hmm. yeah? But uh, we, we are trying to position, position ourselves as a technology company because what we are offering going forward is more around ICT services. We are offering on IoT. We are providing enterprise solutions for SMEs or for corporate customers. And all these things are primarily things that used to be offered by technology companies. Yes. So ideally, in the real sense, Safaricom is a technology company already, uh, if, if you ask me. Most people are now no longer using uh, calls. They are calling on WhatsApp. You know, or they're calling on uh, Telegram or whatever it is. <laughs> yes, yeah? yes. So how can Safari come play in the WhatsApp space, in the Telegram space? And uh, at some point, we'll be moving into Metaverse. So we'll be able to give you an opportunity to attend a conference like this without ever coming here. Yeah. You know, and having a live, uh, you know, interview. Yes. Without me and you being physical in the same I would location. love it. I'm in my bedroom conducting the interview. You're, you're in your house. Yes. yes and, and we make it happen. Yeah. I can't wait to see the future. Yeah. Um, I've got a question from someone in the audience, a John NM, who asked, if Safaricom has any open source tools coming? 
So uh, I think for us, uh, that is the future. We are trying to use a lot of open source uh, technologies. Uh, we currently don't have one of our own, but we are opening up a lot of our platforms yeah. uh, for the community so that uh, we are a lot more open in terms of integration. Uh, we expect that the, the, the tech companies and the fintechs can use our platforms to expand on the products that they are offering. Yeah. So in that sense, we are becoming more open. Uh, and in the same breath, we're also using a lot of more open source technologies. Mm -hmm. I've also seen, um, let me see, this is Elias who says he wanted to disagree with the sentiment about um, the lack of talent. I think he's speaking more from a perspective of, uh, like you said, there's a lot of tech companies opening com uh, headquarters and, and branches and everything and setting up base in Kenya. And there's plenty of opportunity. But it also seems like there's a small pool of techies that is getting these jobs um, from the outside. Do you think that's true or no? Um, or that's a, that's a it's a, okay. It's it's a, there's a truth to both sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the thing is that uh, there are people who have not put themselves out there. Yeah. To you know to to be able to find these opportunities, because uh, if you have the skill and the talent, yes. Uh, I think the opportunities are there. Uh, there's a, there's a, actually a talent prize war mm -hmm. that is going on in the industry right now where people are making decisions based on the highest bidder. Wow. So if, you, if you, you can walk into an organization and after six months you walk out as if you, never, you are never existing in that organization. Yeah. You know, yes. those are things that we never used to do. We stuck with organizations <laughs> for five years. Yes. Uh, not because we wanted to, but because the opportunities were scarce. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's like, uh, you know, okay, yeah, you, you, know, like, you, want, uh, you, you want a pay, uh, pay rise, but if not, where, where will you go? Yeah, you, yeah. you don't have anywhere else. Yes. But right now, the truth is the opportunity is there. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, people are not exposed enough to know where the opportunities are mm -hmm. or where to search for those jobs. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, if e, e, you're probably not putting yourself in the right position okay. to be found as a talent. To be found as a talent. How yeah. do you then put yourself in the right position? Yeah, um, so, so... How do you get so, to those spaces? Yeah, so that there's well, a First of all, there are a couple of things that uh, Paul mentioned. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, because even having talent is just not enough. So uh, soft skills are very important. Mm -hmm. uh, emotional intelligence, you know, just being able to have a conversation or even to present yourself to a panel. You yeah. could have the talent, but you fail the interview. That's uh, true. Because a lot of interviews are skewed towards conversations. True. Yeah, so you should be able to have a conversation. So I think, first of all, build yourself, uh, uh, soft skills, be able to communicate, mm -hmm. you know, and then create a profile. Yeah, and, and by, by a profile, not necessarily a CV, but a profile that you can put up in several places. Have a very good LinkedIn profile, yeah. you know, that defines what you do defines your capabilities, uh, present yourself in every single technology company's uh, talent, and you find everyone has a, a place where you can go and put in your profile. Yes. In Safaricom, we call it Taleo. Mm -hmm. You can go and create a profile, put your CV. Uh, you can go to Microsoft, you can go to Google, all those places. And I'm and assuming that gives you, like at Safaricom, for example, the Taleo, that means whenever the job opportunity comes up, it's coming to your email if you, if you qualify. Exactly. We yes. notify you yes. if you qualify. Yes. And sometimes we just do a search on the database. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we also have a lot of uh, software engineering uh, talent search companies like Andela and uh, Tech Savannah, mm -hmm. who are also doing recruitments. Join Andela or join Tech Savannah. Let them have your profile. When they have an opportunity, they will find you. Yeah. yeah. I like that you began by mentioning the importance of soft skills because, as you said, a lot of life is skewed towards conversation, networking, um, interviews are set up like that. But uh, when it comes to tech careers, there's not much emphasis put on those things. And they always say we, when it comes to tech, especially in STEM, all the focus is on the math and the science and everything. And then we forget even the social science and, and those softer skills. No, that's true. What would you say is your best social skill as a person? <laughs> you didn't see me flipping around on you, but ha, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I think for me, uh, yeah. I, I don't want to brag, but... Uh, it's okay, the I would time say. to brag is now. <laughs> time, time is now. 
No, I, I would say from an interaction perspective, mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm able to interact with almost every individual. Yes. It uh, gives me a chance to get into any conversation. Mm -hmm. So for me, that's a plus. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's a, I, I think that's a very big plus. Um, because if you can only speak to certain people, if you can only speak to fellow techies, or you can only speak to family and friends and have a good conversation, it means you're awkward in every other situation. Exactly. Yeah. You'll always be sitting in a corner. Yes, by yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and as we get um, to wrap up the conversation, I'll go around um, the ethics of engineering and, and tech in general. So there's a lot of ethical issues that are cropping up. What is Safaricom doing to ensure that AI, you know, for example, is unbiased or that you don't have the typical issues that come from, um, you know, the, the growth of the tech industry and engineering as a, as a whole? Yeah. Yeah, so I think um, ethics is key to any engineering role mm -hmm. because issues around data privacy, because when, whenever you get into building software, you get access to a lot of information yeah. about uh, people, about, you know, you know, about even people that you do know of. So how do you handle this information? So as a tech, you need to focus on the job that is at hand. Okay. Similarly, uh, if you're given, uh, you know, there's a lot of, hacking that is happening uh, there are people who are you know, trying to use their skills yeah. to gain money wrongfully yeah. that is just it's it's criminal you know mm -hmm. uh, and so if if you have a certain skill uh, within cyber security mm -hmm. or even software development it's better to use that skill for gainful employment mm -hmm. than to use it to try and uh, extort money from people you know for, for criminal purposes, you know. So I, I agree with you, yeah. but let me ask, thinking of it from perhaps the cyber criminal's point of view, it's a quick payday, you know. So I, gainful employment is slow. <laughs> no, it is, but yes. even, even robbing a bank is a quick payday. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, true. But there are risks attached to it. Uh -huh. uh, you know, so, so the issue is, are you willing to face the risks? Yeah. Yeah, because uh, right now the Kenyan uh, laws are so... Uh, well cut out that you can actually get up to life imprisonment for some of those crimes, mm -hmm. you know. And and uh, so so the justice system has expanded. Uh, you know, it, when when I used to work in a bank, there were a lot of fraud cases that were perpetuated by engineers within the banking sector. Mm -hmm. You know, so you you see a quick buck and you want to get it, but the quick buck always. Sometimes you get the money and you don't even know where it goes to. Yeah, you, I think because you don't respect uh, money that comes too fast yeah, or that you true, haven't true, widowed true. what that. So you just blow it on yeah. or you're, you get caught two, two days later, yeah. three hours later. We've seen that. We've seen several of those cases. Um, you pull off a grand robbery, whether, it, whether, <laughs> whether it's by hacking or by physically robbing a bank. And then two days later, exactly. the, cops are, the cops are on your case. So you do make a very good case for that. Um, as I said, a lot of our audience is very it's students. So I want to focus on them a little bit and ask um, to, go, to be a good engineering student, what do you think are the, good, like the key things to do? And I mean as a person and as a student as well, to, so that you can make the best of your four years in campus um, or your four years not in campus, I suppose, okay. whether you're using Udemy or some other platform. No, I think uh, a curious mind uh, is important. Curiosity, because you must always try and find a way of learning new, new skills or new talents. So you must always be trying to figure out you know what's going on like the other day I was watching uh, NASA uh, with their web uh, telescope that is now bringing very wonderful pictures you know just looking into that and the technology when you go behind the technology of that telescope for those who watch Formula One you know if if other than the cars racing if yeah. you go behind the technology on, on Formula One mm -hmm. it's quite interesting and there's a lot to learn there so having a curious mind is a very key skill that you have to have and then you know just uh, the, the uh, you know trying to read a lot and and, and I, I don't mean reading technology stuff just reading any book any book because those are conversation starters you're building. Yes. Every time you read something, you learn something new. Whether it's relevant to your, 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 your work field or work, not, yeah. it doesn't matter. One day you'll find someone you can have a conversation with, uh, you know, and you'll have a conversation starter. Yes. And that's how you continuously build your mind and you, you, know, you grow it to, to the extent that you, you are always looking for ways to solve problems, you know. Or, or to to fit into situations that uh, 
finally give you opportunities. Yes, yeah. I agree. Because you never know what connection will mean something. You never know what book, what chapter will mean something. I think that's just a, a, a nutshell of life. You, you, you do things and then they pay off and you never really know what to You take risks and you gamble and it all works out in the end. I think you've given us so many nuggets and I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for making time Thank for you. Us. Thank you for having me. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure maybe we'll get you back tomorrow. We'll see. We'll see. But we will be right back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. That wasn't too bad, wasn't it? Sana siji dai, wana jidai na flow na mina do Miaka tano kwa games niyo Tweet at Safaricom PLC. If I, if I tell you you're a winner for 500 Bob Airtime, please also DM Safaricom PLC on Twitter. I've not forgotten about you guys. I see your answers coming in hot and fast. I had initially said I'll award the first person who gets all four questions, right? But so many of you are engaging so much and so well that I'm going to give four people, okay? Whoever got the answer to each question, right? You're walking away with 500 Bob worth of airtime. We're about to go back inside. I want to hand over to Mbugwanji here now to take us on to the next sessions. Like I said, it's going to be exciting. Get your notebook, get your pen out, continue being interactive with me. I'll be back for more trivia, more money giveaways, more fireside chats, and all that good stuff. Mbugwa, take it away. Karibuni, Karibuni, welcome back. Those of you who are still not in the hall, kindly make your way uh, in for those joining us online. I hope you've also had a good, had a good break. Now we're coming from pushing the limits as Kamocho had walked us through that really simple deep dive. And we're now getting into, into the mini hackathon. But before we get into the mini hackathon, I'd like to appreciate the over 1,200 
guys who are um, online, actively engaging on our official Twitter, our official handles on, uh, on Twitter. That the hashtag is Safaricom Decode. Find the live stream on, on Facebook and also on YouTube. One other thing, if you're here physically, do make sure to visit our, our sponsor booth. There's amazing stuff going on there. And who knows who, what you might pick up there. You might get an excellent contact or look and see a solution that you can actually um, go live with. So into getting our hands dirty, we're now getting into the AWS IoT Hackathon. And AWS is an important partner for Safaricom, especially in the journey to cloud transformation using cloud technology. And to deepen this collaboration, they have actually sponsored an IoT challenge, what you're calling the mini hackathon, to help the developers better appreciate the, the place of IoT, Internet of Things, and also of the cloud when thinking about solving customer problems. For this challenge, we have 10 teams who will be given IoT devices, Raspberry Pis, and a sensor pack. And for this challenge, they, these 10 teams have been tasked to think of a problem that is unique to Kenya. A problem that is unique to Kenya and come up with a creative solution that is based on IoT to solve it. Since this is a Safaricom AWS sponsored challenge, the team that integrates the most with solutions from both parties, like M-Pesa, will get more points. Now, Ecopesa. First prize, the team's maximum size is, is, um, is five. So first prize, 250,000 shillings. Second prize, 150,000 shillings. And third prize, 100,000 shillings. I'd like to invite on stage Jude, Jude Juma, technical lead of Safaricom, and Seka Cello, the solution architect from AWS, who will take us through the nitty gritties of what this IoT hackathon is all about. I currently am invested in trying to figure out how Nairobi City can move better through public transport. And I've got a challenge, and I'll just throw the idea out there. If these guys can, since they've got sensors, uh, they've been given sensor packs, if they can give me a seat sensor that can verify for me, Salem to Alika. And then on the Raspberry Pi, since we also have a Raspberry Pi attachment for the camera, and throwing some machine, machine, machine vision and machine learning using AWS Cloud, and let me know that, uh, you know, George was sitting in seat 33A, but he's the, same, he's the same guy who moved to seat 15B when it got free. So that when I'm doing revenue assurance, it doesn't count that as two, two guys who've, who've, who've entered into my, into my matter. So that's my, that's my contribution to that challenge. It's a big pain point, what you call revenue assurance in the public transport space. And that would be amazing to see what sort of solutions the 10 teams come up with. Um, let's see, let me just recap that again. 10 teams, maximum team size is five. Um, I know some of you have already calculated. Come on, you want to turn on a top prize to 50. Kilometer on a tembe up on a 250. But this is in cash, I hope. Right, Jude? It's in, it's in, it's in cash? See your credits. See your credits at AWS, some uh, bonga points. This is PESA, PESA Taslimu that you can actually um, spend, spend this weekend. So I'd like to invite um, Jude Juma, who's a technical lead at Safaricom, and Seka, who's a solution architect from AWS, to break down what this mini hackathon will look like and what we can expect from it. Jude, over to you. Um, so my name is Jude, like you've heard. I'm a tech lead at Safaricom. Uh, but beyond, beyond uh, being a tech league, I think what I'm most known for in Safaricom is uh, Hackathon. So that's what I'm here to talk about, the IoT uh, Hackathon sponsored by AWS. So I'm here with Celo. Celo is from, Celo is from AWS. I'm here with Celo. Celo is from AWS. Uh, he's the one who crafted the entire challenge. It's a, it's a mini hackathon. We're going to have less than... 24 hours to come up with creative solutions. We let it very open because we didn't want to constrain people so much in terms of defining for them the, solu the problem. So we gave them an open challenge. They come up with um, a problem based on what they see happening in their society in Nairobi, in Kenya, and in Africa. Then based on that, if they can come up with creative IoT solution and using AWS uh, solution, 
um, and also integrating in Safaricom connectivity and M-Pesa and whatnot. So that's what we are here to unveil. I will allow Selo to talk much about it, but before then, um, Bugwa has talked about the price. So yes, there's price to be won. Um, we have 10 groups. We got a lot of submissions, over 20, and, but we only needed 10 people, I mean 10 groups. So each group has a maximum of five participants, and we let them you know, do their own group formation. We didn't interfere in their group formation. They picked people based on their skill set, their interest, and we have 10 amazing team with 10 amazing solutions for us. Now, the first team will walk away with 250,000 Kenya shillings. And like Bugwa said, is in cash, not airtime. Um, the second team will walk away with, uh, 200 and, uh, with 150,000 uh, Kenya shillings. And then the third team will walk away with um, 100,000 Kenya shillings. So I'm wishing them all the very best. Uh, we had promised to give them uh, raspberry pie and a pack of sensors, but we wanted to tweak it a little bit um, to make it a bit interesting. So we decided they focus more on the software, not the hardware. So they're going to be using emulators. Uh, we are going to walk them through and Celo will tell them how this is going to play out. Uh, but Celo, I think you can take it over and explain to our hackers what exactly the challenge is about. Thank you. Thank you, Jude. Hi, everyone. How are you? All right, so uh, my name is Selo Lotzeka. I'm a solution architect. I work at AWS. And um, basically what I do is I design software. I design apps. I design enterprise software that uh, companies like Safaricom use. And uh, I think I have the coolest job in the world. And um, <laughs> if you want to know more about AWS or what it means to be a solution architect, uh, come over to our AWS stand and we'll be more than happy to connect with you and give you an overview. So uh, to get, I know it, it was a break, you know, and some of you had uh, tea and cake, maybe it's uh, filling you up, making you feel a little sleepy. So we're going to do a little exercise to get you guys up and going, all right? And, um, and I've got prizes. All right, I've got some cool prizes. I won't tell you what the prizes are. So you, you better participate if you want. I've got some stuff hidden behind my stand there. So you better participate if you want my prizes. So um, we're going to start on this side, okay? And uh, when I do this, I want the claps to start from this side. I want the claps, let's go. I want the claps, let's go. Clapping, 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 clapping. Okay? All right, and then we're going to get the claps coming back. Awesome, awesome. And um, now, what I, uh, um, I will be talking to you about today is AWS, Safaricom, and the IoT challenge, uh, the hackathon that, that we've, got, we've got going. So, you know, my session is not a one-way, all right? It's a two-way, and I want to get feedback from you. So, you know... Clear your throats. You know, I want you to have a say as well. So when I say AWS, I want you to say Safaricom. AWS? Safaricom. AWS? Safaricom. Come on, come on, come on. You know I've got prices, right? What's your t-shirt size? What's your t-shirt size? Medium. Okay. Because you were shouting uh, the loudest, I think I've got my first t-shirt. Okay. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. Now, when I say... AWS, you say? Safari AWS? Safari AWS? Safari okay, when I say IoT, you say challenge. IoT? Science. IoT? Science. Awesome, you guys are great. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, if I can just go one slide back. All right. So that's what we'll be talking about today. Um, you know, um, what is IoT? What changes can it bring into your life? How can it impact you as, as an engineer, as a developer, as an analyst? And uh, what does it mean for us as Africans in the future? And uh, how does AWS enable you to grow a career, solve problems, and even maybe build businesses uh, using AWS IoT and the Safaricom uh, uh, platform, all right? And, um, 
when you think of Safaricom, just, don't just think of phone calls, because there are a lot that they have to offer that you can integrate and solve problems in your day-to-day -day life. So, on this slide, we're saying, if you knew the state of everything and could reason on top of the data, what problems would you uh, be able to solve, all right? And for a T-shirt or a water bottle or something, all right? Um, have you got our roaming mics? I need roaming mics. I want someone who can tell me what is a, what is a thing? Because we talk about internet of things. I know what is the internet. <laughs> I know what off means. But what is this thing that we're talking about? So I, I need a hand up for someone who can tell me what is the thing? There's a, oh, you are off the block very quickly. Give us your name and uh, the mic is coming to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'll give us your name, tell us where you come from, and then tell me what is a thing in Internet of Things. Hello, everyone. Hi. My name is Boaz Leleina. Uh, I'm from Samburu, Kenya. Currently situated in Nairobi, working. Cool. Yes. Uh, when you talk about thing in Internet of Thing, we mean whatever we interact with in daily life. It could be a car, it could be electricity, it could be the AC in your house. Uh, basically, whatever you work with in your life. Pacemakers for some people. What is your T-shirt size? Medium. <laughs> 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 All right. And exactly, you know, it could be a car, it could be a fridge, it could be a kettle, you know? I like, think about it. Uh, wouldn't it be cool if I could, on my, on my, on my uh, airports, tell my kettle at home to boil water because I would like to have some tea when I get there? And I'd, I'd call home and say, Alexa, please boil some water for me, and then the kettle will start going. And when I get home, I make some tea. Well, that's the internet of things. That's what it means, all right? And um, in this challenge, we've basically look for those problems where they can look, uh, the teams can look in Nairobi, in Kenya, and find challenges that they can solve using things. And a thing can be um, a doorknob, it could be a bulb, all right? And how do we take these things that are normally not connected to the internet, not connected to our devices, connect them, and start interacting with them? So, what I've put up there is the kind of areas that you must think about when you're thinking about building for Internet of Things. And, I mean, this is the, the area of innovation for, for, for Africa, all right? If you're thinking of solutions, think, think about areas of, of our lives that have not been innovated yet. So we're looking at industry uh, in terms of uh, manufacturing. We're looking at health. Uh, you know, how can we use Internet of Things to monitor uh, your grandma's uh, heart rate, or how could we use Internet of Things in the warehouses, at home, like I, get, I just gave you the, the kettle example. Um, uh, you know, Safaricom uh, uh, has a, a product that we worked on. You can come to our stand, it's called Digifarm. It, it, it basically helps farmers get their producers to market. And um, it's, it's in the early stages, but it's already making a, an impact on a lot of uh, um, farmers, think about how you can use Internet of Things to impact the lives of, of, of farmers and improve their productivity, or whatever it is, using uh, uh, AWS IoT. You know, sustainable energy, cars are a big thing, all right? And uh, you look, look at your local problems and think how you can use IoT to solve the matatus, or, you know, don't, don't try to find a, a problem somewhere in the part of the world and import it. Africa doesn't work like that, you know, right? We have to work with the problems we have on the ground and, and, and build, build solutions for that, you know? And, uh, you know, safety at work or at home. Those are the kind of things we must think about, and that's what the challenge is about. That's what uh, we will be presenting tomorrow. Uh, we'll see what the, the, the teams that are participating in the hackathon have come up with. And um, you don't just buy a phone because it's pretty, right? or you buy headphones because they're pretty, right? You actually want, you want something out of it. You want, if you put a phone but it can't connect to the internet, you can't go to Facebook, then it doesn't really, so if, it, it doesn't really serve the purpose. So with IoT, for people to want your, your product or your solution, you must be solving a particular problem, right? 
And that's what you must always think about when you want to innovate. What can I do to benefit the customer using IoT? So, um, T-shirts, T-shirt type, hey, hey. <laughs> okay, so I've already given you a T-shirt. I've already I'm given him a T-shirt. Yeah. Um, let's look on that side, all right? Um, these are the benefits of, of, of IoT, all right, on AWS, all right? We basically uh, give you operational efficiency, all right? And um, we, we enable you as a solution provider to increase, to increase your revenue growth, all right? It's very big English, ne? So <laughs> I want to find the, edu the, the highly educated ones on that side of, of, of the room. What do we mean by operational efficiency? Why would us making you more operationally efficient be a benefit to you? The, the guy next to you just answered. Okay. There's a hand, if I don't, there's a hand at the back. Is, is there a hand at the back? There's a hand at the back, yes. Yay! Okay. Let's hear. Okay. Uh, so, when you look at operational efficiency, we're looking at uh, how... Speak up a little bit. Uh, so, when you look at operational efficiency, we look at how can you be able to improve uh, your day-to-day -day operation of a business, uh, at the same time reducing on the costs the cost uh, expenditure that you use to run your business, uh, just to improve on uh, productivity and also the profits of the business. All right, cool. Uh, Lyndon, uh, T-shirt size. All right, cool, you've, you've got yourself a T-shirt. And exactly, all right, when you have a, a customer, let's say we came up with a school solution to get the Matatus to drive safer, let's say, all right? And um, you could get the owner of the Matatu to monitor their Matatu as it's driving throughout Nairobi. Now, the thing about it is we want to put the solution out there, right? We don't want to be carrying servers around, breaking and staking them, connecting wires, right? Because that's not really the solution. We're just building servers. So operational efficiency, as, as he said, is basically allowing you to operate efficiently and uh, um, focus on building the solution for your customer and instead of wasting a lot of time on hardware and all of that stuff, all right? And that's where AWS comes in because we take away what we call undifferentiated heavy lifting, which means don't focus on things that don't really make you more efficient than your competition. What you want to do is build solutions and take them to market quickly and solve the problem and delight your customers. And that will, re, uh, will result in what? Money in your pocket, revenue growth. You understand, all right? So, um, on, on, uh, on, on the left-hand side, uh, we've, we've got um, the kind of benefits that you get uh, from, uh, from using AWS uh, in terms of data, intelligent decision-making, and improve efficiency, which means that you understand what your devices are doing out there, you are able to control them, and you can actually prevent and, um, and anticipate things, all right? Now think about it. Um, in Africa, we've got water and electricity as like one of our biggest problems, right? And uh, you'll find that a, a tap or, or a pump leaks or a pipe bursts. Wouldn't it be great if we could actually pre predict when a, a pipe is about to burst? and then fix it before it bursts. You know, transformers fail. Wouldn't it be great if you could monitor transformers? So that's the kind of uh, areas I want you to think about. And then um, that will lead to what you see on, on the right-hand side, which is better relationship from your customers. And, um, uh, you know, let's say you're doing this for, for a power company. They'll be happy with you because then they don't have outages and your customers will be happy. Just an idea of things you can do. So, what are the fundamentals of IoT? All right, the, um, here are the three areas that you must focus on, all right? And as you can see, it's not servers. It's not building infrastructure, all right? Let's start uh, from, from the right going this way. First, you need to identify a device, all right? It's not IoT without a thing, right? So we must think of a thing, all right, that we can then um, build on and take to market. But that thing is, is actually not very smart if it's not connected, right? Then we need to connect it and then control it. 
all right? Once we've got connection to the thing, we can talk to it, right? Then after connecting to it, then comes the last uh, uh, part where we can get insights. We can understand what it is doing. We can predict what it's going to do. We can learn from what it has done, where, when it will break, when, when it's not too happy, when, it's, when the battery is running out, things like that. So that's what uh, uh, the value that we bring as, uh, as AWS, that you focus on solving the problem and not on the infrastructure. So this is called the virtual circle. And uh, I've given out T-shirts, so You'll have this. Um, I'm going to explain this circle. It's called the virtual circle. And uh, think about where in this circle, as a developer, you would want to start, OK? And I mean, the guys in the hackathon have already started, OK? Now, I said there's analytics, which means we have those services which allow you to get insights into what is happening on your platform. We've got the devices, which means we can build on the edge. We can build devices. Then we've got um, connectivity and control, which means you can connect to the devices, and then you can talk to them, all right? As a developer, if you had an idea for an IoT solution, and uh, I think I started this side, so we're coming back, roaming mic this side. As a developer, if you wanted to, to build an IoT solution, where would you start? You already want a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Someone at the back. Where would you start? You can just give me the color. Is it the pink, the green, or the blue? Easy one. Yes, sir. Blue. Um, I need the mic. I want to talk to you because that's, a, that's, a, that's the correct answer. And you deserve a T-shirt. Mm -hmm. So let's give him a round of applause. So this is what the hackathon is about. The guys are basically starting with the device, connecting it to AWS, and uh, uh, maybe doing some visualization, some analytics on it. Let's give him the mic. So just tell us your name, where you come from, the, the guy behind you. Behind you, yes. Check, check. Oh. My name is Evans, uh, Evans Mbidi. I come from Kitui, but based in Nairobi currently. Yeah, so yeah, my answer is blue because when you want to build a solution, you want to focus on the device that is going to perform the operation. Uh, yeah. And it's a good place to start, right? Because yeah. you can immediately see if the solution will work in the real world. Exactly. Awesome. Love your answer. Thank you. And basically, you can work your way up the ecosystem until you are at analytics. I'm just going to click through that. So brings us to the challenge, all right? Um, how can I build uh, devices that work at the edge with AWS IoT? That's the question, all right? Well, that's what the challenge is about. And uh, you can come talk to us. You can talk to the Safaricom team, find out what, the, what they've been doing. Come back tomorrow and uh, find out who, who, who has won. So I'm just going to give you an overview of the challenge that, that you have put out to them. And this is a challenge I put to you as well, all right? And not because of the hackathon, but because you should think this way, all right? Identify a problem in your community that you can solve with, with, with AWS IoT and, and the Safaricom network for connectivity and build, think of building a business model around it, all right? And boom, you're off in a direction now. And um, there are a lot of people who have solved IoT problems. There's, there's, there's one guy on YouTube that uh, used AWS IoT to water his plants, and then an employer saw that and decided that, in fact, I think AWS recognized his skills and we hired him. So think about it, all right? He was not really trying to get a job, he was just doing something cool, ends up working for AWS. So sometimes you just have to solve a problem that is a problem to you, perhaps it's a problem to the next person. You clear what we're trying to do with the, with the IoT uh, hackathon? Yeah. Are you gonna come up with your own uh, problems and solutions using AWS IoT? <laughs> cool, thank you for your time, and it's been great. So, Selo, maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe one more thing before, before you leave. Um, in the audience, we have people who are members of the community, uh, the Safaricom engineering community, and also those who are logging in uh, virtually. A whole, a large group of people who are very passionate about um, IoT especially. And uh, when we talked about this challenge, uh, we got a lot of interest. 
So I wanted to mention here, and we had this discussion with CELO, that it doesn't end here. After the summit, we are going to have a lot more engagements. And even the, the devices that he's talking about, the Raspberry Pi, uh, the sensors, they're going to remain with us once they are procured, so that we continuously uh, think about solutions or problems and solutions that we can you know, help solve our community problems. So this is going to be a community engagement that is going to be forever and ever until... Ongoing. Yes. Yep. So look, um, we look forward to you joining our community, especially the IoT community. Uh, you have uh, amazing uh, engineers from Safaricom and also from outside who are passionate about this. So join them and build something with them. Mbubu, I know you wanted to give us a challenge. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, yes. I you still have the challenge? I, I had already um, given what mine would be because I'm currently invested in the public transport space where you know, the biggest challenge is that of revenue. So I talked about revenue assurance and because of cash, you know, what happens is that the, the people you give your bus to manage yes. uh, will probably underreport. So the statistic is that 30% of revenue gets lost because of that. In, in local lingo, kuna squad, sindio? Squad ni point to point. Sae kingi ashimu maali na udondoke, mtuwa kingi ya pale, ile bei ashimu hai, haipatikani. So revenue assurance. So trying to see, can you use machine learning, can you use IoT to figure out that George sat on seat A, but because it was not a window seat, um, and him is a guy for fresh air, when somebody else moved, he moved to that seat. So it's the same person. Don't count that as, as a requirement for, I'm looking for another, another fare. Or, again, someone start and then your, your, your guys tell you that yet the turnover was 750. So those things are key for any business. And like you said, no one buys a solution. Yes. People buy the outcomes. And one of the other things you also spoke about earlier when opening the summit is that show not tell. Because yes. everyone's got an idea, yes. right? Yes. I'm sure right now you've thought of a fantastic idea that you could use IoT for. But man, I mean, there are a hundred of those over T. Yes. So I think, um, I think that's, it, it's, it's amazing that we're able to, uh, to come together, innovate, and have partners like AWS yeah. uh, help us, especially with, um, with things like cloud credits and the equipment uh, and the sensors, so that we can imagine what is possible. So help me thank uh, Jude and Seko. And, and we really look forward to, you know, what guys will build and what they'll conjure up. And then we, I have dibs, all those three teams, Bana. Uh, you can, you can, you can impress me some after you've, you, you've been sorted. Now, we're still keeping it within the theme of building. Um, and we're going into what you're calling the Maverick's corner. So Ma Maverick is synonymous to someone who really knows their stuff, right? So coming to the, to, to the Maverick section. So come when you take to a Maverick, it means that you know your stuff and you're able to, uh, to showcase it. And here we have, um, we have four teams that have diverse use cases. And the first, um, and the first team uh, to give us their demonstration is the QA and SRE team. And they're looking at chaos engineering, okay? And they had been tasked to find, to innovate and find creative ways Think out of the box to test, engineer, stabilize, and roll out software solutions. So it's four teams, different use cases. The first guys um, to showcase are, from, are, are looking at chaos engineering. May the demo gods be with them.
as a technical team gets to sort them out. I think it's interesting, you know, the different use cases that you're looking at. Chaos engineering, uh, you remember the best example I can give is when Nairobi City got a mass, actually it was Nairobi Metro got a massive blackout. And what was it blamed on? What was it blamed on? It was blamed on a monkey. So when you think about chaos engineering is you actually actively think of ways to break your system or, you know, you, build your, you try to build your systems to be used logically. But there's, uh, you know, the, the, the former, one of the former Safaricom CEOs once said that Kenyans are very, are very, Kenyans are very peculiar. Unambiam to, we have made the path for you like this. And then you take a turn like this. What do they do? They go right diagonal. So whenever you're developing your systems, you have to think through all these use cases that we're probably going to see demonstrations of and probably see how to better, uh, now that we know better, we can do better. Are you guys ready? Chaos Engineering team. Ready? Fantastic. Stage is yours. Okay, so don't worry, it's not noticing my voice. <laughs> okay, so what is chaos engineering? Uh, it's actually a discipline where you try to inject failure into your systems and see what happens. You try to compare uh, the theory versus what actually happens to your system. Uh, so uh, in chaos engineering, uh, we tend to build uh, our systems by nature, they are prone to chaos. Uh, we live in a world in which uh, we, have, we, have, we have transferred from an era of VMs, now we are working with, uh, with pods, K Kubernetes, OpenShift, basically it is a distributed architecture. Uh, in those areas, they tend to, it tends to have chaos since, they are, since you can't predict what happens in any part of the application. Should should something funny happen? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, my cue card is not working also. <laughs> okay. So, uh, chaos engineering is a system where you try to experiment on distributed systems. By doing it, you will build a confidence in your systems that they can withstand whatever comes, comes their way. Yeah, should, uh, should uh, anything happen in your system, you can be confident that your system will stand. Yeah. Uh, in, case, in case engineering, there are five major uh, principles. The first one being you build hypotheses around the steady state behavior. The steady state behavior of a system simply defines the normal of the system, how a system should behave on a normal day. For example, if it is your website, you check whether the pods are there, they are running. You can check whether the, the load balancer is up and working. Yeah, uh, things like that. They define the normal of the system. What should happen when the system is normal? Then the next step, you now vary. Let's say you have pods that are running. What do you do? You now terminate up that pod and see what happens to the system. Does it stand? Uh, does it still going on to do what you expected it to do? Then you run a cement in production. It's not meant to run in test environments since you want to get a real picture of what happens in, to, in, your, in your applications. Then you automate it. Uh, that is, you inject it into your CICD pipelines so that it can run always. Yeah. The biggest aim of them, you try to minimize uh, the blast radius. You don't want everyone to be affected by 
the chaos that you are injecting need. You can start with a few people. Let's say if you are terminating pods, you can start with one pod, then scale to two pods, three pods, four pods, then maybe all the pods in your application. Then watch what happens. Just to give the audience like... Yeah. So, as I said, initial, said initially started, modern systems are complex. You can't predict uh, what they are doing. Also, you can't have a complete mental picture of how your system runs. You don't know if you touch what, what will be affected in the system. So the best way to, uh, the best way to test what actually happens is by using chaos engineering. So at Safaricom, since the age of mini apps, my Safaricom app, we moved from VM status to pods. So we had to rethink how we are doing our tests on those environments. So we, uh, we could not actually remove the, uh, we could not actually eliminate the, the complexities that existed in our system. The only way is to test and then fix them as they occur using chaos engineering. Yeah, so most of the times uh, we, have, we have actually prevented outages before they actually come out to you. For example, on the corporate website, how many know it? Safaricom.co.ke. All of us know it, right? Yeah, so there's a time in which, did you know that uh, maybe, there's a time in which when the EC2 instances that are running that pod went down, it would take you to Blaze. Did anyone else, did anyone notice that? We caught it before it actually became an actual thing. We could be so famous on Twitter then. Yeah, so. What the experts? Uh, there's Netflix. Actually, they are the fathers of chaos engineering. Their migration to cloud actually brought a lot of uh, chaos in their systems. So they came up with a tool called Chaos Monkey to, to randomly terminate uh, an instance on AWS. Up to now, they've built a variety of tools. They call it the Simian Army. You can do a research on it. It's a really interesting uh, toolkit for doing chaos engineering. Yeah, modern on AWS, there's one on uh, the failure injection simulator. So if you have AWS, you can test on it. It's actually another good tool you can work with. Yes, so the next stage, I think we'll be doing some live experiment so that we can see what actually happens when you, yeah, thank you. So. Um, don't be intimidated. This is a simple, a simple file that is used for chaos engineering. Uh, it's uh, actually a toolkit we are using internally. It's called Chaos Toolkit. It is free and open source. We actually liked it due to that nature. Being free and open source, we could actually extend it how we want. And also, uh, and also being free, it helped us uh, achieve cost leadership as an organization, Safaricom. As you can see, it has um, major parts. I was saying in the, in the principles, you can see I'm defining my stable state hypothesis, where in the title I'm saying that an instance should be running. So I specify that, then I test. So the first part I simply test uh, for the coders in the room. You can see I'm testing, I'm, I'm trying to ping the server and see am I getting a result from it. If I get a result from it, I'm sure that uh, the server is running, so that is the steady state hypothesis. The next part, uh, the next plus please, the next is service must be accessible. Uh, sorry, the instance is running, so that was society. The next is instance is running, we check whether the instance is running. We do, we use something called, uh, so that checks the instances. We actually built that module internally to check whether our AWS instances were running. We pass the instance name, then we check whether it is running. It is built on the Boto3 SDK for AWS. Uh, so, for the method, now we are now varying the real world events. We have passed it inside uh, a section called model. So, what we are doing, as you can see from the description, we are, we are stopping the instances. Then we see what happens when we stop those instances. You can see we are defining the instances must be running so that we can stop it. Yeah. So. Let's see what happens if we terminate that instance. So, 
So the command for running chaos engineering uh, using chaos toolkit to simply do chaos run, then the chaos engineering template. So you can see it's stopping instances. You see, it has stopped the instances, and you've seen that the service is not accessible. So this is something that you can take back to your architectures, and uh, you can tell them maybe there's something wrong. You can tell them maybe we need a multi-availability zone across multiple availability zone, multiple instances across multiple availability zone. You can also add a caching layer such that not only are we hitting the instance, you're first hitting the caching layer before we actually reach the instances. So it can actually save us for a short time. Yeah. That was it. Thank you. Thank you so much from um, the Chaos Engineering uh, team looking at that use case. And I mean, most of these guys are simplifying, you know, the stuff that you're seeing on screen. I mean, he just went there and ran something simple uh, and it did what it did. But the real life implications for the sort of stuff that they're looking at is, um, is critical because as we move to the cloud and as more of our systems become digitized, we need to think of all the possibilities of what could go wrong and preempt that from happening. It's not just great that you build something that just works. See, 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 it works. But then you have to figure out and try to think, if this plumbing breaks, where will it flood? What will it affect? And because very many systems are interconnected, um, you've heard of the, I think it's called the butterfly effect, that you know, a butterfly is starting to flap its wings in one part of the world. If all of them, all of them started doing that simultaneously, on the other side of the world, there'll be a tornado. Right? So it's those small, small things that you need to think through and, and test. And do help me give them around another round of applause as I usher in the next week. So the next team with their showcase are the robotic process automation team. Um, and I mean, what comes to mind when you think about RPA? The best example I could give is uh, Nana Mechikua, Amechikua Lo Napa, Ya, Ya Branch, Ya Tala, Ya Wengineo. And you know, some, some people do ask for your MPESA statements, right? If you export your MPESA statement for, what, three months, how would an organization be able to pass through that information to be able to deliver some sort of intelligence, whether it's on a scoring metric or say, Ambogwa Wera Papana, or Mbogwa, yes, you can give you, um, you know, a specific limit. It is things that, like RPA, that enable that to happen. So the RPA, these guys are part of the digital technology uh, team that is responsible for looking at things that need to be automated and testing and rolling that across the organization at Safaricom. So help me welcome the team doing the, the automation team doing RPA. Thank you, Shitan. Uh, my name is Martin Makio. I'm a senior process automation engineer at Safaricom. And we are here today to talk about uh, robotic process automation. Let me just use this. Uh, so, uh, welcome to the future. And uh, we're here to tell you about robotic process automation because we believe it's the future. Uh, so, uh, uh, robotic process automation, so what is it? We call it RPA. So RPA is basically a technology that automates repetitive digital tasks, uh, typically performed by people. 
uh, within an organization, let's say copying data between, let's say from Excel and keying it into another system. Uh, so uh, the processes that we automate with RPA are as simple as moving files from one location to another, uh, copy pasting data, uh, responding to customer emails, uh, data entry, and data consolidation. Uh, they could also be as complex as KYC validation, intelligent uh, document processing. Let's say you have a set of invoices and you need uh, a robot really to look at those invoices and extract data from that particular invoice. It can also include something like offboarding employees or customers uh, or even payroll processing. So what do we, what do we re really look at when we are trying to use RPA on, a, on existing processes? Because we're saying that it's not all business processes that are RPA fit. So we look at all of these criteria before we decide to use RPA technology to automate a business process. So the number one is uh, rule-based. Uh, the process needs to have very clear and structured rules. Uh, the process has to be repetitive. Let's say you're performing it hourly or daily or weekly, and maybe you take uh, uh, four or five hours just to run the process once. Eh? Uh, and uh, number three, we look at uh, the inputs and outputs. Uh, the process must have uh, st standard inputs and outputs so that the robot can actually be able to predict uh, the steps. Thanks. And then task volume. When you talk about task volume, we're talking about the number of transactions involved with that process. So usually we are interested in processes that have very high volume of transactions. And then say, uh, so we're saying that a robot is a logical low intelligence software that mimics human actions. So a robot technically is like yourself, just clicking on a desktop and uh, interacting with business software, let's say ERP software or payroll, and you're clicking around. So the robot technically takes over that, uh, that task on your behalf. So we have two types of robots. Uh, broadly, uh, we have attended robots which actually work side by side with humans, and then we have unattended robots which run in the background and they run independently. They are triggered by business logic or some kind of condition. So what are, what are the benefits of RPA? Uh, actually, RPA is a new technology and Safaricom is a market leader, I think, in RPA. And if you understand the benefits, you realize that uh, uh, robots could change the way businesses deal with customers and the way businesses actually uh, you know, deliver on uh, different aspects of their promises as a customer. So the first, the first benefit we see is increased productivity. Uh, so instead of having your employees working on repetitive tasks, uh, you, you let the robots work on those tasks and then the employees can focus on what we call cognitive tasks that involve a lot of reasoning. Uh, increased efficiency, uh, we're saying that uh, an RP robot never takes a break. It can work 24-7, uh, 365 without a vacation or sick leave. And bots can be scaled up and down instantly to, to meet demand. Let's say you're expecting uh, to onboard 100 employees in week one. And then the second week, you're expecting to, to onboard 1,000. So what you do is simply you scale the robots. Uh, because if you have to think about the number of employees supporting an onboarding process, you cannot quickly hire employees and train them, train, train them to meet demand. But robots can actually be scaled because they already understand the existing processes. So enhanced accuracy. Robots, unlike humans, are not error prone. If I gave you a scenario where I told you to copy a thousand entries from an Excel file and key, it, key those entries into an ERP system, by the time you're done with the 20 records, you're almost tired, or 100 records, you start making errors. So the other benefit is improved business data security because uh, there's been a problem about uh, information leakage uh, where employees disclose uh, private information about the organization to external parties. But if you have robots actually working on your core and critical processes, you are guaranteed that your information will never leak. So business continuity plan. So let's say you have uh, one employee supporting a payroll uh, process and that employee goes home for sick leave or they are just leaving the organization and there's no one to be trained and take up the process quickly. So if there's a robot to replace that employee, you realize that there's that guaranteed business continuity. So RPA is non-disruptive, disruptive, sorry, because as we said, 
uh, it can work on the it works on the UI layer of the software, so it can actually be used to automate uh, legacy systems that might not have let's say APIs, and we might not have direct ways of integrating those systems with newer systems. So th there has been something called traditional automation, which was there before RPA. Yeah? So what are the differences in terms of technology? Number one, traditional uh, automation relied on programming languages, uh, but uh, RPA mimics user actions on the user interface level. And then in terms of legacy systems, RPA is better suited beca because it operates on the user interface layer. So you can literally build it on top of any existing system. Uh, traditional automation relied on, requires, sorry, deep knowledge of the programming language that was used to build that particular software. So time to market. When organizations are deploying uh, technology, they look at uh, how much time is required to move from development to, uh, to an actual production uh, environment. So RPA is faster because most RPA tools are actually local platforms. You, you require very limited coding uh, experience to build a, an RPA robot. Uh, so in terms of audience, as I said, uh, little programming is required for RPA, so anybody within the organization can actually build these kinds of bots. Huh? But for traditional automation, you need very specialized programming knowledge. So I will talk about uh, what the business value has been realized by Safaricom uh, since uh, RPA was, in, uh, was uh, introduced to Safaricom, I think, about three years ago. Uh, so for the first, uh, these are just highlights because there are so many use cases, we can't just mention them uh, at once. Huh? Uh, so the first one is that we have reduced time to resolve fiber outage issues raised by platinum and gold customers uh, by automating uh, ticketing of escalated issues. Uh, that way we have uh, complied with all our service level agreements and we have improved customer satisfaction for those particular uh, processes. We have also deployed intelligent document uh, processing for invoices sent by suppliers. So usually suppliers would have sent an invoice today uh, it will take maybe seven days to be processed by uh, someone within the enterprise resource planning. But now a robot can pick up the invoice immediately and the money to the supplier can be dispersed. Uh, so we've also automated database health checks for all databases, Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDBs. So our DBAs don't have to wake up in the morning and spend seven hours preparing a database health checks report. Eh? and make decisions about the status of all Safaricom databases. Uh, so we've also automated uh, reviewing of uh, anti-money anti laundering alerts on M-Pesa for uh, suspicious financial activity. So usually uh, alerts raised on, on suspicious financial activity would take about uh, approximately 30 minutes to review one, uh, one, one of those kinds of alerts. So with a robot, you're going to take about three minutes and remember, we are processing about maybe 250 to 500 alerts a day. So that's a lot of hours if you are to have people actually reviewing those alerts. And then uh, from the time we started using RPA, Safaricom has saved the organization an average of 15,000 man hours yearly. Uh, that has reduced uh, the operational expenditure of the organization. So actually, I had a small demo just for those maybe who are, have not seen uh, an actual robot, so I'm not sure if this thing is actually being be able to, I can't project my screen. Okay, thank you. So I have a basic process where a robot needs to log in into a portal. Uh, it needs to download an Excel file, uh, do some calculations of that Excel file, uh, prepare a report, and send it by email. So assuming that this process takes about uh, one hour, or let's say, and it has to be done daily. So basically, instead of a human agent having to perform the process, we have robots scheduled to run maybe at 3 a.m. in the morning, they compile the reports, then in the morning the, uh, the agency within that department actually find the reports ready so that they can make decisions instead of, instead of starting to extract the data themselves. So I will just run this. It takes, it might take a while. Uh, so, so this is just a demo and what you're seeing here is not 
actual data is just data that we're using for illustration purposes. So that's a robot trying to log in into a system. Uh, the same way you begin your username and password, uh, it will just navigate to other menus. So the robot is programmed to follow the same business rules that a human agent will be performing. And as you can see here, the robot will do this uh, over and over again every day. So as the a demo is running, I think I'm, that brings me to the end of my presentation, and maybe I can take up any reactions from the audience. That you know, comes top of mind for me is, you know, nowadays, a lot of these portals, whether you're looking at banking portals, financial services systems, ETC, have, have some other form of um, confirm that you're a human. How do you, how do you, meet, how do you manage for you know, scenarios like that, where choose the, Choose, choose the pictures that have a traffic light, right? Or capture, yes, the capture, the capture methodology. Okay, so, so actually for things like capture and traffic lights, uh, robots can do that better because most of these robots can actually integrate with artificial intelligence and they can be trained using machine learning models to actually be able to recognize the same things a human eye could recognize. And we've done that with captures like uh, the M-Pesa portal where most MPESA agents actually have to log in. They are required to put in captures, and a robot is actually to do the same. Fantastic. I think that's, that, that's great insight. I think there's a question on the floor here. Sorry? A, a very burning question. Can, can we get maybe a roving mic as, do you know when it's done, or that was, that, that was, was there an additional output to show people? Yeah, actually I can show you the output. As we maybe get a roving maybe mic for, back there. for one question. Or could you project your voice? I'll, I'll... Okay, Python can be used to build RPA-like features uh, using Selenium, but you see, when you're building robotic, when you're deploying bots, we, we are looking at a situation where we need to cut down the cycle of developing software. So if you go the Python way, you're still going to go through CI, CD, and it will, it will take you so much time for you to deliver automation. So that's why we rely on what we call local platforms like UiPath, which actually has a drag and drop interface and requires very minimal coding experience. You just drag an activity, you tell it, click on a button on the screen, and it does that for you. Yes, actually, the tool that you use in Safaricom is called UiPath. Uh, it's there, there's a community version, if you like to go online and try uh, to play around. So it's pretty easy. We, initially, in fact, Safaricom was also building bots in Python, but we are no longer doing that, yes. Fantastic. I think you got the answer there. Maybe for the, for the audience online, the tool that they use is uh, UiPath. Um, later we'll be hearing from a gentleman who's also been in that space of developing bots, and maybe you'll get to also learn a bit more of alternative solutions that um, could be deployed. Round of applause for, for, the, uh, for the team here. And I think you can, you can, you can, you can mark their faces and then proceed to ask them questions maybe over, over lunch or during the other breaks. Next up, we have um, part of the DIT team who do pipelines for automation and software delivery within uh, Safaricom, building continuous improvement and delivery networks. And they'll be showing us a, a, a showcase or use case on DevOps maturity. Round of applause as they prepare. Yes. getting those alerts like this customer.
much and more fuel. Exactly, many, what, many what yes, uh, and especially for Sanui. document My understanding. My name is Peter Kitanui. I'm from Safaricom. I'm from the DevSecOps department, and I've brought here my team. So um, my name is Peter Kimeli Tanui, and uh, let me give my colleague to introduce himself. Uh, my name is Keith Nzagi. My name is Polycap Chalo uh, from Test Automation, QA. So um, in Safaricom, uh, we are focusing uh, much on shifting left in testing. So in shifting left, uh, this means that testing has to start as early as possible uh, in the test environments. Um, so this uh, involves uh, doing code scans uh, on the code that uh, developers write. So in this uh, area, we use SonarCube, uh, open, which is an open source tool for code analysis, code reviews. And uh, we noticed an anti-pattern whereby um, uh, slave nodes access uh, Jenkins uh, SonarCube instance. Uh, and we wanted to come up with a solution whereby uh, we are able to uh, create a group, an auto-scaling group uh, that can scale in and scale up on uh, demand, thus uh, increasing the developer's lead time and uh, cutting down on costs. So, yeah. Okay, so for our presentation today, uh, we are going to be using Terraform, which is an infrastructure as called tool uh, that will aid us in uh, provisioning of a VPC, two subnets, and an internet gateway. So, uh, so this is from a uh, well uh, AWS structured uh, uh, auto scaled uh, SQS. Uh, so this is the way the recommended way of uh, setting up uh, on an EC2 instance. So uh, let me give Peter to also continue uh, mentioning on the serverless architecture. Yeah. So I think we're going to move away from the screen so that we can display the what 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 we will be doing. I don't know if it's okay. It's not okay. All right. It's not okay. I'll... Okay. We have a technical issue with displaying the screen, and we we wanted to really, really showcase uh, this. I think maybe I don't know. We may be guided. Maybe we present at a later time as we have sorted this, because we really can't proceed without. To what, what, what so I think since they are really passionate about what they want to, sh to showcase to us, I think yes, let's, um, let's prepare for the, for the next team as, as we get your uh, connectivity thing with the, with the laptop sorted. So round of applause for them as we look to the next team. Hopefully, they, hopefully the, the, the stuff runs, runs easy. This is why I say, you know, live things. Live things have their shenanigans. Um, a bit of history I've done. I've done showcases or I've been on platforms where we enable many startups to launch to the world. Uh, it was a platform called Demo Africa. And this live thing is, if, even the most experienced of entrepreneurs, it gives you this butterflies. I mean, once I was in San Francisco 
And this is in, in the heart of Silicon Valley. Internet. Internet. This guy was sweating. Ali, Ali, he had to remove his coat. But no, as founders, sometimes you know your stuff so well, like the back of your hand. It's just that this is technical, so they have to showcase it. The guy removed his coat and delivered on you know, 90 seconds of his life. And then interestingly, as he proceeded to end, connectivity came back up. Do you know what the crowd did? They said, my friend, on call, we must see, you must give this guy his time on, on, on stage. So yes, remember we said demogods, tafarali. It has happened, it is what it is, but let's um, wait for the next team. The next team is um, looking at a live demo in the retail space. And the Retail Digitization Squad is a team tasked to simplify retail shopping processes and the development of products that empower agents to serve customers within the shortest time possible while having a fantastic customer experience. So over to you, retail team. And I'm here with the Retail Digitization Squad. Uh, we have Charles, we have Harris, uh, we have Edwin, and uh, we have a few others at the back there. So our mandate actually is to simplify and to uh, enable our retail agents to be able to serve our customers better. And today we're going to be showcasing our queue management system, which we built in-house, where we um, developed it from scratch instead of buying an uh, EQMS solution. And um, in addition to that, what we did was we, are, uh, we created a squad where we brought in all the developers, we brought in the business teams so that we could be able to build a solution that was fit for our agents in the retail centers. And what this has done for us is actually to provide value for our retail shops. I think for us, even as we talk about software engineering, we always have to look at what it is that we are, what value we are providing for the business. Is it a business solution? Is it for uh, a, a social solution? So that whatever it is that we are doing has some impact to our community. So for our eFlow solution, um, basically what it does is it, it is a ticketing solution where a customer will come in and pick a ticket and be served by an agent. But it's not like any other queue management system. Number one, what it has helped us to do is to personalize it for our customers, such that the customer is able to get a message, the customer is addressed by their name. When they go to the agent, then we can see all the information that, that, customer, uh, that involves that customer. Then in addition to that, we are able to measure our waiting time. We are able to measure how long a customer has waited, how long they have been served, so that in future then we can uh, be able to serve them better. Then we are able to look at our, our, sales, our agent force, so that we can see um, are they busy? Are they not? Are they on break? So that even as we assign tickets to the agents and we are able to know who is busy, who is available, and then we can be able to ensure that the queues are reduced uh, considerably. Then in addition to that, we'll talk also to just talk about our architecture and how we have developed it um, with our team here. Um, but for the business value, the first one is that we were able to save cost, yeah, other than being able to serve our customers well. Then in addition to that, we were able to look at staff productivity to be able to see what are our strengths for our, our agents and um, in terms of also saving time that we take to schedule our customers, um, I mean our agents, um, in terms of when they are going on leave or when they need to go on a break uh, and uh, how many people we need to have at any particular time. So I will invite our team to then do a small demo. Go ahead. We have Harris. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. Am I audible? So I'll, I'll just take you through how the entire process flow of how the EQMS works, uh, just to be able to get an appreciation of how the entire system works, uh, so that when uh, Edwin and Charles will be explaining the architecture and the tech stack, you can be able to understand how everything works within the AWS platform. Uh, so first, uh, a customer. I, I'll act as a customer. I'll come first, uh, be able to pick on a specific service from here. And then from here, I'll say I'm interested in maybe picking my MPESA statements. Then it requests me to key in my, my phone number. So let me just key in my phone number. 
And then uh, after that, it will be able to generate a, a ticket for me. So this is the ticket, uh, which is supposed, uh, which will be ideally will be raised into the system. So from here, uh, how the setup is within the shop, we have a display screen. Uh, so this display screen initiates a callout ticket. So it will check on an available agent, and then it will request the, uh, the agent to be able to pick that ticket. So this is just case a scenario. So the callout ticket will be able to pick up on this ticket, and then assign it to agent Harris. So we just switch off to the agent screen. And then from the agent screen, the ticket will appear in that way with all my KYC bio data, which uh, is uh, integrated into the CRM system. And then from there, the agent will be able to initiate that specific ticket to be able to serve the customer. So, at the moment, so from here, uh, all the tickets which have been issued or rather which have been served, they can be able to be used to measure based on the productivity of how the shop is performing. And also the managers can be able to log in into the manager view at the back of the screen to check on how the footfall is flowing within their specific shop. So from here, so this is the window where now the manager can be able to view from the back office, uh, just to be able to show how many agents are active uh, out of the agents which are, which are supposed to be on the floor at the same time. So if, if you can be able to see from the specific uh, uh, icons or the tabs up, up there, the zone showing the agent attendance, which shows two, two agents are logged in, which have been shown down there under agent, agent activity, out of the six agents who are supposed to be serving under that specific shop. So the same system also allows us to do, we have something called HVC. HVC stands for high value customers. So there are those scenarios where we have uh, customers, uh, case scenario, uh, the politicians, or uh, someone who, let's say the Meralis and the late Kirubis who would like just come and access on a specific service uh, directly. So that option allows them to be able to initiate uh, those bookings at the same time. It also allows us to, it's also integrated into Zuri, so customers can be able to initiate a booking from the Zuri app, which will be able to appear from this side. So because of time, I will allow Kemboi and Charles uh, to talk about the tech stack which we are using on the solution. Uh, so my name is Edwin. Um, I'm a software developer, uh, specifically a back-end developer. So uh, I support retail team. Uh, so I'm here to talk about the stack we are using. Uh, so for the front-end, uh, we, we build uh, using React. Uh, the developer is not around, but I'm here to represent him. Uh, so we are using React for what you're seeing. Um, and then uh, we have, uh, we build this using microservices because we wanted it to, to scale. So for the microservices, we build them using uh, Spring Boot. Uh, that is Java Spring Boot. Um, uh, and we deploy our services on AWS. So I think Charles will speak about more of AWS. Um, so for us, we've uh, automated that process of, uh, from uh, as developers, we submit our code on Git. That is what we are using for version management. After that, um, uh, the, the changes are pushed to AWS using a pipeline uh, built. Uh, we, we use Jenkins for, for I'm, I know you guys are developers, so you understand. So we use Jenkins to, to push our, our, our code, that is our CI CD. Um, so when the, when the code is on uh, AWS, um, so we also, we also do automated testing. Uh, so we do unit test for a specific uh, functional testing or, on the code, and also uh, for, the, for the quality assurance part, we've also automated that process. So we have uh, some Python scripts that can, can, can do the, the, the testing. Uh, it simulates the logging in, um, the creation of tickets, and um, so just the whole process, we automate the process so that we reduce the time that we, when we, when we are providing new features, we reduce that time uh, for, for, for ensuring that everything is working well. Um, uh, I think I've covered uh, most of the, of the things we, we use. Uh, I think I'll invite Charles to just take you through uh, a bit of what we use to, to, to run our services on AWS. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, thank you.
Edwin? Yeah, I'm Charles. I am the solution architect for the Little Digitization Squad uh, within the digital channels. And uh, mainly we had a number of services on AWS. Actually, QMS utilizes a number of services, but I'm just going to concentrate on the key ones because what Harris has explained around the ticket management in terms of the time the customer uh, get into the shop and actually the time you input your MSSDN rather or the mobile number, there are a number of things that are triggered and uh, we actually trigger the microservices for ticketing and that goes uh, to the ADXL service just to ensure that the, your ticket is appended with the service that uh, you want to be served on. And from there, we, uh, the ticket uh, number is generated because we said a request to the EQMS DB and we generate the ticket. But more to that, we have now the AWS uh, uh, ad whereby we utilize a number of service. And uh, for AWS, we utilize the CloudFront. CloudFront uh, usually help us to actually expose uh, our fronted uh, services. It is actually for mainly to uh, manage our fronted services for content management within our fronted. We also utilize the API gateway. And uh, this one is actually to enable us to expose the, the services. So we utilize the API gateway. Then we have another service we use. It's called uh, Amazon Poly. It's the one that helps us to convert the text to speech. So we use uh, Amazon Poly. Then from there, we have the, the orchestration environment. We use the EKS. And mainly, EKS, EKS enables us to uh, actually manage our, or rather containerize our, our applications and our containers because we utilize, the, we, we utilize the EKS. Then from there, we have now the, the other, other uh, uh, mainly the components that we use, like the EKS, because we mainly manage this through our uh, network VPC, and rather that one uh, is mainly handled within the, our channel VPC, the virtual private cloud. So we also utilize uh, the RDS to actually persist our data. So we utilize the Redis database to utilize our, I mean, to uh, persist our data. So again, that one is something we, we, we use. Where for our logs, we use uh, the CrowdWatch uh, to just ensure we manage our logs. So those are the main components we use. I don't know whether I might have forgotten any, but those are the main ones within our AWS environment. Yeah, maybe if I have, uh, if I have forgotten any, Edwin, you can assist. But I, those are the main ones that we use for EKMS. But the others... The other components within AWS that we use for just to manage the, to, to ensure that uh, we actually do efficient management of our e, uh, EQMS. Yeah. I don't know whether I might have forgotten any, but those are the main ones. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, so I think uh, that's it from us. I don't know if there are any questions. And maybe just to add, um, one of the benefits of us being able to host on AWS is stability. We have experienced more than 99.9% stability on our systems. We also make use of automated testing, automated deployment. So even after deployments, we do not have downtimes, and that has been great for us. Any questions for us? I think what's, what's great, um, and if you could have a roving mic on this side, I think what's great is to also, also show that it takes, it takes teams to deliver solutions. You know, sometimes uh, people wonder why does it take one or two or more people is because of those specializations that, we, uh, that even Michael alluded to earlier. And this is fantastic to see that showcase so, so, so gracefully on, on, on this particular team. And has this solution been given out to other, to other customers? Because I know so many other places that we could do with Niko Hapa, Nakuja, you know, those sort of scenarios. Or a guy says, Nilikuwa Hapa. Yet when you have a solution like this, it totally removes from that social awkwardness. Yes, this is something we can definitely monetize. And actually, we are looking into it. Okay. Yes. Fantastic. So, um, could you get a mic for that question? Please proceed. Go ahead. 
I love the dashboard that you had shown. So you've not mentioned what you use for the analytics. Do you use AWS or is it your own solution? Okay. So for analytics, we use ClickSense. Uh -huh. uh, so we, uh, we, collect, we collect all the data and then we have a dashboard that is actually accessed by the manager, accessed by the regional teams, even the HODs. They can be able to see at a glance all our shops, mm -hmm. how they are performing, what their service level is, the number of customers that visited any shop, how long they stayed, how long the uh, uh, customer stayed, the longest time that a particular customer stayed. So we have a dashboard for all that, and it's on, on ClickSense. On ClickSense. Why not on AWS? I know AWS has a solution for the dashboard. <laughs> yeah, maybe just to add on that, uh, when the data get to the BI environment, yeah, we utilize uh, NIFI to do the ETL now to, to pull that data to, to ClickSense, rather to the, 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 I mean to the DB that we use now for, if it's Postgres or any other DB that we use for our own consumption, then after that, we ensure that that data is also pushed to ClickSense for that, the, data, the dashboard that you are seeing there. Yeah, just for an addition. Fantastic. Any other, any other question before we, the retail team uh, gets off stage? Going once, going twice. Suen team, thank you. Asante Sana for that excellent showcase. Okay. Allow me to ask this. Oh, where? Where are we? Okay. Yeah, you just talked about uh, the front-end architecture. You talked about React. I was waiting for the back-end. What uh, architecture do you normally use for the back-end? So, um, actually, I'd, I'd say so for our back-end, so we run a, a microservice architecture, and we use, am I audible? Yes, sir. Um, and we use um, Spring Boot, uh, Java Spring Boot, that is. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. Fantastic. Kasante Nisana, um, kindly give them a round of applause as they exit stage. And we'll jump right back in uh, to where we left off with, um, with, the, with the last group, looking at um, you know, the DevOps maturity demo. Hopefully, hopefully, you guys are now good to go. Not. Uh, okay, okay. I, think, um, I, I think that one may be, may be shelved for another time. So ladies and gentlemen, at this point in time, I'd like to call your attention for our health break. We're going to go for a 10-minute health break um, with some awesome music from DJ Mish. DJ Mish, wapi wewe. So we'll reconvene here, back here after 10 minutes. Please enjoy the music and kindly network. Thank you. This is a land of wonder. The source of all life. Cradle of civilization. Right now, a wave of intelligence is spurring new growth. Cloud and AI are breathing new life into this fertile land of ours. Here, intelligence connects all things, driving insights for a smarter future. Track weather changes, uncover the secrets of time and space. Explore the depths of the universe with relentless computing power. Tap into the pulse of Mother Nature, bringing smart agriculture to the field. Analyze geological structures to unearth more resources. Activate the value of data for more efficient use of energy. Accelerate viral gene analysis to save people's lives. On this land, computing unlocks boundless possibility. Build intelligent roads for a faster, safer drive home. Reclaim the desert and give life back to Earth. Free up workers with intelligent inspection. Jumpstart the digital economy with intelligent data infrastructure. Make minds safer, smarter. Teach and learn more freely, anytime, anywhere. 
push beyond limits and scale new heights. On this vibrant land, AI is driving an intelligent upgrade, powering industry growth. Together, we can build an open, collaborative ecosystem that thrives on shared success. On this fertile land, let's build an intelligent world together with ubiquitous cloud and intelligence for all scenarios. Efficiency, cost, productivity. Business as usual has always been about turning a profit. If you stop to think about it, what more is there? The universe. Nature. Life. Civilization as we know it is about the search for something greater than ourselves. Huawei Cloud is innovating technologies to make the world more inclusive. The Cloud, AI, 5G are building a fully connected, intelligent world. They do more than drive digital transformation. It's a new paradigm for innovation. Imagine, if you can, what amazing secrets await when we unlock the secrets of the universe. What cosmic answers will we learn? AI can help preserve in the rainforest by identifying the sounds of gunshots or the sounds of illegal logging, protecting the most precious sounds, birds and trees for generations to come. In cities around the world, we can collect traffic data and analyze it to improve transportation and bring order to a chaotic world. Even reporting the weather can be improved with AI. With more accurate forecasts and timely alerts, we'll travel safer and get home to our loved ones. Also, so many delicious flavors, chili, herbs, and spices automatically selected to improve flavor, quality, and nutrition. Delightful flavor explosions to dazzle our taste buds. A cloud for everyone, unleashing the power of innovation, making every day better. A cloud for pervasive intelligence and a better future. Huawei Cloud. Grow with intelligence. I hope you've enjoyed... <clears throat> My voice decided to fail me just at the nick of time, but I do hope you enjoyed those demos just as much as I did. Remember, 1GB at 10 shillings to make sure you're not missing a single thing. Go to your Safaricom, buy 1GB, 10 bob for a whole hour. It'll last you the entire time. You don't have any excuse to not be here for the live sessions. I do have credit to award. Let me just see who's winning credit off. First of all, <laughs> I've got a few names, so I'll go through them. The winner for the very, very first question. Beatrice Wakarima, congratulations, you have won yourself 500 bob worth of airtime. Beatrice Wakarima. For question two, Roba Karush Mawaya, 500 bob worth of airtime is coming your way, congratulations. Timothy Karaoke as well, you are a winner. Again, 500 bob worth of airtime is coming your way. And of course, Joel Mosetti, our fourth winner of the day. Thank you so much for everyone who participated. I saw how fast you came in and I appreciate it. I've got lots more airtime to give away in just a few seconds. So do stick with us. For Beatrice, Roba, 
Timothy Joel. DM Twitter page Safaricom PLC, only the verified one to get your credit, okay? Only the verified one. Be careful. We'll be with you in just a moment. We're going to go now to our next session. But before we do that, I wanted us to wrap up what we've just learned from the previous section and go through our YouTube comments because you guys are having very interested, interesting conversations. First of all, there seems to be an agreement amongst a lot of you that back-end people are quiet. Um, <laughs> I see programming tips. You say I'm a back-end too. I know the hustle of doing demos. Um, great presentation. That's from Morris TK. Uh, JQS Jake Mox Masharia, you see, I have severally tried to use AWS, but I always get out um, due to the non predictability. I hope today's demonstrations have helped you feel more confident in using AWS services, Masharia. I've also seen um, someone asking, should I wait? Let me get the question right. Has anyone tried to use. Oh wow, I've lost the, the comment, but you, um, I've seen someone said that presentation is a soft skill. Um, Backend guys love to talk less. It seems to be the agreed upon version. But thank you so much for keeping us entertained, keeping us engaged, and for keeping us all, for staying with us throughout this entire session. Like I said, 500 bob worth of airtime to all the four names that I spoke to earlier. I'll have a second trivia session where you have another chance to win more airtime. So do stick with us for that. But let's also have a look at exactly what we talked about about in the last few sessions. Um, for the engineers in the house, there was the chaos engineering session, which was um, teaching us how to find creative solutions, out of the box solutions, to stabilize and roll out software um, solutions, basically. As they suggest, chaos engineering, bringing something new to the table. After that, we moved on to robotic process automation, RPA. And uh, we had a live demo on that from the automation team. And it's the part of technology, uh, digital information, the part of the team that is responsible for delivering automation, basically testing and rolling out automation solutions across the organization. And they explained it's as simple as sometimes as a copy and paste here and there. But of course, as engineering um, students and people knowledgeable in the field, you know it's not as easy as it looks. But we give it up to the team who do this hard work to make sure that the customer, the end user, is having a great experience with all Safaricom products. We went on to DevOps, uh, DevOps Maturity, where um, part of the DIT team who do, who do this, they make a pipeline for automation and software delivery in the organization by building continuous improvement and delivery frameworks. Again, work that ensures that the end user is happy and satisfied, but is never really seen from the outside. So again, shout out to the DIT team and to all the work that goes in here. Um, then we also have EQMS, we also had an EQMS live de demo where the retail digitization is tasked with simplification of retail shop processes, basically ensuring that your agents are able to serve customers within the shortest time possible. So the end user is never, ever, ever inconvenienced. I want to play a fun game with you guys. After all of that, the demos have been engaging. We've been on, we've been through it, we've been learning, our heads are aching. And sometimes when you're in a room like this, when you're at home, it's easy to get um, tunnel vision. Your world revolves around you and you forget that there's a whole big world out there. There's a whole big country. So if you're watching us online, please let me know what you're, where you are watching us from. I'll go on YouTube right now and see where exactly you guys are watching us from. I know there's a bit of a lag on, on my end, so it'll take me a while. I've seen Roba asking Credo Haifiki, Roba, it's as simple as you going to the Safaricom PLC page on Twitter, DMing them because you've won, and they will verify. I'm sure they'll ask for your verification details, your ID number, your phone number, and then boom, air account. It's as, airtime, sorry. It's as easy as that. So, Robad, do not worry. Um, Maxwell, all the way from Kisumu, thank you. Um, thank you. Let me know where else you're watching from. I want to create a map of all our virtual audience so that we don't feel like we are the Sarit Expo Center by ourselves, so that we don't feel like we are the virtual audience only from Nairobi. I want to see where else. Um, Boho Web says, yay, Spring Boot for backend. Not sure what that's from. Um, I see Code Hub all the way from Nakuru. I see Theophilus Bitok. That's such a unique name, first of all. Theo for short, I hope. You're in Nairobi. Uh, Arthur Chege from Sioki. I hope you were saying Sioki Mao. That was a typo. Sioki Yo. Unless <laughs> that's what the cool kids are calling Sioki Mao, which I will accept. I'm not a cool kid. Um, I've got Gidiz all the way from Cleveland. Ohio. Okay, all right. I told you we're creating a map here. Um, Fatma, all the way from Mombasa. I've got Simon Buru, all the way from London. Love it. 
Someone, Joffrey from KCA University Main Campus. Thank you so much for tuning in, Jeffrey. Like keep your Shadra Kor. Mister, I'm not for 4G in a 5G country. Okay, 1GB at 10 bob for an entire hour. People are watching from everywhere. James Muhoro from Kiambu. I've got Trevor in South Sea. Um, I've got Dennis Omboga all the way from Safaricom Eldred Contact Center. Man, I love seeing and hearing from you guys. Programming tips on some Montaka diaspora, Rungai. We'll take it. It is the di diaspora. I agree with you 100%. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. Please do stay engaged. I'll have another trivia session in the afternoon where I'll give you more credits, okay? So be sure to listen to what they're saying in there. Be sure to pay attention. And also, if you've got some general knowledge, you know, around engineering, around tech, especially the history bits of it, now would be the time to brush up because money is coming your way. Airtime is coming your way. Thank you so much for staying engaged. We'll go back in and now see what's happening on the main stage. So I'll hand over to Mbogwa. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Calling the room to order, please. It's fantastic. Different um, demos from the different teams, but I'd like for us to proceed to, you know, to the next to the next stage or the next um, segment. So kindly, the guys at the at the Dell corner, at the AWS corner, at the Huawei corner. Please make your way back to the seats. In our next session, which, is, um, which precedes our lunch, we actually look at, um, at some actual, at four more Safaricom teams sharing exactly how they get to deliver various products at scale, okay? So we've got four different teams with their presentations looking at how they get to deliver various products within their team. And the first one, looking, giving us an architectural walkthrough, is part of the DIT team that delivers on the data exchange layer and ensures that the solutions and products delivered are both scalable and standard. So David Kazi, over to you. but I would want to take you through an interesting session. So when you guys have been, have been hearing about our teams talk about the engineering, talk about uh, how we deliver the, the, how we deliver the products that we currently have. Huh? So we have, uh, we have an architecture, we call it the digital channels uh, experience layer, which I would want to take you guys through so that you appreciate the different uh, communities that come in there. So. So when you look at the implementations that are happening, so like for example, the previous team was, who was the team that was presenting, they were, they were showcasing a solution that was an EQMS solution. And uh, EQMS is a product that is a result of this architecture. Now when you look at this architecture, you see at the top post layer, it's the channels. So basically we'd want to build our channels from a reference, reference uh, blueprint that will help us ensure that the products that we currently have have the similar seamless experience. Meaning, if you go to the app side, the experience you get on app A or you get to go to app B, they have the, a similar kind of experience. Uh, when you go to the portals, for example, the portal that was, that was showcased, it was a portal that is built out of this blueprint where the front end, like uh, you had Edwin speak, uh, the front end is built under React and they are all built under one design Bible. By design Bible, or uh, the front end bit we mean, the user experience that is, the, the user experience, the user design is designed from a particular uh, framework that is consistent across. This helps us build the application from, uh, uh, that, that gives us a seamless experience to the customers. Now, uh, for us, the next layer is uh, we need those applications to talk to our backend, backend services. I heard somebody ask, how do, we, wh how do you handle the backend bit? Now, that is where we have now all APIs that uh, we expose to the different channels being enabled. 
Meaning, if uh, I wanted to do a ticketing, I wanted to generate a ticket, that particular API has been exposed on the API layer. So today you saw it is being exposed and consumed from the EQMS portal. If uh, you go uh, in the roadmap, if you go to Safaricom map, you should be able to raise the request from there, and they'll be consuming the same API. So that is the next layer that comes in. And then there are a number of backing services that we provide for, for, for execution, for, for, for implementation. So when you call the backing service, uh, we have uh, one of them is like a technical service. Basically, a technical service, this gives you a specific uh, capability. So for example, if I wanted to do balance inquiry for, 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 for my airtime, then that becomes like a technical service. So I only focus on airtime inquiry. But at the same time, we also have uh, items like uh, other services, like for example, I want to query balance for bundles, or I want to query balance for, 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 for uh, let's say, bonga points. So uh, the next bit comes in where you do the journey services. Uh, journey services allows you so that you don't have multiple queries to the backend, you are able to build you are able to combine multiple capabilities to, to have a seamless experience. So you make one a single API call, and then we have composite services that are coming in to expose these capabilities together. So like for example, if you go to the app, when you go to the balances page, you are able to see all the balances coming in because several, several API calls are happening in the background through the journey services that are there. Uh, the others that are supporting, uh, we have uh, the functional and the mapping. But, uh, this basically they help us in terms of how do we expose or how do we communicate on the, on the services the same way. Now, for example, uh, if you go to, if, if, if you have a message that I need to give a customer, let's say this transaction was successful, so we have a mapping services that helps us to give us that particular capability. If tomorrow from user research we identify that that particular uh, message needs to change, let's say we need to speak to a particular targeted customer, we'll say, dear David Kazi, we need uh, your transaction was successful. That would come in when we do the, ma the, the error map or we do the mapping services. So we are able to have targeted messages or we're able to customize the messages that we have with build to the customers. And it's reusable across all the, all the services that we have. Uh, somebody was asking about uh, uh, analytics. So when you have, on, on, the, on the reference architecture, we have a streaming architecture, we have event streaming. So we want to collect all the, trans, all the interactions that the customers have on the channels. So you go, to, let's say, to our Zuri platform, you do balance inquiry. We should be able to have that, that interaction in our database or in our data lake so that we know that you actually went to Zuri and you actually tried to do balance inquiry. If you change the channel and you went to Safari come up and you did, the, you did a balance inquiry, so through the event streaming, we should be able to have that information. And now that is where the capabilities are. So uh, we have a number of tools or uh, technology tools that we use for that particular, and I should be able to speak to them maybe in the next uh, slide. Uh, when we look at uh, how do we then enable the various engineers, so you've noticed that we are discussing from different uh, engineering communities. So we have, at the top layer, you have the front-end engineers, uh, then you have the API and microservices engineer, then you have the back-end engineers. So how do we enable them in terms of they should be able to deploy the solutions in a seamless and a quality, a quality aspect? That's when, on the right side, you have uh, the DevOps and the tooling team. Basically, here, they come and help us in terms of when we say we want to build front-end engineer, let's say a React application, you want to build it and uh, you have to conform to a specific standards that we've built, then the DevOps team come in and be able to implement that one through the pipelines that we currently have. So the, every day you are, you are doing your builds, every day you are doing your check-in, the, 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 the automation tools, the CICD pipelines, it gets executed and they help us check in terms of the compliance for the various development. So as we are doing that one from the front, for the front-end team, there's also the back-end team because we are continuously building these services. We are continuously building uh, many journeys or, or many products on the platform. So we also have that particular uh, team also being supported on the, on the architecture. Uh, for, 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 for matrices, before I go to the data, 
So yes, we need to collect a lot of information so that we can serve the customer. So when, 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 when we have a customer, let's say, have a particular problem in our channel, we should be able to identify what is the problem in that particular area so that we are able to automatically uh, resolve those, uh, that particular incident. And this is where in the morning uh, when you heard George say that we are doing uh, always, always on and we want a better experience is we don't, we don't want to have our customers uh, complain because, let's say, uh, I went to the app and this particular function or journey was not executed. So we want to continuously check uh, which are the problematic uh, services that are, that are available so that we can remediate even before uh, we have complaints from the customer. And that's where the matrices come in. We have an, an, an SRE team and we have uh, capabilities that we've already built there so that we can have this information. When you go to data management, uh, we, have, we, have, we, have, we have a targeted reference architecture on which are the data management platforms we can support uh, our data storage. So if an, if an engineer or if a particular use case that we, that we have there uh, for a particular journey, let's say you are building a product catalog, if, if it requires, let's say you need to do, uh, use a document database or uh, on any NoSQL engine, then we have, a, we have a catalog or we have a predefined use cases for which which, which database tools you should be able to use for which use cases. So we should be able, so an engineer should be able, should be able to know that when I'm doing this particular journey, since it's, it has a dependency or no SQL, then you have a set of recommended uh, databases that you can use. If you are building an application that really requires the consistency, that is if you need to do atomicity, that is you really want to maintain relationship between your data, then we also have a, a set of database that is available. So that is, that is what we've built. So like if you look at the architecture, it cuts end to end. Um, we are building the reference, we are building the digital channel experience for the customer. There are different parties that come in and that's where, we, that's where different components come in. At the below layer, this is where now we have our core platforms. So our core platforms, uh, we usually say they are slow moving because we, d we wouldn't want to change the core platforms as fast as possible, but we'd want to change the front end journeys for the customers as fast as possible. That's why they come at the lower layer. At the lower layer, uh, the, these, these, these are the likes of, let's say, we want to know your billing information, we want to know how the customer relationship information, that's where we store the information. So basically, if you look at the reference architecture, the DXL uh, architecture, it takes care of all the engineering communities across, from front end, back end, data and analytics, and even SRE, and any, any team can play in that. Now, the reason we, are, we have uh, this uh, reference architecture is uh, we would want to standardize how development happens. I wouldn't want Steve to be developing a front-end application differently from, let's say, Laban. Okay? We are working for the same customer, we are working for this, with the same engineering practices, then this gives us that particular opportunity. At the same time, this helps us adopt uh, modern architectures. For example, we've said we want to build uh, uh, microservices. Microservices allow us to build uh, independent components or modules as fast as possible that we can deploy uh, easily. At the same time, it allows us to enable our teams to be agile as fast as possible, such that different teams can build different applications and they are following the same standard. So it gives us that ag agility with respect to that. Then if you look at it, uh, the, modern, the modern way of working on the digital architecture that we are, we, are, we are looking at is always to be cloud native. By cloud native, it means how do you ensure your solution can easily be scalable on the, on the various cloud platforms that we currently have. And this, allow, this one allows us also to enable ourselves to be, to, to be as much as possible cloud agnostic. You should be able to scale your applications on-prem, you should be able to scale your application on any cloud provider that is available. So this architecture also allows, allows us in, those, uh, in, in that um, aspect. Okay. So going to the specific components, maybe the next slide. So I'll focus largely on uh, when you go to the, f the, 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 the front end, so we usually we build the web apps and we build the, uh, the, the, the mobile apps. So on the web app, we have uh, two core frameworks we use. So we use uh, React.js and uh, we use uh, Angular, but the primary framework for, for front end is React uh, development. Uh, when we go for mobile, we have uh, two frameworks. We are currently adding another one very soon. So we do um, uh, Kotlin, that is for Android application, and we do Swift, that is for, that is for iOS application. 
So that's what we support. We, uh, we, we, we are adding the React Native so that we can be able to build a, a one application and it deploy across. Uh, the retail and contact center, these applications that we use to support our customers at the call centers and the agencies, that's why they are not green, but they are not in directly customer interfacing. For IoT, my colleague is coming next, he'll give you a deep, deep dive into the IoT and the specifics, but the protocols, uh, we use a standard protocol for IoT, well, that is for machine to machine, the MQTT. For third parties, uh, we support our third parties through the APIs. So we have uh, the, we have Daraja, we have uh, APIs exposed as RESTful APIs. So we plan in our roadmap to expose our services as gRPC. But now that become that will only be limited to interprocesses where we can only communicate between our services. But for the front front facing, we will continue to expose as uh, REST. So. Now, coming to the microservices, uh, we, 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 we have our services deployed on, 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 on uh, uh, running on Docker. Our orchestration, uh, as we use uh, uh, Kubernetes, so we have EKS and we have uh, uh, OpenShift for on-prem. So that is, uh, those are the services. So there's also a team, that's why we say th there's also a community that handles uh, automation and uh, tooling. Uh, microservices, uh, our primary uh, framework for microservices is uh, Java, uh, like my colleague has pre had previously mentioned. Uh, Java, uh, we are currently adding Go and uh, .NET. So those are the two that we are adding. The distos I've mentioned, uh, so we currently run for, for the, we currently have Oracle, uh, that is for, 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 for some, for, for systems, but primarily, which we are migrating, primarily we are migrating to other open source tools. So we want to leverage a lot of open source tools in our development. So we are having, uh, so for relational, we have um, uh, Postgre that we, that we support a lot. Uh, for none, for NoSQL, we support a lot on uh, MongoDB. That is what we currently use. And uh, yeah, for relational, we also do uh, Maria that, or MySQL, but largely it's Maria. And the Disto for large scale distributed uh, databases for analytics, uh, we do uh, Cassandra. So that is where the data management team comes in. Uh, yeah, for I think for DevSecOps, uh, uh, my team was to come in, so we use Jenkins. So for the community uh, interested in, 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 in uh, DevSecOps, we use uh, Jenkins for the builds, uh, for, for, for the automation, for the deployments. Then for the builds, we use Maven. Uh, for scanning our code, we use uh, SonarCube. So those are the tools we use. Uh, for, for what, uh, for to, uh, yeah, those for SCM, uh, we use uh, GitLab. That is what uh, we use. And uh, we've already built, built in some practices around that so that uh, if I want to check in my code, I should be able to raise a pull request so that uh, a peer or a colleague reviews my code. Uh, the uncutting function that is on security and mentioning, uh, we wouldn't want... Uh, our services to be to be to be made available without security. So, from the customer access point, uh, we are. Uh, if you go to our apps, you usually auto get auto automatically authenticated on the platform. Is because we have behind the scenes built an inbuilt authentication module. Uh, we use head enrichment. Uh, we are currently uh, piloting a Safaricom digital ID. Basically, you should have a customer uh, be able to choose their identity so that you are able to manage all your different accounts as one. So that is where we are. We are that's what we are piloting on. Uh, we have health checks. We have SRE made available. Each service, we have a threshold that uh, a service should, not, should uh, error at less than... Uh, 1%, meaning our services, we, are target, we have a target of 99% ava availability. So that gives us uh, the guarantee we have on the services. Yeah, uh, we have dashboards that help our team monitor. So when I'm on call, I'm on call and I have uh, uh, customers uh, who have who an alert that has come in, there's a particular problem. I'm able to go to the dashboard and be able to identify which is a particular service. Uh, then I'm able to troubleshoot that particular uh, service because we already, we've already built a stand, standardized logging uh, functionality so that you're able to support the, 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 the various requests that we have. 
So pretty much uh, that is it. If there are any questions, we should be able to take, but that is our reference architecture. Thank you. Santa Sana, David, you see it says digital experience layer. He's just been serving sandwiches over here. Like you can't, you can't, you can't just look at this and just take it in simply. So the, the great thing is that, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a live session, it's a recorded session, so you can always go back and kupekua. Because there's, there's probably something you don't understand here or haven't, haven't ever haven't utilized before. So do make that a point. Uh, go to the social media pages where it's been streamed. On, it's on LinkedIn, it's on, uh, it's on Facebook, it's on YouTube. Um, and then, of course, I believe that through the, through the hashtag, they'll be able to see any comments that you, you put out there. So another round of applause for David Kazi. Having looked at the, uh, at the digital experience layer. Now the next team taking us uh, closer and closer to lunch is uh, the team from uh, Daraja. It's part of the DIT team that makes sure that financial services can be provided in an integrated layer that, are, that is friendly to use for all communities and scale, scalable products. So kindly welcome on stage the Daraja team. Thank you and good afternoon. Yes, my name is uh, Mugure Florence and uh, I have with me Michelle. Uh, hello, my name is Michelle Mweni. I am a passionate web developer and uh, as of now I am a mini apps developer. Yes. Great. So we are the mini apps team and we are going to take you through how um, the mini apps platform um, is built and how this can benefit you as developers. So I want us to start uh, with the end product and the end product is on your phones. So if you have your phone with you and it is bold of me to assume that you all have the M-Pesa app downloaded on your phones, but let's go to the M-Pesa app. Let's log into the M-Pesa app. We want to see the mini apps in action. Okay, great. So um, when you're on the, on the home page and you scroll down, you will see a section there called services and there are some services there for you. So let us assume, for instance, you want to buy electricity tokens and you click on power. I hope all of you have power that is recommended for you. So once you click on power, it opens up a, a mini app and uh, from this partner, you can be able to buy electricity tokens. You can see the recent tokens that you have bought. And every time you buy, you get a Kiba point, so you can see how many points you have, and maybe you can use those points again to buy electricity powers. So this, this is the end product uh, called a mini app. And how we work with mini apps is that we have partnered with, um, we have partnered with several um, sectors including like utilities, we have retail, we have health, um, we have transport, ETC, and we have partnered with them so that they can bring their services closer to the M-Pesa customers. So the M-Pesa app has um, over 5 million downloads and when you develop a mini app, the users of M-Pesa do not need to download any updates or download any other app, but they will have access to your to your services. So mini apps basically are mini programs that are hosted within another app. And here now we have our M-Pesa lifestyle app. We also have M-Pesa business app. And with the business app, we have mini apps that speak more to the business. So like I said, we do partnerships. We have about 100 partners right now. Some of them like Power have already completed their development and their app is available to our customers. Some others are still within, um, within the development life cycle. And uh, we offer support to our partners to be able to complete the de development of their mini apps and host it on our platform. And uh, so together we develop that, that platform. Um, <coughs> 
what what is in it for you as a developer is that as soon as you are done with your mini app and we publish it it is automatically available to our five million customers who are actively using the mpesa app and then we'll give you a platform that you can be able to to develop that mpesa and michelle will take you through that platform shortly and then we, you will have access to the developer community on daraja so now we have um, included mini apps as part of the daraja uh, uh, portal and then we also offer free training whenever you require it and we handhold you until you're able to to complete your development so with that uh, we can do a quick demo where michelle will take you through how a mini app is developed and the technology that we use um, hi again, so my name is Michelle and as of uh, I think like five months ago I started my journey in the mini app space and I'm a mini app developer. It's an interesting space to be at and what is um, fun about it is you don't need to learn a whole new programming language. Mini apps are based on web technologies and the web technologies, as we wait for them to set it up, it's based on web technologies. So if you're familiar with HTML, if you're familiar with CSS and JavaScript, it's going to be, it's not going to be an uphill task to learn. Um, so for mini apps, um, you can continue telling stories. I know most of us were expecting the Daraja guys here so that we pump them with questions. But Nisisi uh, Ndiotuko. <laughs> so we, okay, so the mini apps and the Daraja had a handshake. So we are still one big family of fintech solutions tribe. So you can go to the Daraja space and you'll find the mini apps tab. And from the mini apps tab, you'll be able to learn more about the mini apps. You can get to know what is happening. Uh, you can see my people are still looking for me on the teams. But uh, you can see, you can get to learn what's, what's a mini app, what does it entail, how do you program it, how do you develop it. It has your documentations and everything involved on the learn more. And if you can go back to Daraja, uh, there we will have a sign up form. So before this, we used to, if you want a mini app, you had to write an email to us. We give you a form, you fill the form, you get back to us. It was a lot of back and forth. And so to cut that, we were able to, again, have a handshake with the Raja team and get our sign up form on their page. Here you'll sign up with your details, your business details, your contact person and admin requirements. These are needed because once you're approved by us, you're given a workspace. And on this workspace, you're able to release your mini app, you're able to see how and where your mini app, uh, the stages of your mini apps and how it goes. So if you get approval, you get to the mini apps um, workspace. And yes, it's that third, no, the third, the third tab. Yes. So on, this is the M-Pesa mini app workspace. On this workspace is where you will be able, where you're bundled. Um, so how it works is once you write your code, it's bundled up and you're able to upload a version of it on the workspace. So from this workspace, you should be able to create a mini app. You'll be able to see your development tools, documentation. And uh, once you create your mini app is when now you can, from the, docu from the, sorry, from the development tools, you get your IDE. And the IDE now is the mini program studio. And from this mini program studio is where you have, you will have your, you'll have the place where you're not going to code. The code, like I said, is a lot on HTML, JS, and CSS. So if you view the pages, we have home and we have index. Our entry point for the app is on app.js. Uh, it will be app.js, thank you. This is your entry point uh, for this app. And then it will have all your static assets. So you can call all your static assets here, image, assets. And uh, from then on, we have the app.json. The app.json will contain uh, the pages and some of, uh, some of the things that you will need to, like we have default title like summit. It can always be changed, but this is where you'll change it from. It, you can write summit one. Um, and then from there we have, and you can see it has changed to summit one. We have pages and index, and this is where you, all your pages will be rendered. 
So on index, we have our index.acss. You'll write the CSS for that index page. We have our index.axml. Um, and index.axml is what you're seeing on, the, on, on this side of the screen, where you have Welcome to Engineering Summit, you have your image, and you have your buttons. So this also has a component based. You can write your components, like you can have components of button. Once you create your button, you're able to call it on, your in, on any other page. How you're able to do that is at the index.json, that is where you will introduce your components, and then from there, give it a name. The name can be anything, and then give it the URL where it's going to be located, and then now you can use it. Uh, that is just a simple journey on creating it. If you want to see how it is rendered on your phone, we have the preview. The preview. Uh, once you click on preview, it should generate a QR code. I don't know if from your M-Pesa app you can run the QR code. You can try. Um, we're going to leave it there for a while as we try to run the QR code. Uh, if you can't, we still have a video for it, no worries. Uh, but, okay, let's first see how it works. <laughs> so you'll be able to go to your M-Pesa app and um, scan the code. And once you scan the code, let us scan. It will render on your app, and you'll be able to see it. We'll just go back to the page, and we'll see if anyone can is able and able to see it from your M-Pesa app. If you could go back to yes, and we have does could anyone uh, does it work for anyone? <laughs> we can try. It works. Oh. Thank you. Okay. So you'll be able to see it on your phone. You can go, if you click on continue, it will take you to another page, which is like home page. I don't know if I'm blocking anyone. Yes. So basically, that is a small journey on creating a mini app. Once you're done and you feel like this mini app, I'm happy with what I've done, you'll go to upload version. Uh, upload a version and just upload it. Like you see, an online version is 1.05, and the version we are going to upload is about like 1.06. And then from there, you can, and here you'll be able to see all your versions. And that's just the start of an exciting journey for developing mini apps. That would be it for our presentation. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, you can ask. Asanteni Sana, I think um, there must be lots of questions. I have many myself, but because of time and uh, we need to catch up with the program, please find these lovely ladies at the, at the M-Pesa booth there, where you can get to know more about you know, the M-Pesa mini apps. If you're a developer, how can you get on board? Um, a, and a quick start that I remember for partners, one, one of the partners who's participated and published their app. When they published their app and then Safaricom went on to do an activation campaign for them, they saw 8,000 new customers. And if you've attended any sessions, if you're in marketing and you ask someone, what's the cost of customer acquisition when looking at apps? They tell you it's about, it's about a dollar for normal apps and maybe three bucks for, for financial services app, apps. So since this was a normal app, not one of your FinTech apps, what does 8,000 new users um, amount to? $8,000, ukipigia sabu na now, FX easy. you're looking at something close to 900,000 shillings in value. So as a developer, as any small business, and you, and you can see that your particular offering can make sense being on the mini app, it's a no-brainer to, uh, to get yourself on there. So moving quickly so that we can um, catch up with the program, I'd like to invite on stage the, the Safaricom app team, okay? That was, the, that was the mini app team. Now we're looking at the Safaricom app team to share with us the, their journey, uh, looking at the digital channels, and to take us through that is Brian Kenyiri. Karibu. Hello, hi everyone. 
My name is Rosmina. I am an IOS engineer, working, currently working on my Safari Com app. This is my colleague. Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Brian Kanyiri. I'm an Android engineer for my Safari Com app. So today we'll be telling you about the story of my Safari Com app, where we were, where we're at, and showcase some of the features that we have on the application. So what is my Safari Com app? MSA is an application that, sorry, so my Safaricom app is essentially an application that allows you to manage your, it's a self-service uh, based uh, channel that allows you to be able to manage your M-Pesa and Safaricom account. Essentially, it helps you, it, essentially it helps you, um, It helps you manage. It helps you manage and provide an efficient way for you to interact, for you to access uh, Safaricom app products and services that are offered within Safaricom all under one roof. Um, so our journey has been long and fulfilling, but fulfilling. We started our journey back in 2019. This is when we had the old application, um, so it was done externally by a vendor and was done externally by a vendor and we had limited control over the code and the application to be able to launch like the new products and services. Therefore, we came up with an in-house solution where we were able to build an in-house product, which is the current application that you see currently online. Uh, so also back then, we, were also, we also had on-premise services or these are the in-house services um, that we later migrated to cloud that we were able to improve our application. We were able to improve the application architecture, the application response code, as well as, uh, as, well as the performance of the application. So uh, we use Android Studio for Android Studio Kotlin and uh, Android Jetpack components for Android development. For iOS, we use uh, Xcode and Swift and Rx Swift. For reporting and monitoring, we've integrated uh, Firebase and Dynatrace. So we'll get our analytics, our crash, crash rates, our API performance from Dynatrace and uh, Firebase. I think I can go to the next one. So our app rating currently is at 4.6 for Play Store and 4.8 for App Store, as George had mentioned today morning. So let me jump in into the demo of a few features. Let me open that. So as you see, I'll start with a feature called widgets. These are short views that you can have on your home screen. So if you have a, my Safari Com app for Android, you can actually add a widget. So let me do that. So you long press your home screen, go to widgets, search for my Safari Com app. I see we have a couple of widgets. I'll just pick one. I'll pick one for data balances. So if I pick that and add it to my home screen, as you see, it shows me my balances, my data balance there, so I don't have to keep on dialing star 544. I can view my balance there. I can also trigger a manual update by pressing that refresh icon there. It does a manual update. Also, the widget can update itself every one hour. So after one hour, that timestamp should be updated. Let me jump to the next feature that I wanted to demo. It's called uh, Pomoja Tungane. It allows you to donate your Bonga points for drought relief. You can also donate cash using that feature. Let me just navigate to it. It's under Bonga Rewards on the home screen. So pressing on it, it's called Pomoja to Ungane. As you see from the screen there, we have, you can donate any amount. You can feed a child, you can feed a family, you can feed a community, or you can even donate cash, or you can check the Kenyan's contribution. So what I'll do, I'll donate at least 100 bonga points towards this. So I'll press on donate. Ask me for my confirmation. Ah, it's hidden. That's a pin view, so that's why that view is hidden. It's asking me for my pin. Let me just enter it quickly. Yeah, as you see, it's uh, successfully donated that 100 bonga points. We even received uh, an SMS. I think the next feature that I would like to show it's under the Discover option there. So if you have Safari Com app, you can go to Discover. We added a way to read newspapers using the app. You don't have to go to Safari Com web if you have the app. So just go to newspapers. It shows you the publications that you've bought. So today I actually bought uh, Daily Nation and People Daily. But if you wanted to purchase, you just go to the next tab. 
you'll view the publications that are available. So let's say I wanted to purchase uh, standard. So we have standard there, so I'll click on buy. Let me just click and show it. So it asks me whether I want to uh, purchase a one-off or a auto renew weekly or monthly, so I'll just click on continue. Let me just click on buy. I see it has been purchased successfully, then I can click on read. There. So if I was to actually start reading this newspaper, just zoom on it a bit. If you maybe go to the next page, able to read it. Can go to the last page if I need to, or to back to the first page. So with that, those are the features that I wanted to demo. So I think we are done and open to questions. Key things, um, maybe one of the lingering questions is why, you know, why the Mpesa app? I mean, why, why the Safaricom app and then why the Mpesa app? Mm. And then maybe another interesting one is in one case, mm. you're working with a vendor and you brought it in-house. In another case, you went to a vendor and that has, has, has seem, seemingly been successful. Maybe a, maybe a quick answer for that before we release you guys. Okay, for the Safaricom app is where we have, we, we have, we allow you to manage products for Safaricom. So like you can manage your balances, you can even manage your subscription. So like you subscribe maybe to daily SMSs, you can use Safaricom app to manage that. So you can unsubscribe or resubscribe to another feature. For the vendor, we didn't have much control over the code. So we saw that it's better we do it in-house so that we'll have more control and we are able to launch products at a faster rate. Fantastic. Yeah. Th thank you, th thank you uh, Brian and team. Mm. A round of applause for them as they leave the stage. Mm. And as we, as we prepare for our last uh, presentation uh, before we break for lunch, I think one of the things that comes to mind is the constant conversation on buy versus, buy versus build. You know, when does it make sense to, to hunker down and and build, and when does it make sense to say, you know what, um, there's a market opportunity, we need to go after it uh, fairly quickly, so let, you know, let us buy. For our last presentation, in terms of uh, looking at what the engineering teams at Safaricom do on a day-to-day -day basis for various products, we'll be looking at um, an IoT cold chain solution and smart metering from the enterprise and IoT tribe. Karibu. from uh, Safaricom. Mike. Am I audible? Mike. Hello, can you hear me? No. Hmm? Support on the mic, please. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yeah, so I'm Martin from Safaricom. I'm the technical lead for Enterprise IoT. I'll be taking you through what we do at Safaricom for IoT, joined my by my colleagues who can introduce themselves. Hi, everyone. I'm Scholastika Memusi. I'm from the Enterprise IoT squad. So as I mentioned, we'll be taking you through two of our solutions, one being cold chain, and the other one being the telematics. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Wickley. Yeah, so IoT is the buzzword for technology, and it has been there for quite a number of years. From the, when the first processor was manufactured in the early 1970s, we had industrial IoT, which was commonly referred as to machine-to-machine -machine communication, and we are evolving towards the Internet of Everything, whereby all devices will be part of the Internet world. So for the IoT ecosystem, we have four main aspects. 
the devices, the network, the platform, and uh, the users or the beneficiaries of that ecosystem. So I'm going to touch on each of the key items for each of the ecosystem. So for devices, they are critical because this is where you get the telemetry data for IoT. The data could be a temperature, a data point, it could be a location, it could be humidity, it could be a car speed. So when you get that data, you need to pre-process it before you can send it to a remote uh, device for further uh, processing. A key thing around IoT is edge computing. Technology is actually shifting from the cloud towards the edge because you have to build a lot of capability around the edge and be able to make uh, localized decisions. For example, if you are doing a fleet tracking and you've set the speed limit to be 80 kilometers per hour, you don't need that information to go to the cloud when you detect an overspeed to be able to control the gadget. You need to execute uh, that command uh, locally uh, because you might have cases whereby the cloud is not reachable. So edge computing is very critical for IoT. The other important aspect as you build your IoT devices is to look at how easy is it going to be to deploy and support those devices. We have seen that it typically takes about 30 minutes to be able to install these gadgets, for example, in a, in a car or in a fridge. And if you are to scale, if you are, let's say, to fulfill an order of 10,000 devices, then you will take a very long time and you'll need very many people, and that uh, exercise is going to be laborious. So it is better to embed best practice early in the prototype as you build for IoT devices. So what I'm talking about here is like including things like embedded SIM cards, such that at the uh, OEM when they are being manufactured, the device comes already packaged uh, with all the components so that during installation, it's just a matter of testing and deployment, and you can able to reduce the cycle from about 30 minutes to less than five minutes. So at Safaricom, what we are doing is that we have an IoT lab that uh, we are building and growing so that we are able to uh, develop some prototypes uh, based on our standards and learnings that we've already gotten. In the device uh, ecosystem, uh, the role of partners is very key because we will have uh, some simple devices, complex devices, smart devices, some that are used for particular use cases like uh, smart metering, and different uh, vendors have uh, key roles to play in that ecosystem. It is important to note that uh, without a correct device strategy, then whatever you do on top, whether it's on the network or platform, then you will not be able to get uh, value. The other aspect on IoT is that uh, there's a misconception that it's only done, uh, let's say, on a narrowband IoT, but however, you can do it on either network. You can do it on a wired network like fiber. You can do it over the satellite where you don't have any network. And of late, uh, because of the requirements of devices, for example, when it comes to tracking wildlife, you'll find that an animal uh, like a lion uh, that you need to track over a period that battery needs to last for, let's say, five years because it will not be going to be effective to be tracking the animal every two weeks to change the battery. So due to that challenge, new technologies have evolved. One of them is uh, narrowband technologies that offer benefits in terms of power, whereby the device is actually able to last for up to 10 years and also offers benefit in terms of uh, covering areas that uh, are not uh, easily ac accessible. The other aspect of IoT is in terms of um, 5G, uh, because 5G is actually a technology that is ahead of its commercial viability, especially in our, in our African context. Use cases that require near zero latency, for example, smart cars, uh, any delay uh, will be very catastrophic. Virtual gaming, whereby you are playing with somebody online, you don't need to you know, like be waiting for the experience and things like telemedicine where you're operating somebody remotely. So those technologies are the ones that are going to push 5G. So we are doing them uh, because we are the leaders in terms of technology. Important is around the platform. We've had many talks about this before. Uh, the choice to either build or reuse is an important discussion. But for IoT, key things is that um, there's a lot of data being generated by IoT devices. Processing that is a challenge, therefore you need to relevalize on the latest technologies, open source technologies, and things like time series databases uh, in addition to traditional databases. Uh, the, the way you program your devices will affect 
how your platform behaves. For example, if a smart water meter is sending data once a day, and somebody decides to program it to send it at 4 a.m., and you have 100,000 in the field, that is going to cause a spike uh, all the way throughout the network into the platform, and your platform may not be able to handle that kind of uh, traffic. So in such instances, it's recommended that you are able to uh, look at the production phase as you de design even the devices to have a random kind of behavior and make sure that your platforms are optimal in terms of ut utilization. However, in extreme cases where you may not be able to plan for everything, then you need to leverage on cloud whereby you can have things like auto scaling in terms of um, the resources that are needed to deliver that fulfillment. The other aspect which is uh, important for IoT is the role of data scientists is going to be very key. Uh, it's a new, uh, I'd say, um, a profession that is going to derive a lot of value in terms of machine learning and AI. For example, using the data from two use cases, like uh, in the smart utility use case, if you have a smart water customer and a smart power customer, you'll find that their behavior will most likely correlate. A high user on smart energy, let's say if your bills are high on smart energy, there's a tendency that your bills on water are also high and therefore you could actually uh, be able to offer such a customer a unique kind of services. Ultimately, there are thousands of platforms. Some are uh, standalone that address a particular use case. Some are horizontal that address multiple use cases. So the capability to be able to ingest data into these other platforms in and out is very important and build enrichment. For example, from some devices that don't have location services, they don't have GPS because the objective is to push the cost of the hardware down. We can enrich it with, uh, let's say, cell-based uh, location and offer it as an API. Then things like payment. We can also build a lot of value add on the data that we generate on the IoT platform. So in terms of uh, the insights and uh, value-based outcome, I uh, will do this through a presentation of the use cases. So I'll start with the cold chain use case. Um, I'll start with the telematics um, use case. As you can see, we're monitoring vehicles as they move. This is the, the beauty about this platform is it can accommodate thousands and thousands of devices. And um, please don't be worried. A very good example is the rally car which we did. We were able to track it as it moved and we were able to see its movement as it progressed. So I'll give the sample where the green indicates that the car is either on movement or in idle. So for example, the KCE, we should be able to see, should be able to see a live location of where it actually is. We can actually see the current speed as it moves. So for anybody who's interested in keeping track of violations, such as over speeding, harsh acceleration, harsh braking, the platform is fully capable of handling that. And then the items indicated in amber, that means the vehicle is currently idling. And the ones in gray means they're currently parked or offline. So aside from the real-time visibility on the platform, we can also easily zoom in and see the asset information, where you'd be able to keep track of the speed, the battery level. This means you can also diagnose your vehicle as it's on the move and be able to keep, get detailed information with regards to your asset. Again, as I've mentioned, we're not sticking to one asset. We can monitor thousands and thousands as you wish. Then for those who insist on keeping their vehicles within a particular geo zone, there's a keep in zone, there's a no go zone. So it's as simple as my vehicle should never leave Nairobi Metropolitan. Nairobi Metropolitan is huge. Your service area could be as huge as Nairobi Metropolitan, but you're insisting on ensuring your vehicle does not leave the area as designated. So a keep in zone can look anything like this. Keep it within however many kilometers you wish to do. A no-go zone means the minute your vehicle goes into that zone, it's out of bound. It should give you an alert, whether it's your phone via SMS, whether it's on your platform, whether it's an email alert. It's actually very easy for you to know when a violation is occurring. The beauty about this platform as well is it can give detailed user reports for all your assets as you wish. You'll be able to see who is violating, when they violated, and where the violation took place. Thanks. Um, okay, 
so the next solution that we're looking at is um, what we're calling uh, the cold, cold chain monitoring solution. So what is cold chain? Uh, there's a sector, for example, pharmaceuticals or uh, fish industry, where the product should be either consumed, stored, or distributed at certain environmental uh, constraints. So what we call temperature control logistics. So what we do is that we leverage data using the four layers of IoT to help companies in such sectors to be more efficient in how they uh, distribute their products. So for this solution, we use uh, majorly uh, temperatures as sensor uh, to monitor temperature, monitor humidity, then we put it in an asset, for example, if it is for uh, beverage uh, distribution, a cooler, we monitor also the power and also the dose status so that we can infer whether that asset is being operated uh, in the right condition or not. So leveraging those uh, four data points, that is temperature, door, uh, power, status, and location, then we can tell uh, where the asset is, we can tell how busy the asset is, uh, leveraging the solution that we have. For example, um, we can check on the dashboards um, to be able to tell you um, currently how many assets are connected, uh, how many are alarming. You can see temperature alarms, door alarms, power switch alarms. Then we can infer using the uh, door sensors, we can infer how busy an outlet is. For example, an, a, 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 a beverage a cabinet is opened either to sell a product or refill a product. So by counting the number of times the door is opening, we can tell whether there is any sales activity on the, on the, on the asset or how many times the, uh, uh, the door is opened so that we can find how busy that site is. Leveraging those insights, then we can help our, our partners in such industry to decide, should they deploy more coolers in an outlet, for example, in Sarit, or move them to another site where maybe it's more busier than and a site where there is, there is never powered or the door is never opened. Then using uh, temperature and door status, we can also infer quality of the product. For example, um, uh, when the vaccines came in, they were supposed to be stored at, let's say, negative 10 degrees to 10 degrees uh, as the optimal temperature. So what we, the solution does is that we monitor at the time you're opening the door, what was the temperature of the cabin so that we can mark a cell as good quality or low quality. So on, this, on the solution, on the dashboards, we determine that 63% um, uh, of the times the product was sold at the right temperature, meaning when the door was opened, it was a right uh, temperature constraint. But you're looking at the uh, red ones, that's where by the, the user sold the product when the temperature was off the mark. So this is critical to determine uh, the quality of the product you're offering to your customers. Then, uh, basically, the assets have been acquired for a need. For example, you acquire the cabinets to sell beer in a certain outlet, but they can be moved either uh, authoritatively or uh, without uh, uh, um, someone notifying you. So with the solution, we leverage uh, the location data to determine uh, where your assets are at. So for example, we can paint a picture of such like asset. Anytime the asset moves, the owner gets an alert, then the call to action is whether you determine is it being stolen or it's been moved uh, legally. Then also we can also leverage um, the data about the power and temperature to determine how efficient a cooling unit is. So we can quickly go to one of the assets, for example, this one. Uh, you can check uh, currently the sensors. The door is closed. Uh, the temperature is uh, off the mark because it's red and it's not moving. So you have to determine what is the cause of the temperature excursion? So you can go to the asset to view more details about the asset. So you can check on the door status, power switch, movement, and temperature. Then you want to check how, how temperature has been uh, fluctuating over time. So you pick the sensors. Then you compare against uh, the power switch. Then you get the graphs. So what you want to achieve is do you want to see if the asset um, um, is temperature is, is going uh, above the threshold. Uh, was it powered, meaning was the compressor working or there's an issue with your compressor? So you can determine, you can use this to monitor the efficiency of, uh, of the compressor unit of any facility. For example, it is a cooling unit in a house or a compressor in a, in a fridge or stuff like that. So that is what we use to monitor uh, the, the such parameters for, um, for the cold chain assets. So like I mentioned, we have devices kitted 
into the various uh, cold chain assets. It could be a cabinet for, for beverage, it could be a data center, it could be a cold storage room, or any facility where you want to store your temperature control products. So as it loads, uh, let's give it a moment for it to load. Okay. okay, give it to Martin, back, back to you. It's loading. Okay, so such like information. So like I mentioned, our interest is on the temperature uh, parameters. So on the graphs, you can see these are the uh, temperature fluctuations. And the lower bar, it's on the power status, meaning the compressor that you is cooling the facility. So you can monitor that. Uh, when the compressor was off, the temperature was uh, going up. At the moment it was powered on, it started cooling the facility, and the temperature went to the required optimums. So you can use this to infer why is the temperature going up? It's because the asset is not powered on. And also you can measure the efficiency of the, compress of the cooling unit. For example, the moment the compressor is powered on, it should bring down the temperature within four minutes, uh, five minutes. So if you see it's taking too long to uh, uh, cool the facility, then you can determine to whether replace the compressor unit uh, or, or, or repair it. So those are the insights that you can get from the solution to be able to uh, manage how you repair your assets. Yeah, uh, th I think that's all for the cold chain facility uh, solution. Yeah, so that marks uh, the end of our presentation. We have many use cases, uh, different uh, se sectors, and we have a booth where we can have uh, more engagements. Thank you. Asante Nisana IoT team. I don't know if you're like me, who every time you see such presentations, you start thinking of what else could you use this technology for. Kamelia Fungua Fridge, and you talked about COVID. You know the one signal, if that cabinet is being opened at 2 a.m., send an SMS to all media houses. That batch ABCD in a, in a, in a end. You know, such peculiar use cases. The other one, now that this IoT hackathon is, is, is still on, one of the other biggest problems we have in this country is the, the movement of livestock illegally. And you know what, what my craziest idea at one point was? To Mongia Mambo Aksamati looking at battery life. And I figured, you know, this is a cow. What if you could get an IoT device that you put down as a bolus that goes into the abdomen of a cow? What's in the stomach? What's in the stomach, people? What's it, what, what's it? You're about to take food there. So what is there going to sort out your food? There's acid. When you look at acid and you have two, two certain metals, you can actually create a current. So if you had a bolus that, is, that you can swallow and it stays in one of the four stomachs, why can that thing just be transmitting? Now, Naju and Ngombe, they move in a very speci specific way. They have a head cow. If you've always noticed, there's a, the Kangombe that just walks at the front and all the others follow. If you're ever to go and raid cattle, that is the ngombe that you take. Why? Because all the others will do what? Will follow. But man, you know, in, in another world, in a different time, and I know we can't innovate on a full stomach, on an empty stomach, so I'd like to invite us all for lunch. We only have 30 minutes so we can get back to the program. So thank you for being such an amazing audience staying in here and listening to all the amazing presentations. So let's break for lunch. See you here in 30 minutes. And if you finish quickly, kindly visit the booths and give this guy some of your attention, Asanteni. See you in 30 minutes.
has always been about turning a profit. If you stop to think about it, what more is there? The universe. Nature. Life. Civilization as we know it is about the search for something greater than ourselves. Huawei Cloud is innovating technologies to make the world more inclusive. The cloud, AI, 5G are building a fully connected, intelligent world. They do more than drive digital transformation. It's a new paradigm for innovation. Imagine, if you can, what amazing secrets await when we unlock the secrets of the universe. What cosmic answers will we learn? AI can help preserve in the rainforest by identifying the sounds of gunshots or the sounds of illegal logging, protecting the most precious sounds, birds and trees for generations to come. In cities around the world, we can collect traffic data and analyze it to improve transportation and bring order to a chaotic world. Even reporting the weather can be improved with AI. With more accurate forecasts and timely alerts, we'll travel safer and get home to our loved ones. Also, so many delicious flavors, chili, herbs, and spices automatically selected to improve flavor, quality, and nutrition. Delightful flavor explosions to dazzle our taste buds. A cloud for everyone. Unleashing the power of innovation, making every day better. A cloud for pervasive intelligence and a better future. Huawei Cloud. Grow with intelligence. Efficiency, cost, productivity, business as usual has always been about turning a profit. If you stop to think about it, what more is there? The universe, nature, life, civilization as we know it is about the search for something greater than ourselves. Huawei Cloud is innovating technologies to make the world more inclusive. The Cloud, AI, 5G are building a fully connected, intelligent world. They do more than drive digital transformation. It's a new paradigm for innovation. Imagine, if you can, what amazing secrets await when we unlock the secrets of the universe. What cosmic answers will we learn? AI can help preserve in the rainforest by identifying the sounds of gunshots or the sounds of illegal logging, protecting the most precious sounds, birds and trees for generations to come. In cities around the world, we can collect traffic data and analyze it to improve transportation and bring order to a chaotic world. Even reporting the weather can be improved with AI. With more accurate forecasts and timely alerts, we'll travel safer and get home to our loved ones. Also, so many delicious flavors, chili, herbs, and spices automatically selected to improve flavor, quality, and nutrition. Delightful flavor explosions to dazzle our taste buds.
A cloud for everyone. Unleashing the power of innovation. Making every day better. A cloud for pervasive intelligence and a better future. Huawei Cloud. Grow with intelligence. I am Mark Koyer. I head uh, IT infrastructure and cloud services at Safaricom uh, PLC. Uh, that's the department that looks after our uh, digital IT uh, hardware services as well as cloud solutions. My name is Dennis Kipruto. Uh, I lead the infrastructure planning team uh, within Safaricom. Uh, here we look after uh, cloud computing uh, and also looking at new infrastructure, new solutions that we can roll out uh, to help the DevOps team and also to help the entire Safaricom team. Our primary focus is uh, not just to create awareness on cloud solutions, but to make sure that uh, engineers can take advantage of cloud platforms, uh, both public cloud and the cloud solutions that are offered within uh, Nairobi. And we're trying to expand this to offer capability for developers within Nairobi and even outside Nairobi to be able to set up their solutions uh, seamlessly. Uh, but uh, we also want to create a way of interaction where engineers uh, can contribute uh, to, to development of cloud platforms. My vision for the community is just to ensure that, number one, uh, we bring in uh, like-minded people, people who have a passion for cloud computing. Basically, just to meet, interact, uh, knowledge share, industry share, and basically just ensure that uh, everybody, uh, I believe, is comfortable and able to grow their skills, grow their passion. And ultimately, for me, what I'm looking at is, are we able to now start uh, contributing to the entire cloud computing within the world? Belonging uh, is key. And the fact that um, the Safaricom engineering community is Kenyan, and it's for Kenyans, uh, there's a sense of belonging. And um, sharing is key to that process. And uh, when we start interacting on the platform and start seeing familiar uh, you know, solutions being developed with a lot of language that is common uh, to the Kenyan community, then the community becomes stronger. So for me, I feel uh, if it's Kenyan, for Kenyans, and even for people outside Kenya, uh, the community will grow uh, to be as strong as we would want it to be. As part of uh, digital delivery, our main work is to make DIT the best place to work. To do this, we are actually now in the process of having the first ever Safaricom Engineering Summit. We have noted that we have a lot of uh, shortages of tech skills. We don't have enough UI designers, solution architects, data engineers, and uh, through the Engineering Summit and the Engineering Community, we want to actually partner with academia, uh, tech enthusiasts and the larger uh, technology ecosystem in Kenya just to make sure that we have the right talent. Safaricom Decode, which is going to be our annual engineering summit, is going to be one of the biggest events that we've had here at Safaricom and one that we hope to invite the entire community and tech ecosystem in Kenya to attend. Uh, we will have amazing workshops, demonstrations of Safaricom, uh, Safaricom's biggest and newest technology, uh, and uh, Safaricom's you know, innovations, uh, culture, and what you're doing to contribute to the tech ecosystem as a whole. For us, Safaricom Decode is a symbol of our growth, our internal growth, our engagement to the community is going to be focused on students, it's going to be focused on the, on the next uh, tech makers, the trendsetters of this country. We have people within Safaricom who started coding while they were in high school and they are currently working as UI designers and IoT engineers. So uh, if we can tap into the high school uh, talent, uh, social change makers, that would really be awesome. We welcome everybody to Safaricom Engineering Summit, Safaricom Decode, happening on the 14th and 15th of July at Service Center. 
It is both a virtual and a physical event. The virtual event will be on our Safaricom YouTube channel. Uh, we will have uh, uh, walkthroughs on uh, Safaricom innovations. Uh, we will have walkthroughs and demos on engineering practices, engineering frameworks, engineering culture within Safaricom. We're also going to have uh, four coding challenges, great prizes to be won in cash actually. And then uh, we are going to be having master classes and the different developer communities will actually be having their own sessions uh, during the first day. So this is where they will be having panel discussions on emerging trends and what uh, students and the larger tech team need to be focusing on. Between uh, now and the next event in July next year, we'll be having uh, the code labs in the different engineering chapters. We will also be organizing career fairs. The different chapters will be organizing engagements with industry leaders uh, to ensure that there is continuous engagement between the experts and the students. So it's an opportunity for all of us to just plug in and learn. I am Jill and I am Safaricom Engineering Community. My name is Jude Juma and I am Safaricom Engineering Community. I am Ian and I am Safaricom Engineering Community. My name is Naisenya Mungai and I am Safaricom Engineering Community. Safaricom Engineering Community uh, to me means a platform where a group of engineers come together to share ideas, build solutions together and have fun. Uh, my vision for the community is to make it the best place to be, where we can be able to build value-based IoT solutions uh, that can be able to transform lives. I hope to see the guys who have never built electronics before, to be able to get over the first few bumps of playing with electronics, of writing uh, some code into, into these bare metals. My primary focus for the IoT community would be to create a community that will be laughed across the country and indeed across the globe. Number two would be that we can be able to push for adoption of IoT applications for commercial uh, use cases and in there be able to create efficiencies that uh, can be applied through IoT technology. We're going to ensure that we have a range of sessions and we're going to have a discussion with people on how they could get started with building these devices and then go into uh, having more events focused on intermediate sessions and then expert sessions and also in between we're going to have some kind of hackathons where people can be able to use these skills to be in a real environment where they're able to grow by building products. The other bit will be uh, to create and of course contribute to the IoT industry um, by benchmarking with others across the globe, uh, contribute to the standards and then way into the big area around big data and machine learning that can then be able to help us uh, drive use cases or build value or get value out of the data that we mine through IoT. Um, the other bit will be also to um, make good use of technologies like narrowband IoT where we can be able to create solutions um, specifically using NB-IoT and therefore um, create solutions that can be able to you know, work longer for longer durations using um, uh, you know, low energy and uh, having longer battery, battery lifetime. A strong community is a community where um, it attracts all sorts of talent, not only engineering but also people who have interest in technology. A strong community is a community that uh, fosters collaboration, uh, where we can be able to, you know, create virtual sessions, events together, you know, uh, uh, hack together for solutions, being able to pick up uh, scenarios, investigate and find solutions together, develop and co-create uh, applications that can be used uh, not only for commercial reasons, but to better the life um, of everyone. We should expect events across the year, um, some in-person events where the organizers have very close engagement with attendees, uh, things like code labs. And then we're also going to have some events where we will talk about our products or generally the general products in the market. And then also big events which probably focus on networking and talking to people and, and things like that. My name is Ngesa Marvin and I am Safaricom Engineering Community. I am. Safaricom Engineering Community.
it take to make digital transformation actually happen? Do you just flip a switch and presto, your business is magically transformed? Not quite. It takes a groundbreaking company like Dell Technologies, a family of seven technology leaders working behind the scenes to make the impossible reality. For instance, we're helping to give cars the power to read your mind from anywhere. We're helping up to 40% of the nation's donated blood supply to be redirected to the areas and people that need it most. And we're even developing technology to create a whole new vision for the blind. So while you might not see what we're doing, what we're doing is changing the way we all see the world. Magic can't make digital transformation happen, but we can. Let's make it real. it take to make digital transformation actually happen? Do you just flip a switch and presto, your business is magically transformed? Not quite. It takes a groundbreaking company like Dell Technologies, a family of seven technology leaders working behind the scenes to make the impossible reality. For instance, we're helping to give cars the power to read your mind from anywhere. We're helping up to 40% of the nation's donated blood supply to be redirected to the areas and people that need it most. And we're even developing technology to create a whole new vision for the blind. So while you might not see what we're doing, what we're doing is changing the way we all see the world. Magic can't make digital transformation happen, but we can. Let's make it real. end of the first Ant-Man, I shrink down so small that I hit a quantum scale. Daddy, help! Oh, no. Yes. And it's the first time Hank has ever been exposed to somebody who could go down there and come back. And that begins to set in his mind the idea that maybe he can go get Hope's mother back. In Ant-Man and the Wasp, we're going to explore the quantum realm. We start to play with the whole notion of scale. It's not just about being tiny. It's not just about being giant. It's about all of those scales in between. Scaling things up in this movie has been a real treat. This is the control room of Hank Pym's laboratory. And we're making a film that revolves around technology and science and engineering and quantum physics. We need some of the most cutting edge technology to help us tell our story. Ant Man and the Wasp rely on high performing technology to be able to save the world, to be able to fight crime. Their superpowers are technology. That's what Dell is about. So we thought that this was a really good fit for both sides. Ant Man and the Wasp teaming up. We'll see Ant-Man size action and giant size action, and you may see a lot of different size action in between. <laughs> Having amazing visuals allows them to immerse themselves in the world. Maybe you just need someone watching your back, like a partner. Will they be able to work as a team together? Will she be able to find her lost mother? Set against the backdrop, of quantum realms and shrinking and growing. That's the fun of making an Ant-Man movie. I don't want to die. We didn't die. I dare you to blink, because things don't stop moving. Uh, what I miss? We were just tiny.
two years for us is moving to infrastructure as code in order to better support a hybrid cloud operating model. Our ability to take services and run applications as easily on-premise as we would in a cloud environment, that's how IT can streamline itself as a function, that's how IT can focus on delivering value into the rest of the business. Working with Dell Technologies actually gives us a partner to run that with. Having good shared insight of our own McLaren roadmap and the Dell Technologies roadmap helps us keep aligned as to where we're going to go next and where do we see risk in where we're going next, where we may be pushing too fast, but also where we're not pushing fast enough. fast Formula One car, but McLaren saw a way to rapidly transform the healthcare industry. By taking the same predictive analytics powered by Dell Technologies to diagnose their race cars, and applying it to the human body, McLaren can help healthcare professionals provide more personalized solutions, which could in turn support even speedier recoveries. I really deeply believe that you need to give more than what you receive and that the best reward is the goodness that you will bring into this world. And one of the most innovative programs that I've seen is this solar powered classroom. It's a concept to bridge the educational divide in areas where uh, you are suffering not only from poverty but also from lack of access to uh, energy. The solar learning labs are very important to Dell Technologies because it really embodies all aspects of how we drive social impact. It's fully sustainable. It reuses shipping containers that otherwise would have been discarded, and so it really exemplifies our circular economy. It clearly applies technology to drive transformation in youth and help benefit their education. And all of that together really helps develop this culture of inclusivity that is so important for us to address some of the most complex social issues that we have. When you provide technology access, it's just been incredibly transformative regardless of program, regardless of culture. Hemos diseñado un espacio que va a ser para el aprendizaje de jóvenes en habilidades del siglo XXI. It has helped me because I've been doing task math and it has been improving my grades from 60 to 98. We want to open up the opportunity for others to partner with us, and so we're now enabling the crowdfunded approach so that we can scale the impact. Don't underestimate your capacity to transform the world. I really deeply believe that you need to give more than what you receive, and that the best reward is the goodness that you will bring into this world. And one of the most innovative programs that I've seen is this solar powered classroom. It's a concept to bridge the educational divide in areas where uh, you are suffering not only from poverty, but also from lack of access to uh, energy. The solar learning labs are very important to Dell Technologies because it really embodies all aspects of how we drive social impact. It's fully sustainable. It reuses shipping containers that otherwise would have been discarded, and so it really exemplifies our circular economy. It clearly applies technology to drive transformation in youth and help benefit their education. And all of that together really helps develop this culture of inclusivity that is so important for us to address some of the most complex social issues that we have. When you provide technology access, it's just been incredibly transformative regardless of program, regardless of culture. Hemos diseñado un espacio que va a ser para el aprendizaje de jóvenes en habilidades del siglo XXI. It has helped me because I've been doing task math and it has been improving my grades from 60 to 98. 
we want to open up the opportunity for others to partner with us. And so we're now enabling the crowdfunded approach so that we can scale the impact. Don't underestimate your capacity to transform the world. You know, there's a feeling that uh, engineers are coders. They just code, and that is it. But the reality is that uh, engineering, um, also engineering basically involves being able to create products that change life. So Safaricom Engineering, actually a uh, community, entails being able to create products that are able to change the world in terms of how we operate. So the vision, uh, mostly when it comes to product management, is to be able to create products that are able to change life. Yeah, I think community participation uh, is, is more geared up to the com comfortability that people have within the, the community. So my intention to that is to ensure that the communication line uh, is simple and of course um, ensure that we remove bureaucracy to ensure that uh, decisions are not only made by the leads but also the community itself. The goal will be to bring on board engineers who are able to understand products that they're able to put in place. So you move, you move away from being able to do a code work to a point of whereby you look at the value that you create with your products across board. The chapters will impact the technology community uh, specifically uh, on innovation. We will ensure that we have uh, products that are aligned to the community's vision in terms of technology and uh, a vision uh, with Safaricom, uh, in which we, en we ensure that we have a sustainable environment and also impact uh, lives outside uh, uh, for the community to have a sense of uh, pride to within themselves. So number one will be to create an enabling environment for engineers to be able to um, interact easily, engage easily, share information, to be able to feel that the voice are heard. So the, the impact to the world uh, from our community and especially the products area is to ensure these products uh, that the community is providing uh, to the world is uh, uh, products that are more sustainable, future-proof, and they are products that they can actually uh, be replicated outside the community and outside Safaricom uh, to ensure that uh, more and more lives are impacted uh, within our areas. What I believe makes a strong uh, community is a team that works together, that collaborates. Being able to pull different brains and different ideas across board um, will be able to change the world. A strong community is a community that has, have passion to what they are doing. Uh, and, and this passion should give them a, pride, a sense of pride uh, that uh, uh, they belong to a community that is listening to them and also providing opportunities within uh, their area. I'm Safaricom Engineering Community. I am Safaricom Engineering Community. Welcome back, welcome back to the summit. I hope you feel re-energized and are ready for the afternoon session. Thank you so much for sticking with us. For this um, panel, just before we go back in and see what's next, what demos, what presentations we're going to have, I have Samuel, who is, the C who is the CTO of Meliora Technologies. And you guys spoke so well of him. You loved his presentation earlier in the morning. I've got so many questions about Samuel Kamochu's work and about his interests. And he's telling me some very interesting thing about some very interesting things about Africans and tech, specifically to how we view ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the West. So I can't wait to get into all of that. But like I said, I saw all your questions for him earlier. I saw all the praises, but scrolling through your comments is a lot, okay? You guys have been so interactive and I love you for it, but scrolling through is a lot. So if there's something you'd want to ask him right now, I'm giving you a chance. Please go to the comments so I can find them a bit easier. Shoot your questions towards him. Let me know um, all the compliments that you've given earlier as well. Repeat it. It's okay. Show love. Show love. But before we get into all of that and as I give you time to respond I will um, ask Samuel first of all to play a game of would you rather with me yes so it's going to be a tech edition um, I've been playing this with people the whole day and I've been loving their answers would you rather tech edition so the first one I'd given you a bit of a clue would you rather confess to your boss after a crash that there are no backups or make daily backups on a USB um. I think when, when you're operating in tech, one of the things that uh, you need to adopt as an engineer is to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> so definitely 
taking a backup is a good thing, but when you're in a situation when things are thick, the first thing is to inform the stakeholders. Yeah. If it's your boss, notify them. They scream. They do whatever that they have to do. But that should be the first step. Yeah. And then calm down. Then after that, try to, to figure out what to do after what that. to do next yes, yes. so you would rather just explain that you know what yeah, yeah, yeah. i didn't back it up and it's crashed yes yes okay i've been in situations where someone lost like a terabyte of footage without backup and people wanted to lose their minds so i'm thinking i would rather every day back my things up on the usb but that's just me from a tech point of view of course from an engineering point of view honesty comes first yeah yes, yes. okay would you rather run a game on windows 98 forever or run your data center on macOS, macOS, sorry. <laughs> um, you said... Uh, uh, game on Windows yeah. 98, yes. Windows 98 forever. Mm -hmm. Or run your data center on macOS. That's a tricky one. Yeah. I think I'd, I'd rather try macOS. <laughs> well, what's wrong with gaming 98? I feel like it would have a nostalgic feel. <laughs> It depends. Yeah. <laughs> it depends on if you're a gamer or if you like yes, nostalgia. Yes, 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 yes. Fair enough. Um, would you rather be a meme or be a GIF? Like if the internet decided to troll you today, would they? Would you rather they turn you into a meme or they turn you into a GIF? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm meme. Why meme? <laughs> um, I, I sort of... <laughs> uh -huh. I sort of think that probably they would, they, would, they would come up with a good meme. A good meme, a funny meme. Yes. At least I feel like GIFs can be mean. At least a meme can be funny. Yes, and then yes. different people use it differently. Yes, yes. So it's subject. Okay, last one. Would you rather rewrite everything in JavaScript or have to do a format C on your work PC right now? Um, eh. That's I, a tricky question. Yeah, as they should I'll, be. I'll you have to there. sweat. Yeah. <laughs> I'd go with uh, the JavaScript option. Oh, that's very interesting. Why the JavaScript option? Uh, because I'm a developer. Okay. So, yeah. that's, I feel like that's a good enough and, and, reason, and, and but an also, easy one. as developers, we have this spirit of overhaul. Mm -hmm. So you'd rather, uh, if you find, I mean, rewriting is not a big deal. It's for not us. a big deal. Yes, we prefer rewriting uh, uh, code that has been there maybe it's not working and yeah okay it's an easier fix it's doable yes, yes. okay um so i've seen uh we all use what okay thanks for the team who organized this summit you have special seats in heaven oh that's very nice but i'm trying to see if there's any um questions for you um everybody every developer here someone man m says every developer prefers linux until it's time to install fonts and create office office documents that's where they draw the line um everybody here prefers linux is that true as well i'm also seeing someone else saying i prefer linux versatile powerful and secure many of the times it just depends on the circumstances yeah i also prefer linux mm -hmm. and the reason is is because most of the solutions that we create are deployed on linux although things are changing now with containerization and all that yeah but uh it's easier to work in an environment that is as close as possible to the production environment the yeah. commands are the same yeah yeah so for you it's much easier we were talking earlier just before um the cameras came on yeah. and you were saying you have some very interesting views on tech in africa specifically yes. because you don't have the luxury of you know being out there yeah. so you experience tech differently from people in the west what did you mean by that yeah i i, I think uh, uh this is a bit controversial but yeah. uh my take is as we look at the trends in the world we also have to consider the context of Africa. Mm -hmm. I would say, if, if, if you're, working, you're working in an organization that is processing 100 records per day, yeah. uh, then you trying to learn and adopt, you know, those big data, Hadoop, and all those concepts. They're nice and they're marketable, but for us, it's, it's, it's not practical. Mm -hmm. So I think we need first to deal with the basics. Uh, let's have our developers deal with all these automations and 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 uh, creating things that solve our problems, so yeah. that they don't have to sign a a physical book at the entrance. <laughs> and yet, uh, yeah, we are trying to come up with I don't know all these big uh, the big technologies and the trends and the big words that we are hearing. So for me, we have to go to the basics, and yeah. we also have to 
teach our guys to be engineers first. Okay. Before we can talk about all these buzzwords. Can people create solutions? That's interesting. Yeah. Um, because I was just about to ask you, it always feels like we're playing catch up. You know, we're forever playing catch up. Even not just with tech, just in general with life, you know. You wait for the West to do something. If they did an industrial revolution, we have to do that one. Yeah. And then now we can move on to a tech revolution. Things like that. Mm. So then how do we make sure that we're not stuck doing follow the leader, you know, yeah through all of time yeah my, my take is simple yeah. we have to make a deliberate decision to jump in and control the technology stacks that we use mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I was talking about it in the morning yeah. that uh, all of us who are developers we operate at a certain layer mm -hmm. that is higher that is being controlled by the by the rest whether you're using spring boot whether you're using uh, angular whether you're using react those are technology stacks that we build on top of, uh, and yet, uh, and we leave the West to, to do that. As long as they are taking care of the lower layers, mm -hmm. we will always be catching up with them because the creator will have us to create a tutorial for us to learn. Sure. And then we are going to, until the day we have our guys working on those lo lower layers, mm -hmm. the day we start hearing guys creating those web servers, creating those frameworks that are usable, that's the day now that will be catching up. Like, let me give an example. Okay. Uh, and I'll be a bit technical here. Okay. So we all use HTTP. If you access a web browser, there is something called HTTP, which mm -hmm. is a protocol. Mm -hmm. As the world has evolved, it was created by the father of internet, Tim Ban uh, the father of, not in, yes, internet, Tim Berners-Lee, in, back in the 89 and 90s. Mm -hmm. That thing was meant to serve the web pages. And you remember Google came just to crawl all the web pages so into that they can give us a search engine. Yeah, now, one. that protocol today is still being used to create, you know, these apps, mm -hmm. chat applications, instant notifications, and all that. It was not suited for those scenarios. Mm -hmm. But if you ask most of our developers what's the difference between HTTP 3, 2, 1, and 1.1, they have no idea. So, and until the day we decide to go back, as I said in the morning, to go and read and see what is happening yeah. and implement those things, then people will start following us. That's fair. Yeah. Because if, you're, if you always have to wait for someone to create, then come and learn from them, then try and now uh, innovate from there, you'll always be a step behind. Yeah, yeah. You'll, step you'll behind. always be a step behind. And that's, yeah. that's the loop that the, the situation we're we find, we, we, we are stuck in. Yeah. So in my view, we need to go back to the basics. Mm -hmm. Be like Elon Musk, understand what happens under the hood, mm -hmm. recreate it, check that you're using a technology that was created in 1990 and yet we are in 2022. Yeah. Change that small thing. Okay, yeah, we, maybe we just need to ask more questions because we, we come in and you find things and you follow the leader again and there's no room for actually questioning and learning to do the basics. Yeah. I think we could go on a whole tangent about Elon Musk, but I'll avoid it yes, yes, yes. <laughs> for now. Thank you. And I'll, <laughs> but I want to ask, um, you're the CTO and founder yeah. of Meliora, um, but let me ask, CTO versus CEO. So I've interviewed people, for example, someone who told me she's C C CEO, Chief Creative Officer of her company, mm -hmm. and she stepped down from CEO because she felt that she was not doing the work that she needed to do mm -hmm. on the creative end mm -hmm. while being a CEO. Is that why you went the CTO route, and do you think it's more impactful? Um, so the, the, the basic idea is we run a tech company. Yeah. So tech company requires technical people. So most of our operations are technical yeah. um, of course running a business has many sides it does so for me to be very productive I would rather focus on a few things mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean that uh, being in that role you don't deal with other things we'll still have to discuss strategies and uh, you know finance accounting mm -hmm. uh, all those things about you know I was actually just about to ask that because you know there's a uh, the purity of geniuses and artists and creators and, and techies and engineers. It's just like, you know, I want to do my work yeah. and that's it. Someone else takes care of the business end. Someone else takes care of the finance. And I just focus on what I'm good at and the art where I work is. I don't want to interact with people at a minimum, you know, things like that. Is that you? <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah. I, I think the, the context is slightly different. Uh -huh. you, are, you, you know what is happening, but you also let other people to execute a okay. certain part of the strategy the that you have and what is needed for you to run a business. Mm -hmm. So, yes, um, 
there are people who deal with those finance stuff, but it doesn't mean that I cannot in, uh, interpret a balance sheet. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You wouldn't be so I need to Excel. know, I need to understand cash flow yes. and all those things. Uh, who, where do we need to get the money to, to pay the bills and to take care of the operations? That's very true. So, so you have to do that, but mm -hmm. you can't do everything. I can't be the one following up with the, with the, with the, with the account receivables. Yeah. Uh, I'm also the one being... Um, called when we have account payables, um, you know, we have to interview people, HR matters, uh, business development. I'm not the most creative guy. I, I don't have to do those. You don't have to be copywriting for yourself. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> there are people who can do that. Yeah. So uh, John NM is asking, what um, does Sam think about Kenyan companies taking up open source? Uh, I, I, I think the... The adopting open source um, in Kenya is something that I would highly recommend. Mm -hmm. But the only thing that I would like to add is um, we also need to take a chance, just like you said earlier, mm -hmm. and get to understand what happens. E.g., you've decided to use, uh, here I know the, the tech guys, when they talk about event stream, streaming, there is something called Kafka. Mm -hmm. So we, yes, we need to adopt those tools because we don't have to recreate everything. Yeah. But at the same time, we also need to appreciate what happens so that we can master these things. Mm -hmm. uh, many people adopt open source tools and technologies, but when there is an issue, they move from one tool to the other. So I think, yes, we should. Uh -huh. But in addition to that, I challenge uh, my friends who are watching that it is also right for us to actually get to a level where we are actually contributors of these things. We'll, we'll have the maximum benefit yeah. by doing so. Agreed. As opposed to just problem fixing and switching? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Mm -hmm. um, I've also, you've also been asked, is it possible, um, sorry, would you advise upcoming engineers to use um, Amazon Web Services? That's interesting. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I know this is a controversial question, yeah. but uh, I think any of the cloud, Amazon Web Services, they have very interesting tools for developers. They get a lot of things that we don't need to, to do out of our way, mm -hmm. and thus improving efficiency. Uh, I have used Amazon Web Services. Um, We've, 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 we run some of the production services on their, on their, on their ecosystem. Yeah. Uh, but at the end of the day, as a startup, you also need to look at the costs. Uh, so for me, I think they work. They are reliable. Uh, but the only thing I would advise is someone to look at the cost and see whether if you're running a, a service that is not mission critical, mm -hmm. you could look for for cheaper uh, options, Option, yeah. or you could also design your platform to be able to run on, on, on different uh, uh, cloud providers. Yeah. yeah. Um, so someone, there was someone earlier who had talked about how stingy the engineering community in Kenya is. And I can't remember their name, but I saw their comment and they said, getting advice or knowledge about engineering in Kenya from seniors especially, um, is especially software engineering, is like squeezing blood from a stone. I don't yeah. know, have you found that to be true? What, what do you think about that? Because it, it seemed to them that this was an opportunity to hear from people who otherwise they would not be able to approach in any way and be like, I need your help on this, I need your ideas on your opinion. Yeah. I am yet to meet one of those people described by, by our friend. Um, Many people generally, they, they love sharing and they love mentoring. Mm -hmm. I was mentored by guys. I used to go to their desk uh, in Safaricom uh, in my early years of uh, engineering. I used to sit at a uh, desk of the senior engineers and I ask a question today. Um, tomorrow I come and ask the same question and they never gave up on me. Yeah. So, but the only side is, that the only thing that I would like to note is that there are two sides to this thing. Mm -hmm. Guys who are working in corporates, they are busy. So time is one of the limiting factors. It might not yeah. be guys are stingy, but mm -hmm. it could be that they are not available to help, help you. these yeah. young people. And there are also people who are not naturally gifted to share. They understand their geniuses, but they can't break those complex topics to the young guys. I mean, personality, not to, to, not, to, not to ignore even the personality. There are people who do not relate well with people. 
But what I would say is that um, I, I don't think that statement is very, very true. Very fair to and the I'm, engineering I'm community. judging this based on my network. Yeah. There are very friendly people who are willing to support. But the other thing that I would recommend for those guys who are busy, please take time to create content. We are in uh, you know, knowledge economy. Just do content yeah. uh, and share with these people. Participate in those webinars. You might not be available to train 10 different guys on the same thing, but you can actually ask a community to plan a session where you take them through. Mm. What you know. And I'm sure there's people who've been wanting to either speak to you or learn from you, yeah. but because you're here and they're online yes. or they're in the room, it's, it's all of a sudden a crowd sharing, I mean, a, um, a sharing space for them and to be yes. able to hear from you and learn from you. So I definitely agree with that. I will ask you just before I release you, mm. do you what five things do you think make a really good engineer? Software five or otherwise? Things. Yeah. Wow. Five things is a long list. It's a long list? Okay, yeah, give me the basics. I like yeah, it. Straight to the point. So let me think about it. Um, and I'll say these, uh, especially for those guys who, who, who work not just in software engineering field only, but even in telecommunication, mm -hmm. understanding the call flows matters. So if you have systems, there is no one system that does everything. Every, it's, we use the same old tactic that has been used over time in software engineering, divide and conquer. Okay. And that's why we have layers in our architecture, whether it's the access layer where we have the omnichannel, the, the apps, the SSD, the SMS, going back to another layer where you have APIs, going back to another layer that talks about the core services, going back to another layer that talks about the downstream systems. Maybe you want to send an SMS and that platform belongs to another company. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's full of integrations. You must understand the call flows okay. for you to become a good engineer. Okay. If you don't, you can do support, you can do design, you can be, you cannot be, a, basically you'll be a bad engineer. Okay. Then number two, engineering, I'm, I'm happy that you used the word software engineer, right? Yeah. Yes, I did. Uh, software engineers, the word engineering comes from the bigger engineering discipline. All engineering disciplines have common things. Mm -hmm. And the common thing in all engineering dis disciplines, there is a structured process of doing things. So you cannot eliminate design. You cannot eliminate having the requirements very clear, the design, and going all the way to, you know, implementing and testing iterating and later you take it to production. It sounds like uh, the waterfall, but at the end of the day, even if you're doing agile, you must have an understanding, maybe in a smaller scope, mm -hmm. but you must have the requirements very clear. It goes back to what you're saying. You have to learn the basics yes. before and you yes, 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 yes. crawl before you run. And you must test. So okay. if you don't have those tests, again, you're not a good engineer because the output is a quality product. Maybe the third thing that I would say mm -hmm. is for you to become a good engineer, you must accept the reality that software engineering is, in my view, 20% yeah. uh, writing code. So you need to ask yourself, what is the rest of the thing that you have to do? What's the 80, yeah. Yes. So for anyone who calls themselves engineers and they're just writing code, they need to ensure that either there is another person taking care of the 80% mm -hmm. or... Mm -hmm they need to take care of the 80%. Okay. So, yeah. Or learn how to take care of the 80%. Yes, yes, I yes. think those are pretty good tips. I hope everyone um, was listening and taking their notes. Mm -hmm. And I thank you so much for coming back because like I was telling you earlier, people loved your presentation, felt very engaged by it, felt very awake and very inspired. Yeah. So it's, it's good that they had a chance to also talk with you again and for yeah. making time for that. I hope for the person who said that the, t the software engineering community is stingy, I hope at least one guy, you can say at least there's one guy yeah. <laughs> who is open to sharing with us. Yeah. And, and they can reach out to me. Just yeah. reach out to me. I will We'll connect you with good guys who can you can go to just Kamochu, Samuel Kamochu. Kamochu is a few. Yes. Yeah, whether it's Twitter, LinkedIn. Just right. reach out to Someone me. Someone has said sorry, a very urgent question. They said before I let you go. Mm. Um, when does a developer become an engineer? <laughs> a developer becomes an engineer. Mm -hmm. So you become an engineer when you start appreciating the whole cycle of creating products mm -hmm. from all the way from requirements, analysis, designs. Um, developing and uh, doing all that. 
basically if you do not document anything that you do mm -hmm. no matter how ugly the documentation is it's not just diving and writing code it's it's creating solutions that have to be designed and the design has to be inclusive and it, you must ensure that you take care of the rest of the things so if you, you can be a coder and just convert uh, something and you write code to do that yeah. but at the end of the day engineering is about creating solutions mm -hmm. which is has a wider scope yeah uh, and requires you to do more an engineer is a problem solver at the end of the day, no? Yes. yes. Thank you so much for making time. I hope um, everybody's questions were answered. Thank you for tuning, uh, for staying with us. Lunch break is now over. We're getting back into the jig of things. I'll take us back in with Mbogwa and here now to see what the afternoon holds for us. Thank you again, Sam. Asante. Thank you so much. Safaricom engineering community. Uh, to Kota area. What's your cute? What's your cute? Uh, Kenneth. <laughs> <laughs> she, she jumped on the so questions. We, we, have, we have been using. <laughs> we will be using. <laughs> your point in Alicata. Hey, I'd come back to your goal. <laughs> Hi, my name is Naishanya Mungai. My name is Kama Umaina. Jacqueline Modani. My name is Felix Mene. My name is George Chuguna. Janice Kifuto. I am Mark Koyer. My name is Ayan Kainan. My name is Kenneth Awino. I am David Kazi. Alan Kipsang. My name is Rose Maina. Rick Cliff Kipkoge. I'm Jill Mora. My name is Rosanne Oguelo Dero. Bildad Mwangi. My name is Steven Chuguna Maina. Ngesa Marvin. My name is Beryl Anchep Kemoy. Victor Mwenda Rwanda. My name is Edna Njoroge. Benson Machalia. My name is Jude Juma. Hesbon Kipto. And I'm Safaricom Engineering Community. I am 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 Safaricom Engineering Community. And I am Safaricom Engineering Community. 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 I'm Safaricom Engineering Community. I am Safaricom Engineering Community. I am Safaricom Engineering Community. Mi ata si zambi wa take two. Nto kia. Karibuni back again from lunch. Those who are making their way, kindly hurry up so that we could um, get started with the next session. I think you'll agree with me that you know the morning session was um, was insightful, and I mean for me, I think. Top of, top of mind was Kamoshu's session, where I really felt challenged by him saying, it's time that we created our own solutions from scratch, so that you're able to then take those solutions to the, to, to the rest of the world. Another interesting one was from Paul, the human resource, chief human resource uh, director at Safaricom, where he looked at the future of engineering talent, not only in Kenya, but across the continent. And of course, the Mavericks Corner. The Mavericks Corner was interesting because we got to see what this, the various Safaricom teams actually do on a day-to-day -day basis to make available some of the solutions that we may take for granted or we may assume that are, that, are, that are easily done. Now, I don't know who in the audience would want to share maybe one or two sessions that made, made sense for them. Any, any, any takers? Any takers? Yes, please. Just, just, just stand up and... Um, and give us your name and then tell us what session stood out for you and I'll, I'll repeat it out. Name is Boaz. The mini program session, what, what about it in particular? Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. Um, it's on? on yeah. You're good on it. All right. Yeah, I was saying the mini programs, the team was here, was very insightful uh, because of the ease of actually creating mini programs and launching it in the M-Pesa app. Before, it was very hard to, if I had a, an app that I wanted to introduce to like the mass population, it would be very expensive. But through the M-Pesa mini programs app, you see it's a very simple steps. Programming is actually easy. 
they provide you even with an IDE to actually do the programming. So I, that was the most in, insightful session for me, and I really enjoyed it. Fantastic. Thank you, Thank Boaz. You. And I think if you, if you remember some of the stats, right? And Boaz, a thousand bobea time, eh? Just, just see me when I get off stage. So for Boaz sharing that insight, a thousand bob airtime, who else, who else now feels sufficiently motivated? Yes. <laughs> Start with the name first. So my name is Ruth Nduta. I'm a data analyst by profession. Um, I work in the insurance industry. Mm -hmm. So I feel like this was quite, the RPA session was amazing because um, in the insurance, there's so much repetition, so much um, manual work that needs to be automated. So yes. I tried it, but I really didn't have the tools, but now I know what you guys are using. I've probably tried it somewhere. Yes. <laughs> and then also just uh, chaos engineering, I didn't know about that also. Like, uh, you need to test for that. You need to inject your own chaos into the system so that you make sure it's unbreakable to the outside world. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have a whole list of things, so probably the whole, the whole talk, just getting to know Safaricom is more than M-Pesa and what it entails, that opened so much up for not only me, I'm sure for also the viewers. They're like, oh, you do IoT also, you do this and this, so it's pretty nice for the devs here. Also. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. I think, uh, you know, one of the ones she said about chaos engineering, we many times don't think about it. But again, I love analogies, and you remember as kids, Sometimes you run and then you know, you know, and then you see how, how will you recover from that, from that sort of thing. So Rose, to you, another thousand shillings in airtime. One last one. Someone to share what Here. insights they saw or what they Here. felt, um, you know, touch them from the morning session. Okay, I'll have to get another thousand shillings. Let him, let him go first and then you'll go last. So my name is Alan Kiche. Alan, yes. Yeah, I'm a web developer and a fourth year engineering student from Moi University. And I, pass, I definitely like the IoT session. And um, I really loved how uh, the presenters were able to bring on to us a point in which uh, IoT can be able to uh, be used to be able to integrate processes and be able to deliver service quite well and improve business models in such a kind of a way that uh, it reduces labor costs and it reduces a number of things. And you can be able to track a number of things even at, uh, without having to move. So that has really improved. And I, I was thinking about this in such a kind of a scenario in which IoT can be able to be used to be able to improve our security models so that you can be able to monitor your house, you can be able to monitor a lot of things from the comfort of your workplace in the office or any other place. I think IoT uh, session for me was such a significant and I think uh, it has uh, kind of helped me to be able to think about making a project, maybe a fourth year or a fifth year project based on IoT that can be able to kind of bring a solution on an impending problem uh, wherever I'll go. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Thank you for those insights. I think IoT team, you, you have a fan there. And remember, we're moving from IoT, the Internet of Things, to the Internet of Everything. Very soon with technologies like 5G, everything will be connected. I don't know if I want my fridge connected to my car, but, you know, that's the reality, and we'll have to see what solutions people build out there. Final one, name, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Colin Sechieng, and Collins? what stood out for me was the fact that <coughs> Sorry. most ideas here are presented by people who are more than one. So that really ran in my mind that if you work as a team, you can build great stuff instead of being an individual. So the key thing is collaboration. If you collaborate, you can build great stuff. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it speaks into the issue of community, <laughs> saying how, you know, Iron sharpens iron, and just like sometimes you have uh, what you call code reviews, you can actually help someone uh, be better and also do better um, on their own. So as soon as I get off stage, kindly uh, follow me for your 1,000 shillings of airtime. Thank you for participating. I'd like to make a final call for those who've not yet joined us. We're about to go on to the next um, session where we listen to Elizabeth Nguli, HOD Digital Engineering. So kindly, kindly make your way in. I'll just recap what my best parts of the, of the morning sessions were. I loved the, the, the sort of um, inspiration and ambition that Kamotu shared with, with him wanting us to become better builders in terms of looking at core systems that we can actually sell to other people. Paul, head of, um, uh, head of HR, looked at the future of engineering talent. And there was the very many themes within which he, he spoke. You know, there's one 
that says when you go to the market, you're told there are 750,000 devs across Africa, but when you really whittle it down, he said that you, you might only find 10% worth their metal. Yet, you know, Michael came and said, no, 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 no. You look at the skills and not the, and not the paper. So a discussion that can be, um, can be held for hours on end. And lastly for me, it was the Mavericks corner. Always a fan of show, not tell. Dime a dozen ideas, but as soon as, if, when you can crystallize an idea and showcase it in front of people, I mean, there were live demos. So yes, some of them didn't work out as expected, but at least we got to see the solution. So to our next session, I'd like to welcome um, Elizabeth Nguli, who's a HOD, Digital Engineering, to talk to us about the Safaricom developer community and let us know more about that. Elizabeth Karibu. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our summit today. It's a great honor to have all of you physically here and those online. And thank you so much for the feedback that you've kept coming and for the engagement that you've, you've, you've kept, kept giving on, on the online portals. So I'm going to be speaking about the engineering community, the Safaricom engineering community. This is our first, uh, our first uh, idea for us to be able to be give back to the community. It's, a, it's something that the developers came, came up with. Actually, it's not my creation, and I'll give credit to them. So we've seen the need uh, in the market. We have so many young innovators, young developers, people who are looking up for mentors, people are looking up for people to be able to connect with, learn from. And this is us, us just uh, coming up with an idea for us to be able to give back to the community. I had a thing about user challenges. Okay, so just a brief about uh, this Safaricom engineering community. So the whole idea is just about you, learners, uh, technology enthusiasts, people who are passionate about technology, coming together, engaging, connecting, sharing all the knowledge that you have, and learning from one another. Again, what we are looking at is we want to create a space for all of us. We come and discover new technologies that are out here, and then we connect, we share them, we innovate, and we grow our careers. We look at making a positive impact in the communities, both in Kenya, Africa, and beyond. And we are looking at connecting with developers, not just in Kenya, not just in Safaricom, but even beyond, uh, entire, uh, and, and beyond the boundaries. And again, what we have done is we've created what we call chapters within the community. So we have nine chapters at the moment that we've launched, and what we are looking at is people with common interests, say in IoT, coming together again. You'll join this community, you'll share the knowledge that you have, and then you're coming here to learn as well and grow with the rest of the people with a similar interest as, as you. So what you see here are the, the nine chapters that we have that any of you here could join or anyone online could join. Uh, the other things that we are going to be doing, the activities that we look at doing as part of the community, we'll have definitely events such as this. We'll have events within the chapter where you as a chapter come together, organize sessions for learning, what we call the chapter events and chapter booths, and also have some mentorship sessions from the pro professionals or the experts within your, uh, your, your community. We'll have, uh, we are trying to make it as interesting as possible and also our community is a lot beginner friendly, so it doesn't matter how much you know or how much you want to learn. It's just about you coming, joining a community, being part of a community, and sharing what you have and being open to learning what is being uh, shared within the community. We'll have study jams, outreach programs, and any interesting activities. Really, we're not going to be limiting what the community wants to engage in. It's about you as a team, and the chapter will have a community lead or a patron, and a lead who is going to work with you to just make sure that we can coordinate all these activities and make it as vibrant as possible. Uh, conferences like this will be common, and will allow for these communities. If we could have one of like the IoT community organizing for us a summit or a developer conference, why not? So really just a challenge out here for you. There's so much you can do. The opportunity is here for you to join. 
join a, a community of people with similar interests at, as you, and I think the opportunities are immense here. Uh, also, we'll be having these communities. We are driving innovation, and that's the whole idea about these communities. It's about you coming together again. Think about all the problems we have in the world that software can solve, and then you come up with ideas that can help us solve some of these issues, and probably this can become real products or real solutions that people can use in the market. So, as I said, the main thing is about connecting the purpose, what we are looking to achieve. You engage with people of same interests, either locally or globally. Again, we are going to have meetups that are not just physical, but also hybrid, so it does, you could connect with anyone in the globe. And also, we want you guys to just come in here with an open mind to learn. And I believe as a community, then you can set up sessions where people can share as much as possible, and those that are there as well uh, can, can learn. And also, it's about growing the engineering skills within Kenya and beyond. And we've realized there's generally a global shortage of such certain skills. And it's an opportunity for us here to come in this community, learn from one another, teach each other again, and again build lasting networks and which can move us to the next level. So for us, who is our target? Anyone who is a learner anyone who is aspiring to learn something within engineering. It can be anything, by the way. I'd put the nine chapters uh, just to help us in terms of organizing ourselves into communities. But then again, there's as much you can learn in engineering as you wish. Then the other key people who are target group are professionals. Again, I'd say this is just us as Safaricom building something for the community that can help us to grow the skill within the market. But besides that, you don't have to work in Safaricom for you to be a mentor. This is anyone in the crowd here or online who is really interested to share the knowledge that they have to mentor other young innovators, upcoming innovators, and be able to grow the community and move this forward. So again, then, I'm sure you're asking yourself, how do I join these nine chapters or the Safaricom engineering community? It's very simple. A link is going to be shared. You could sign up. In, and join. Look at the chapters that are available. I've already shown you the chapters of interest. Pick that. Select the activities that you want to be involved in. And then join a community. There'll be, I'll be showing the different leads here. You can reach out to them. But within the community, you will have a group where you can actually engage and share ideas on how to build your community. And after that, we're going to be tracking the activities on how well you are participating in the activities, and beyond that, how well are you contributing to this community? And we'll be having different award ceremonies and award levels. So when you come in, you'll come in as a Browns uh, member. That means you've just joined, you've not started sharing. But depending on how much you're sharing, how much you're growing others within the community, then we can grow you into the different levels all the way to the platinum level. And what this means is, this is also an opportunity for you at platinum, opportunities to work at Safaricom, opportunities for us to grow you as a person because you're growing the community and a lot more and those will be shared when you go when you join your your chapter so i think without without further ado i'll be introducing the patrons and the leads for these different chapters and i'll just call them to come on stage cloud computing marco year The lead is Dennis Kipruto. Dennis, if you're here, please join us on stage. For IoT, we have Alex Kipsang. He sent his apologies. But we have the leads as uh, Ayan Kenan and Marvin Gesa. You can come on stage. For software engineering, I'm passionate about software engineering, so I'll be the patron. And the lead is going to be David Kazi. You can come on stage. Uh, product management, uh, Felix Mene is going to be our patron. And the lead is weekly Koge. You can come on stage. Uh, data science, Kamau Maina. And the lead is Bildad Mwangi. Again, come on stage. So for FinTech, we have Felix Rop and Esbon Kipto is our lead. You could also make your way. Cybersecurity, we have James Yogo in absentia. Ernest Maina and Edel Kirwa. Please come on stage. 
Performance Engineering, Ken Owino is our patron, and the lead is Victor Rwanda. Please make your way on stage. And as they come, so far since we launched uh, in the last one week, we've had 1,500 members join us. The link is on Twitter, it's on our social media handles, but it's going to be shared again today. We've had over 300 mentors. These are people who are in engineering and would love to share with the community. And they've offered themselves to be able to share the knowledge that they've acquired over the years with the young innovators and the learners. And so far, the nine chapters that I've shown, we are free to grow this to as much as we want. And we've had over 18,000 engagements and interactions. We look forward to making this the biggest community in Africa with over 500,000 members. Please subscribe, join, come up with your ideas. We are not going to dictate how the communities will be run. So please join and be part of us. And here is the team. I think uh, I was told that we were going to run a ceremony by Canaan to officially launch the Safaricom Engineering Community. Is there anything? <laughs> Do you guys want to dance? <laughs> okay, Kenan. Hello. Hey, Kenan. Hello. Hello. I want to pardon you my attempt. Please come, come forth. Um, I think I'm just so excited that finally we've come forth to launch this community. Um, it's been in the works for quite some time and the amazing, brilliant team here um, will be leading us through the community chapters. And yeah, I wish we had, um, we could do fireworks in here, but unfortunately, <laughs> you all understand the safety hazards. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited. I can see so many familiar faces here. Yeah. Um, so many community enthusiasts, like Nar Ruth, uh, we can see you. And I'm, I'm just thankful that you all came through today. And I hope you all had um, an amazing time, amazing lunch. We always connect over food. <laughs> and yeah, um, thank you so much. This is the official launch. Of thank the you, Kanan. And with that, we have launched the Safaricom Engineering Community officially. Please join us. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys. I think, I think one of the things that we must note, even as they walk off stage, is that these are, these are volunteer positions. These are people who are passionate about the different verticals that they, they have applied themselves to. And remember that analogy of, um, of space that I, I gave earlier? But when you, when you zoom out, there are, so many, there are so many things that happen within any community and any ecosystem. So please, you know, give them grace, even as you join. You know, communities are also human, so there are human issues to be, uh, to be handled there as well. Um, Michael Onyango earlier alluded to, was it Michael or Paul? He alluded to the issue of EQ that misses out in a lot of engineering conversations where we lack, we lack the empathy. Since we are primarily very binary thinkers, then that element of EQ is, um, is super important. Now, Still talking about tech, tech ecosystems, there's a gentleman I'd like to call on stage. It's called Mr. Mr. Irvin Omkasa, founder and CEO of, of Sofibot. And yes, the Safaricom ecosystem has just launched, but there are very many other ecosystems across Africa. And Irvin would uh, you know, talk to us about, about those and help us get, get a, a more balanced perspective. Karibu. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Are we good with sound? Ah, awesome. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi, everyone again. Okay, I know you just came back from land, so I'll try and make this as exciting as possible. Most people know me as Amukasa from Sophie Bot. What fewer people know is I was one of the founding members of Android 254. Back then, it was a WhatsApp group that was absolutely full every single day. 256 out of a capacity of 256 members. I will go back to this story later, but now I want to turn the clock a bit, a bit back. The year is 2014. I had just failed after building my first, I just failed building my first company called Altipedia. 
and thought, let's try this school thing. I'm a JQuart, enrolled as an actual science student, and the local community lead asks me to speak at the local community meetup about Firebees. Why? Because they didn't know any, uh, he didn't know anyone else in the community who was, who was passionate about this backend as a service tool as me. Let's, uh, it brings me to my first idea and my first lesson for this talk is tech is a meritocracy. Yes, you brought out all the big words today. It doesn't matter what your pedigree is, it doesn't matter what your degree was in, it doesn't matter what you studied or if you studied at all. As long as you can build, congratulations, you're in. You're a developer, you're part of the community. That's the most important thing I've learned. So as we live here today, pick a problem, find the technology that solves that problem, learn that technology, and start building. Going back to my second lesson, uh, uh, this leads me to my second idea, the second lesson of that, uh, of that moment is that if you build in isolation and no one knows what you've built, it's all in vain. This community lead knew from all, that, all the noise I made about this specific tool and invited me to, to speak. So, so, telling your story and spinning your tail is the second part of the job. You must build and tell other people what you've built and how this technology can be used to solve their specific problems. So as we live here today, we've picked a problem, we've picked the technology for the problem, and we've built, tell about, talk, talk to people about what you've built, write about it, be the most vocal member of your community speaking about, uh, speaking about that specific technology, speaking about that specific tool. Now to my fourth idea, Android 254, a WhatsApp group that was always full, one of us had the vision to move us from that WhatsApp group to an offline meetup. And who, uh, and who did, they, did they tap to help organize? Me. You might have guess, you, you can guess what we talked about at, our, at the first meetup. Firebees. The lesson here is be, a, be an active member of the community and always be ready to take up responsibility. Communities, uh, unlike previous generations, and, and people in this ecosystem, we don't have the reflex of setting up associations with a chairman, secretary, treasury, etc, etc. It's an open community where anyone can come in, step up, take responsibility, and deliver. That philosophy has lived within the Android community. To this date, there's been sort of a changing guard. Now the, the, the guy who runs, uh, now the guy who runs the community almost day to day, setting up meetings and whatnot, is a younger developer, another generation of, of people developing on, on, on Android. To my fifth point is, the more you grow, the more you grow in the ecosystem, the more you speak at, at events, the more the confidence level, your confidence level grows. You will hit a specific common pitfall. People will ask you to speak about things you know nothing about. Simply don't. I am Ivan Amukasa. I, learn and I know about Android and AI. Come, uh, uh, and you think I'm confident enough to speak about IoT. I have no idea about IoT. I cannot speak about IoT. Going back to my, examples, uh, my example from my early days is um, a bigger community lead uh, saw my Firebase talks and invited me to a bigger community and asked me to talk about some obscure voice API service. In my mind, I was so, I was so excited about this opportunity. I started thinking about all the idea, different ideas you could do with the demo. <laughs> but the problem was this demo had one specific example and took audio files in one specific format. I think at this point it's now defunct. 
you might have guess, you could have could have guessed how the how that talk went i'm not telling you to not try new things to not put yourself in uncomfortable position that's what i'm saying all i'm saying is that as the more your status the more recognition grows within the community do not oversell or overestimate your skills because the second you give that talk you become an authority figure a reference point in that in that community and if you can do not have the engineering uh, skills to back that up you have let down everyone else in that community to my final point is it even my final point <laughs> second a uh, uh, close to final point is yes it's, it's basically my final point is communities aren't just a place for you to give and give and give and give and give and get nothing back the dividends come in due time for most people they got their first traveling experience outside kenya their first stamp of their visa because of community events for some people they got their first they are first freelance uh, uh, opportunity from being members of of communities the other people for those who are less entrepreneurial uh, 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 entrepreneurial who got their first jobs as a result of being active members of the community i just warn you once you once those opportunities open open up for you do not disappear from the community come back to the community and keep giving back and keep giving giving back now my final point Communities aren't just a space to come and share ideas and, and go and get fixes for your bag and, and go and get opportunities. They have one, point, uh, one specific issue of impact, one specific point of impact is communities are a starting ground for collective community action. And for this, I have two examples in my, in my journey as a developer. Uh, no shade to Safaricom. <laughs> Uh, a couple of years back, Saf um, Safaricom, in a partnership with Google, let Kenyans buy apps via M-Pesa. Very noble, very great idea, but there was one problem. Local developers could not publish paid apps on the Play Store because of something called merchant accounts. We came back to the community and agitated, had a meeting with the, uh, had a meeting with the Google Play developer team from London, and within months, Kenyan developers got merchant accounts. I'm going to force you to clap for that. <laughs> a more recent example was a bill that was passed a month ago, creating unnecessary roadblocks for developers entering the space, the ICT practitioners bill. The same thing happened. We turned inwards, we turned to community, and through community action, the, after the bill being passed, committee action made, uh, committee action made submissions to parliament that were, that were ignored. The bill was passed through parliament, but because of community action, the president refused to assent to that bill. That bill is as good as dead in this administration. As I wrap up, and 254 today is at over 5,000 members. All the communities, developer communities and meetup right now are over a thousand members. The Safari Common Engineering community is over a thousand members. This is a message to all out there who haven't joined. Pick a problem, find the technology that solves that problem, build, tell everyone about what you built and share it. And I cannot wait to see what you built. See you on the other side. Asante sana Mukasa, I think he speaks, he speaks well of the cup and also speaks into many of the issues that I feel passionate about when thinking about the community. And I'll, I'll, I'll highlight some of those. Um, there's this phrase that a friend of mine told me once and he said, who will speak for you in a room? And because of community, you get to know each other well. And like he said, if you're told, um, Bogwa, come speak about machine learning and AI and you're out of your depth, 
what's the first thing you do if you're in, if you're in a good community? You say, I can't, but I, I know someone. So who will speak for you in a room? And I've had so many opportunities come my way because I had people who spoke for me in the room. And that is one of the beautiful things about being in a community and being authentic about your, your relationships and intentions. Um, the other one I think is, that is critical is know your strengths as, a, as an individual and contribute. We've got very many people who, there's this phrase called drag along. You know, they're in a community, but they, they're just there. You know, like some of our parliamentarians. They're just there. No bill, no nothing, no activity until it comes maybe something ya yeah, sherehe, yeah, and then suddenly someone has, has changamkat. So know your, know your strengths and contribute to the community because that is what may eventually also open additional doors for you. Last one I think is stronger together. In all my time in, in, all my time in tech, you know one of the things that you have to do sometimes is you have to lobby. Nashidi aku lobby kuwa peke yako ni nini? What's the biggest challenge of sticking out? What happens to that nail? What happens to that nail when it sticks out? You get hammered. You go agitate for something, you're told, oh, is that, is that, is that noisemaker there? That, that's the guy, or that's the girl, that's the lady who's agitating for, for stuff, even when it's positive. But if you come together, then you're able to, to move mountains. And those two mountains that you heard mentioned, the ability for now local developers to get merchant accounts so that they can then publish paid apps and therefore earn revenue, and we've seen, we, we need to figure out in, in, the, in the past, I think the past few years, we need to do some research to see how much money have people made as devs. In the other decade, you know, between two, 2000 and 2010, you know, there was, um, there, there was a good friend of mine, I, um, he's now CTO at, uh, at Sky Garden. I remember he had built an amazing, an amazing app that went onto the Nokia OV store. And do you know how much money that thing made him? I think it was 8 million bob. We used to look at that guy and like, gah, 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 gah. 8 million, that is, so between then and now, what else have we seen? Community can help, can help enable us, okay? Now we're going to a short break. I'd request you not to leave your seats. DJ Mish will take care of us for the next five minutes as we close out the virtual session because you're about to get into a session that's not gonna be streamed. It's gonna be a, a boot camp and then you're gonna have the patrons come in and we take it to the next um, session. Okay, guys? So keep it locked, stay seated. Let DJ Mish take care of us. DJ. What a lovely day it has been so far, guys. What a lovely day it has been so far. I can't believe it. It went beyond my wildest expectations. You've been an amazing audience. 10 out of 10, super interactive. I've loved having you. Now, Penda, now I appreciate. Sana, sana, sana. We'll be right back here tomorrow at 9 a.m. So please do make sure you join us. Keep interacting with us. If you want something today, yeah, there's more to win tomorrow. But in case you're one of the lucky ones who won today, please go over to Twitter at Safaricom PLC, only the, ver the verified account. Make sure you give them your details so you can claim your airtime. Once again, thank you so much. The hackathons, the masterclasses, the demos. It's been an amazing day and there's more of that coming tomorrow. We'll see how the Safaricom engineering community can meet together with the wider engineering community to make solutions even better for customers and for the general public. I've been your host, Mariam Bishar. It's been a pleasure. Like I said, you're an amazing audience. I feel the love from all the way over here. I will see you tomorrow. Efficiency, cost, productivity, business as usual has always been about turning a profit. If you stop to think about it, what more is there? The universe, nature, life, civilization as we know it is about the search for something greater than ourselves. Huawei Cloud is innovating technologies to make the world more inclusive. The Cloud, AI, 5G are building a fully connected, intelligent world. They do more than drive digital transformation. It's a new paradigm for innovation.
Imagine, if you can, what amazing secrets await when we unlock the secrets of the universe. What cosmic answers will we learn? AI can help preserve in the rainforest by identifying the sounds of gunshots or the sounds of illegal logging, protecting the most precious sounds, birds and trees for generations to come. In cities around the world, we can collect traffic data and analyze it to improve transportation and bring order to a chaotic world. Even reporting the weather can be improved with AI. With more accurate forecasts and timely alerts, we'll travel safer and get home to our loved ones. Also, so many delicious flavors, chili, herbs, and spices automatically selected to improve flavor, quality, and nutrition. Delightful flavor explosions to dazzle our taste buds. A cloud for everyone, unleashing the power of innovation, making every day better. A cloud for pervasive intelligence and a better future. Huawei Cloud, grow with intelligence. Safaricom Engineering Community is a group of engineers who have come together uh, to have fun, uh, to transform lives, and to build an engineering culture of perfection within the specific field that they are in. The community that I'm patterning is the community for soft architecture. So the vision is to build a culture of developing solutions and designing solutions that are secure, that are com performant uh, within the environments that they work in, and that also transform lives. We will equip the community members with the right skill set and knowledge to develop the next generation platforms that will be hardware agnostic. So this community will be looking at designing solutions that first of all are secure, that uh, perform very well when subjected to load, that also meet the needs of the customers, and then defining standards within which software is built. Having led developer communities in the past, I'm going to set up forums and events where the community members will be able to meet physically, collaborate, share ideas, ideas, create networks, and to do, do follow-up events where members of the communities can showcase items they are proficient in or new knowledge areas that they are trying to learn and understand. To have, want to have them come on stage one by one, and essentially the agenda is for them to, in a nutshell, t tell us what they think or what their ambition is for that particular role, and then hopefully you'll get to um, have a quick, quick Q&A. So just pay attention so that if you identify the patron that um, you resonate, re resonate with in terms of the vertical that they're addressing, you could maybe want to, um, to have that connection. So to break the ice for us, I'd like to call back on stage Ayan and Ruben to then break the ice and then we'll get, into the, we'll get to speak to the different chapter patrons uh, for the developer community. Karibu. Hey guys. Hello, man, we've just eaten. I'm the guy, I'm the guy for hype, I'm the guy for goodies. So hello. hello. Hi, man. Energy, hello. 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 Uh, my name is Ruben, as you've heard, and um, we're very glad to be here today and to see all of you today. And so mine is very quick. So I would like to know how many of us are at our Twitter space. And like I said, I'm the guy for goodies, so of course I have very nice goodies with me. How many of us were at the Twitter space? So what did I introduce my role as in the community? Just raise your hand. Not you. <laughs> Just raise your hand. I, had, I think I have a thousand bob for you. Credits? Uh, yes. 
No, my role in the community. Yes. No, my role at Safaricom is I'm a product designer, but my role in community is? You don't want my credits? <laughs> okay, so I am uh, one of the colleagues in the Safaricom engineering community. And um, now because you didn't get that question correct, at least I hope some of you uh, will get this one. Um, who can tell us four chapters in the community? Quick, yes. And, okay, come get a thousand, Bob. Let's love for her. Um, I think we still have like five more chapters left. Who can tell me three? So she said you have IoT, UI, UX, data science, and? and cloud. Who are the other three? Yes. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Performance engineering. Thank you. Let's clap for her. Um, so I'm going to let Ian also uh, talk to you. Uh, but it's very amazing to have all of you here, and I hope we're going to be interacting a lot more and have more fun uh, today and tomorrow. So, Ayan. Hello. Hello. How are you guys? I know you guys are, you've eaten a heavy lunch, but I need you guys to stand a bit. Stand, Kidogo. Let's stand. Old MacDonald had a farm. And on, that, and on that farm there was a sheep. Do you know, who knows that song? <laughs> I'm Julia's song. Yeah? Okay. Um, but you know Nyama Nyama Nyama, right? Nyama Nyama Nyama. Nyama Nyama Nyama. Yakuku. Yangombe. Yakondo. Yanyoka. <laughs> yeah? So when I say nyama nyama nyama, you jump. Okay? If it's nyama, you jump. If it's not nyama, you don't jump. Then we see who jump. Who, who eats funny things, okay? Nyama nyama nyama. Nyama nyama nyama. Yakuku. Ala hamzakula. Yakondo. Ala. Yatotois. Wow. <laughs> okay, so we can take our seats now. So may I have, I have a couple of trivial questions to ask you all. Um, and it's, it's, it's first come, first serve. I mean, whoever lifts their hand first um, gets to answer. So, the guy for goodies is here. Yes, I also have goodies for you here. Uh, a thousand bob worth of airtime. I think uh, for each of the questions. So, who was the first woman to code? Who was the first woman to? Umearibu, <laughs> umechoma. Umechoma. Let me ask another question. <laughs> but then you should, you should, you should, you should, you should just, um, yeah, yeah. So, who was the first person to go to space? Which one? And no, who was the first person to go to space? Yes. Pardon, come. Not Neil Armstrong. No. Not Neil Armstrong. Uh huh. Yuri Gagarin. Pardon? Yuri Gagarin. <laughs> yes, it's it's Yuri. Come for the other uh, time. Let's laugh for him. Thank you. I think you should, you should ask. You should, you should ask your question. So show me the name. So you can tell me that. So, 
Um, thank you guys for being such an amazing audience and we hope that we will keep having fun. Are you having fun? Are you having fun? Yes. Don't sound like people you're having fun. Are you having fun? Yes. Okay, I will see you guys around. I'll see you guys tomorrow and um, keep doing this. Thank you. Yes, and just, just a reminder, uh, keep tweeting. Uh, the hashtag is Safaricom Decode. Um, Safaricom Decode. Make sure you all tweet. I, ha I still have uh, two airtime, two, yeah, uh, two a thousand Bob airtimes. So I will be scouting for the person who tweets the most or gets the most like on a post, and I will be DMing you with this voucher uh, that you will come get from me there. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye. A quick challenge for those of us who are attentive. If you're able to take a photo of me up here, tag me and come for a thousand bucks. Thank you. Bye bye. The guys for goodies indeed. Asante Sana for you know breaking the ice for us on that on that on that session. I'd like to call quickly on stage um, as one of the as one of the chapter patrons, Elijah Ochieng. Elijah Ochieng, and he's going to speak to us about getting started on the Daraja 2.0 API. So if you're one of those guys who's been looking at, um, at the mini app ecosystems or any other solution that utilizes or leverages M-Pesa, this is a conversation that you need to, um, to keep your ear out on. Again, this particular session is not being streamed online. So for example, those particular goodies that you just had mentioned are literally going to be going to people in the room. And as you engage, we'll, um, we'll see how to continue incentivizing. Karibu. Uh, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Uh, how's lunch? Huh? Ah, okay. I assume it was a nice one. Uh, welcome to our after lunch session. My name is Ondiek Kelaidzo. Uh, I'm a student, a software engineer, a technical writer, and a community advocate. Uh, so, welcome again. Okay, so for a while uh, I've been eyeing Microsoft for quite some time. And uh, to be honest, uh, what, I, what I've seen here today, uh, I think I have to rethink my decision. So my, uh, yeah, it's a, uh, I may call it Safaricom redefined. So you guys have been doing all this under the hood. Congratulations, uh, I'm quite impressed. Yeah, so let's uh, get into it. Uh, I'll be taking us quickly through an introduction or getting started with the Daraja 2.0 API by Safaricom. Uh, please uh, take me to the first slide. Uh, the next one. Yep. Uh, so what's the Daraja 2.0 API or Daraja API? Yep. So uh, Safaricom uh, in the year, uh, I think it's around 2017, came up with uh, this uh, API to kind of bridge the gap uh, between uh, developers and uh, is it, uh, how do I call it? Let me just say developers and the, the, and the businesses, yeah. So I think uh, the term Daraja was basically dubbed from that uh, main uh, intent or what they were trying to achieve. So in a nutshell, it's just an API to access the M-Pesa services. Yeah, that's uh, quite clear. Uh, take me to the next slide, please. Yep. So we'll be quick on this. Uh, so the RAD API uh, has some uh, ex uh, uh, endpoints exposed uh, for the consumption by devs and uh, everyone uh, aspiring to 
get something out of it. Yeah, so we got the C2B API, B2C, and B2B. Yep, uh, next slide, please. Yep, so the client to business API. Mainly, it's a, just a, it's an API or an endpoint, uh, an API, I'll say, uh, to make payment requests from clients to business, the C2B uh, abbreviation. Uh, and uh, under the C2B API, we have uh, one of the famous or majorly used uh, Lipan M-Pesa or SDK push. And uh, you can bear with me, uh, it's, uh, it's really changed a lot in the current uh, setting in the business sector. And I know a uh, majority of us, has, we've moved away from that uh, era when we used to do uh, handouts or cash transactions. So we've uh, moved to the Lipa and Pesa and it's quite beneficial uh, to businesses and uh, to everyone else, uh, the consumers, uh, and with the consumers. Uh, next slide. Yep, so a summary of uh, what happens uh, in the C2B API. Okay, so there you are as a customer. You initiate a payment uh, to pay for your pay for your, uh, your stuff. So from there, your request, your, uh, your payment request, or yeah, uh, it's sent to Mpesa. And uh, this block here, we have uh, some kind of encapsulation. It's not really the Mpesa in the actual position, but uh, an API. Then sort of an interaction with the, the main, uh, let's say, we'll call it the engine, yeah. So once you've sent uh, your payment, your PIN is validated, your account balance, and the pay bill you've entered. Yeah, so they exist uh, when you enable, a, it's called uh, an external validation. Uh, also, the events that are triggered just in case uh, it's not enabled. Yeah, so, say all this are done, uh, you get uh, an SMS notification to use the customer uh, initiating the transaction and uh, also to the, to the merchant or the, the owner of the pay bill or buy goods. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, so the famous SDK push, how does it work? Uh, so at the farthest end, uh, we have our uh, merchant. Uh, let's say this is you who've uh, done the integration on your website or your mobile app. Let's say it's a e-commerce store. Uh, so there you are. Uh, you'll have to have some sort of communication with the API management, and uh, the API sort of links to the Mpesa itself. Uh, you send an API request, you're acknowledged with the response, after which uh, an, SDK, an SDK push via a proxy is triggered and uh, a prompt uh, sent to the customer to to enter the, uh, oh, the, the pin, yeah, the Mpesa pin, yeah. So once that is done, you've entered your pin, uh, it's sent back to the PA management, uh, after which uh, you'll get uh, back uh, yeah, the confirmation of your payment. So, in a nutshell, uh, this is it. Uh, it's not that much detail, but uh, you can get an overview of basically what's, what's happening. Yep. So, this is the endpoint uh, where 
in your doing your testing on your your sandboxing, you send a post. Uh, I think it's a post request to the endpoint uh, process request. Yep. Uh, take me to the next slide. Uh, secondary line, you have the business to customer API or the B2C. Yeah, so it's used to make payments from a business to customer. Say you paying your you paying your your staff, promotional payments, betting winnings, uh, financial institution withdrawals of funds. Yeah, so that's basically it. Uh, it's not that uh, I don't hear it most most of the time, unlike uh, the SDK push of the Leap and Mpesa. Uh, we also have the business to business API transferring money from one business to the other. It's uh, what happens here is it's similar to what happens in the B two C, except uh, on the other end now it's not the how do you call it? It's not the, it's not you, but uh, this time around it's a, a business or an enterprise, uh, enterprise to enterprise uh, kind of extent. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, next slide. Next slide. I think that's it. Uh, I've done quite a brief on that of the available services of the APIs. So, with that being said, uh, let's uh, see some uh, kind of uh, how we can do this simulation. Okay. Uh, so, you're not doing the actual coding here. Mpesa 2.0 API is a sort of versatility, the sort of things you can do with it if you're really smart about, about some of those flows. Um, the one that is not much talked about, of course, is the B2B one and also the B2C. And in as much as it is easy to use some of these solutions, one of the biggest risk factors uh, for most people that's not considered is the security that you actually, whenever you grant someone permissions to say integrate for you, and they're doing something like moving money out. This is one of the places where, and hopefully we'll cover this in one of the other community events where you're looking at security. That anytime you build a system that moves money out, you need to be extra careful about that particular, or those particular modules. Because we've known, we've seen stories of many circles, you know, anywhere where there's movement of value, Places like that can get compromised easily, okay? So even with the ease in which some, something can be integrated, you also have to be careful because it's the same ease with which systems can be built to, to take value outside. So are you, are you ready? Okay. And maybe another point, some of you may not know this, but 
Safaricom themselves, when they got to the point of rolling out the M-Pesa API, how do, they, how do you think they got to the name Daraja? They actually involved community. Then it was very informal, but what they did is they emailed probably tens to hundreds of partners and said, guys, we are looking at rolling out an API ecosystem. What do you think would be a great name? And of course they got very many submissions. I can't remember some of the more obtuse ones, but eventually I think, uh, you know, settled on Daraja and I think you'll agree with me, it makes sense that it's called Daraja, a bridge between systems, a bridge between opportunities, a bridge between um, any two problems. So that also speaks into maybe this being the culmination of, you know, now there being a Safaricom community officially launched, but many of the things that have been done in the past have already involved, involved the community. Down to the time that, um, there was a time the industry or the ecosystem was feeling like, like Safaricom is not being a great partner. What did they do again? They came back to the community and said, guys, let us know who you think will speak for you. And I was fortunate enough to be one of the people who voted and I served, on a, I served on a board for a short period of time that was pretty much articulating the issues for the community vis-a-vis -vis, um, how Safaricom was perceived then and very easily and very quickly helped us bridge that divide in terms of helping people, helping both the organization and the ecosystem uh, sort out any, any perceptions that there were. And now, I mean, here we are at an amazing event such as this. Are you ready now? Uh, okay. Uh, since uh, the demo goods uh, against us, so I think uh, I'll leave it at that point and uh, I hope to see you next time on another platform uh, somewhere on the same Darad GPI. Thank you and have a nice time. Fantastic, Elijah. Kunanduru, kutoka ya pande hii. Patia ye, Mike. People are feeling a bit low on, on, on energy. We're almost there. We're almost there. We've got, um, we've got two more. Is it two or three more? We have... Um, we have three more presentations from the, from the community reps. And the second one by Alex Karanja is, what is UX and how to get to UX? Alex, I'll request that you, you be a bit chap chap with it so we can catch up with time, so that we can get to close um, the event in, um, in good time, day one in good time. Alex? You can all hear me and see me. So my name is Alex Karanja. I'm a design lead at uh, Safaricom. So I work with the most talented team in terms of bringing the best experience on most of, our, most of the products that you guys interact with, from the apps to the portals. Yeah. So today we'll be handling what is UX and how to get into UX. The reason why I chose this topic is um, UX is still not that mature in our, our ecosystem and in our industry. So how can we evangelize UX as well as encourage more people to get to, to the craft and to the industry as well? Yeah. So uh, user experience refers to any interaction a user has uh, with your product, with your service, in general, with the company. So it's not just uh, on a platform level, let's say on an app level or just portal level, but the whole experience. Uh, we normally say that uh, user experience is the emotional outcome, what you feel after you've interacted uh, with, a, uh, with a product. And uh, the main thing with UX is that it employs empathy and design thinking. So everything, every decision that you make is always centered um, on the customer or on the user that you're designing this product. Because remember, you're in business and if you're designing a product, you're not designing the product for yourself. You're designing it uh, for, for the user. And for which, if you achieve your user's uh, goals and needs, then you're able to achieve your, your business needs. So we look at what makes uh, good UX, and uh, we have the recategorization of, uh, 
or three dimensions that we use to measure what is good UX. So there is what the user feels, there is what the user thinks, and what the user uses. So the seven fragments forms what we call good, uh, good UX. And for you to achieve this, uh, it's very easy, but we have a couple of questions that you have to answer your, uh, yourself so that you know that you've really delivered the experience as expected by the user and as the business uh, wanted. So the first question is, can your users use it? Can your users use your product? Is it usable? If you're creating a product that cannot be used, let's say an app, someone cannot be able, let's say, if I'll give an example on my Safaricom app. If we made it so hard for you not to send money, then that, that app is, it doesn't make sense. It's not, it's not usable. Also, can your user find it? It's not about finding, uh, let's say, the product, but also the features that these people need to use. So let's say for a feature, uh, I want to buy bundles. If I'm not able to find it, then I'm on the wrong side of UX, yeah? And also you look at how easy is your product, uh, how easy is it to find your product? Let's say it's a portal, a website that you have, that you sell, whatever you sell, yeah? How easy is a person able to Google and correctly get to, uh, to your site? Another thing is, does it serve what your users have? What does it serve a need that your user have? So you can have a very fancy app, uh, spend a lot of money, but then if it doesn't serve the needs, because remember, who is the king? It's the user. So, and if you, you create a product that does not serve the needs of your users, you're going to flop. And that's why you see many people rushing into creating these awesome looking uh, products, but then they end up not being used because they never looked at the needs of the users, whatever they wanted, uh, to, to, uh, the whatever they wanted the solution for. Another thing is, uh, do your users want to use it? You know, you need to create a product that is very um, admirable. It's something I want to keep using, yeah? It's something that uh, keeps me on my phone. I'll give an example. Uh, something like uh, TikTok. There are people spending even five, seven hours on TikTok. They're admirable for me to use, yeah? Also, does it provide value? In value, uh, we, can look at, uh, we can look at it in, um, like in, four, in four ways. So first, there's money, money. So does the app or does your product help me uh, make money? Does it help me save time? Does it help me achieve my personal goals? And does it help me achieve my business goals? Because remember, we have what you call the consumer solutions and what we, have, we call the business solutions. So does it help? Does it deliver that value to that specific customer? And remember, we all, we all have different needs and value is different. Whatever you attach as value to you, maybe is not value to someone else. So you really need to understand your users and be able to, to be sure that you're providing value with your, uh, with your solution. Another thing is trust. Do your users trust your product? If you never trusted Safaricom, and Pesa app or my Safaricom app, you could never enter your PIN, I'm sure, yeah? So the same. If I'm providing my information, um, my information on your platform, how trustworthy is it? How secure is it? Yeah? So that's another major thing that forms uh, part of what we call good UX. Accessibility is another thing. So how accessible is your, is your, is your product? And uh, this is something I've realized that uh, locally, this is something that is very overlooked. So accessibility, you look at the different categories of the users that you're serving. There are people who have eye problems. So what are you providing in your design that's going to help that person? Yeah? We are all able in different ways. Yeah? And remember, if you leave one out, you also leave another, others who are not part of that group out. I'll give an example. You provide, uh, you do a, an app design and uh, you have small touch points. So remember that people are handicapped? 
but there's also a time, maybe I'll hurt my hand and I'll need a larger touch point. But you see, you left out this person who is handicapped uh, with a small touch point, and now myself, I've hurt my hand, uh, for which it will still heal, but I can't be able to use that product at that particular time. So those seven, if you are able to answer those seven, seven questions correctly, then you can be able to say that, yes, I've been able to provide good UX. Before I go to how we measure UX, uh, there are some major misconceptions that uh, we have in UX. The first thing is UX is not UI. UI is what you see, UI is what you interact with on app or web. But UX is the overall experience someone gets from interacting with that product. So you have to differentiate the two. There are those people who just rush into creating very fancy uh, looking product, but then the experience is horrible. Yet it looks nice and it's desirable. Another thing, UX is not just about stability. Yes, it works. Yes, it works. But is it desirable? Is it looking nice? Because if it works, it might take me, like, uh, let's say I want to send money to US. It will work, it might work, yes. And then it takes like 30 minutes. You see? So UX is not just about uh, usability. I think I've talked about aesthetics. That is the look and feel of the app. You don't just, uh, or web, you don't just uh, look at that and uh, cater for that, forgetting about the overall uh, experience. Another thing, UX is not just about the users. I know this is controversial since uh, when you mention UX, the first thing that comes to, to many people's mind is user-centered design. But remember, for a business to meet its uh, goals and vision and mission, it has first to meet the user goals and needs. So it's not just about the users, because you also in the business of making money and generating uh, revenue. But who comes first? It's the user, yes. But we also have to look at other business processes that form the part of the whole experience for this to be a success for both parties, for both uh, sides of the users. Another thing, UX is not optional or one time. Design is always ongoing and it's not optional. Um, I can give example with, the, with the, an, an internal product that we had. So first, we are looking at solving, uh, getting the market first, uh, getting the product uh, first to the market. Then you actually think about it uh, afterwards. But after delivering this product, we had to spend so much, now going back, fixing all these things, and still maintaining that ongoing process of UX. But if from the moment, from the word go, we took care of UX, and we involved the various uh, UX craft or roles involved early, then we could have prevented this. So at that, we are looking at wasting time and uh, wasting money or other resources that uh, you might uh, need to make your, make, your, make your product. Think about uh, UX is not expensive. So that forms part of uh, the point that I've given above. Another thing, uh, UX is not a single discipline. Uh, I'm sure if there is any designer here, uh, when they are starting their career, uh, they used to, if you are hired, you used to be the UX researcher, the UX designer, not playing the uh, interaction of visual designer, you are the copywriter, but it's different and every role plays a major role um, in the process. It deliv they deliver differently and holistically, as they work as a team, a full-fledged team, then you're able to deliver what we call superior experience and what is part of a company's mission, being able to provide superior experiences, uh, no matter the touch points that uh, we have. So how do you measure UX? So this is heavily borrowed from uh, Google. We have what we call the HART uh, framework. So you measure happiness. So how do you measure happiness? things to do with net promoter scores, customer satisfaction, and even your star rating. So that's how you're able to measure, uh, to measure happiness. The other thing is engagement. So how are users engaging uh, with your content, 
and uh, with your products. So here you're looking at the average sessions that, uh, that your users uh, and the time they are spending on, um, on your app. The frequency, they keep coming. Do they keep coming? That you can be able to test. The other thing that we test uh, in UX is something we call adoption. So here you're looking at uh, the down rate that uh, you're going to have, your registration, as well as feature ad adoption, new features that you're able to deploy and sometimes not be able even to market, but they are still adapted. So that's uh, one way we measure um, UX. The other one is retention. And at this, you're looking at measuring and preventing churn rate. So losing your customers. Yes, you can have big uh, download numbers. You have like, uh, let's say a million downloads, but you're only having uh, active users of about 50,000. You see, that tells you and signifies that it's an issue that you need to look, to look at. And uh, for one way to solve it majorly, it's through uh, UX. The last one and very important is uh, task success. So how easy is it for your customers to complete a particular given, uh, given task. So here you're looking at, uh, let's say, the search exit rate, uh, the crash rates uh, that you still have uh, on, your, on your product. So as I said, uh, UX is not just one craft. We have several, apart from the ones that I've listed, but you can just uh, go through this. So here I have six, that is a UX researcher, a UX designer, a product designer, a visual designer, UX writer, and what we call uh, a UX unicorn. So for UX researcher, mainly they deal with both qualitative and quantitative uh, data and research parts of the system or of the process. So these are people that are always engaging with customer every time wanting to know what the customer needs, wanting to know how they feel, how they think, what triggers the different things that uh, results to making a decision for a customer. So by this, they are the ones that help the rest of the people be able to understand who they are designing and who they are creating for, and by that then you're providing a personalized and uh, a custom kind of um, experience. So a UX designer mostly does both uh, UX research and uh, visual design, so combines uh, both. But the difference between a product designer and a visual designer is a product designer can be able to handle the process end to end, looking at even the uh, project or product uh, management and other business related um, uh, processes, uh, like even service design, they are also able to to be able uh, to do that, uh, engaging with all other st uh, stakeholders. UX visual designers is who we call the UI designers. So these ones focuses on how the app looks and feels, nothing else. So they just get, uh, like what gets their decision is what has, that has been provided uh, maybe by, UX, uh, by a UX uh, researcher. One, uh, then we go to UX writer, and this is one of the most, uh, I'll say, not, uh, not looked into keenly when you're forming our teams. I don't know why. A UX writer, and it's very important, because this is a person who speaks and who sets the tone yeah, of, your communication, um, of the communication to your customers. So these are the people writing the description the call to action, what we call uh, CTAs, the success and error messages, and all other, any other text uh, or graphical, that, uh, graphical communication that may be, uh, may be needed in your, in your product. The last one uh, is who we call uh, UX unicorn. So this is a person who is able to do what the product designer can be able to do, and on top of that, this is able to do what we call front-end development. So they're able to design translate those designs into code and be able to deliver, uh, to deliver the experience in terms of uh, front-end development. Something, uh, other, others that I've left of, of this is uh, what you call information architecture. So there's someone who is looking at the flow of uh, information as well as how you arrange uh, the information um, in your product. 
So yeah, uh, we have that. And also we have what we call UX strategist. So not just designing to design and deliver something, but you're also looking at how your design work integrates uh, with the mission, with the vision of the company. And with that, you're able to come up with a UX strategy that then guides the rest of, this, uh, of these roles uh, in a typical uh, UX team. Yeah. So how do you get into UX? I know UX is not that, 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 uh, it hasn't uh, grown that much uh, in, our, in our industry. So first of all, I'll advise you that first you explore the different crafts. So don't specify or don't uh, decide that I'm going to be a UX researcher first without trying and getting to understand what other roles uh, do. Because if you do that, then it means even if you, you, you're preparing yourself to work in silos. And, and one thing with UX is it's a collaborative process. So you'll never work alone. Because if you work alone, whatever you find and whatever I design, there'll be a mismatch. And this, this mismatch will be felt by your customers, the work people you're creating for. Yeah? So one thing is look at the different roles, know what they do. Then, from that, look at, so what do I want to specify or to be specific and to master the craft in, in, yeah? The other thing is to learn and master your skill first. So many of the time you'll find you just did one video on uh, UX and actually you did a video on design on YouTube. Then you jump directly into designing, but you don't get to learn, uh, to learn the basics. There are many platforms that you can be able to learn uh, these skills, and they are free, and uh, they are online. So I personally am a self-taught uh, UX designer up to where I am uh, today. I think that will be very important is to master one or two tools. So you can do either Sketch, Adobe XD, or Figma, so that whatever you go, or whatever, whatever team you, you are assimilated into, am I? you get to work too, you are able to contribute without having to learn a new tool. Because once, uh, um, I'm, I'm forgetting a, 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 a famous saying about, I, I remember, I'll try to remember. But I'll try to remember and uh, give you and, uh, and tell you. But it's very key to master a tool. It's the same, let's say, someone who is a driver, a truck driver. They're as good as they are with whatever they are driving. So whatever tool you decide to get your hands on, kindly uh, master that. Another thing, you don't just learn and you're not practicing, because this is the only way you can be able to test uh, your understanding of whatever you've learned. So get practical skills. Uh, you can do self-initiated um, self projects. You can volunteer. You can, even, uh, uh, you can also look, uh, look out for internship, of which it will give you real-world experience. And you're, able, uh, you're also given a chance to practice whatever uh, you're learning. Another key thing is to find a mentor, so that uh, someone who can help you to navigate your way in the craft and uh, in the industry. So this is very important because it, it makes your learning uh, easier and shorter compared to you alone, one man, trying to cross a desert alone. When you have someone holding your hand, then it means that you go faster and you go far. And I think uh, the last thing uh, on how to get into UX is networking by joining design communities. Like these ones, uh, we have a couple in the country we have UX Kitchen, we have UI UX Nairobi Chapter. Uh, so there are many. And uh, by networking, you get to learn from, uh, from others. I myself have learned, I've learned a lot uh, from different people, uh, people who I thought uh, maybe I wasn't good enough, I'm they weren't good enough, but I've come to learn from all the people that uh, I've been able to interact with. Uh, in design communities. So thank you, that was my time. Asante Sana Alex, um, I don't know that this would fall in, into the bucket of, um, of, U, of UX, 
but um, there's a time an app was done and then you try to do a transaction. Imagine, imagine M-Pesa, you try to do a transaction, put a wrong number, and then it tells you, you have failed successfully. Is, 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 that, is, that, is that wrong feedback? You have entered the wrong number, and the money has not left, so you have failed successfully. But what does that do in terms of uh, user experience? You're there, Pesa imeenda, hijaenda, iku So those small things that you know, Alex is talking about are important. But the one I like most is, is a story about the urino. And you know in any public space, like in a hotel, or ukienda sherehe, the worst, the worst time is when you feel like you need to go and you need to visit, for me, the men's room. And because you have, you know, target, target issues, and the hotel is there saying, you know, we need to figure out the, the UX of our toilets because something is, not, something is not right. You go and you find splash zones the size of Indian Ocean. So some guy just said, you know, looking at, at the heart framework that Alex shared, and they started putting little goalposts right in the middle of the urino. Do you know what that did? Do you know what that did? It resulted to dry flaws. Because now suddenly, people are going to the bathroom and they were happy. And targets were achieved because now everyone analenga bizuri. And from a very simple design and saying, how do I make the UX of the urino better for both the user and the, and the establishment. So small things like that, I mean, should, should make us think a bit more intently about um, factors of UI UX. And to bring us almost to a close, we're now going to look at machine learning ops, looking beyond building models. And I'd like to welcome on stage Roseanne Odiero and Martin Oyua for this session. I'd request that you please Changamko with that speed a bit because of time. Karibuni. Hello. Oh, okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Martin Oyo. I'm a Discover graduate for machine learning at Safaricom. And um, yeah. And my name is Roseanne Oguelo Diero. I'm also a Discover graduate um, uh, with machine learning. Um, we're going to talk about ML ops beyond building models. Okay, so from, from generating the fastest route um, when you're going to work in the morning to um, getting uh, the, the next series, series that you can binge in, on Netflix, Machine learning has evolved from just a, a theoretical buzzword to a powerful technology that we use every single day. For modern businesses right now, like the appetite for machine learning is at its best. And, but like when you look at um, some, some industries, some industries are thriving as a result of machine learning. For example, um, fraud detection in finance or product recommendation in um, e-commerce sites like Amazon. But you'd be surprised that most machine learning models don't even leave production stage, uh, don't leave development stage and get into production. So this tweet um, was written in 2018. It took me three weeks to develop the model. Um, it's been 11 months and it's still not yet deployed. This, this is still a problem, yet it was written four, months, four years ago, sorry. It's still a problem that we are facing as machine learning engineers when it comes to deploying a model, yeah. Why is deploying a model so difficult? Organizations right now still work in silos where like data scientists do what data scientists do. Um, machine learning engineers do what they, like, they are supposed to do and they, there's no form of collaboration. There's a lengthy roadmap from when, from, from when you start 
uh, development all the way to deploying a model. And most of the time, real um, live data is not the same as the training data that you use to train your models when you're uh, deploying your models into production. And then there is um, a pos the possibility of model drift and data drift when you deploy your model into production. Um, so yeah, so what's the solution to all this? So we have um, MLOps. Um, yeah, okay. so what is MLOps, right? Um, you can think of MLOps as being uh, DevOps for machine learning systems. So it's, it's mostly involved with like building um, a process, or it, uh, it's more or less of a process or a streamlined um, system that helps us, uh, like that helps data scientists and IT personals. So this can be engineers who are, um, you can think of uh, DevOps engineers, software backend engineers and all that. So it helps them with like collaboration and increasing the pace at which we develop our models and also build like deployment pipelines and, um, and all that. So like deployment pipelines help us with things like versioning, uh, model governance, and also conducting like inferencing and um, yeah, inferencing and monitoring our models, yes. <laughs> um, just go back. Yeah, so if you look at that image, uh, you'll see we have like some sort of infinity loop. So this shows you how ML, how ML itself or MLOps itself is more of an iterative process. So you can never see that I'm going to build this model here, push it to production, and that's it. It's all about we always we're always trying to redesign the the problem anytime we have like things like model drifts, data drifts, and all that, and also doing the model development itself, which is which I believe everyone is com is like knows about this. So you're building a model and you have your data, the ADA process, evaluation, and all that. And then the most important step here is um, the operations part. Because once you build your models, what do you do with them? Do, we de we, we, do you just deploy them and keep them there? Or do you build like an ecosystem where these models can constantly be improved and monitored? Yeah, and, and all that. Yeah. So um, regular ML development looks like this. So where you have, um, like I say, you give an example, you have your data, you do your EDA or exploratory data analysis, and then you build your models, do the evaluation, and once you've trained your model, you save it, right? And then you serve it somewhere. So you can use APIs, you can build an API and deploy the model of the API and all that. But if you look at this process that we, we're most in tune with, you find that it's a very manual process because it's a manual process that can't really scale because it's just like a single thing. So you start from here and you move all the way to the end and that's it, right? And another thing is that it has like one-off handoff where as a data scientist, I will build a model, right? And push it to the IT system and tell them, Yo, you know what, aren't this deployed? Deal with it. Yeah, and forget about the model and all that. Um, and now with um, ML Ops, you can see we've introduced like the bottom layer where we have dotted lines, which is more of the automated process. You will still do the fast manual step where you do the orchestration of the experimentation, you build, like you do your EDA and your models and all that, but you're building this, this is a pipeline that you're building and then we, once you build that pipeline, you save it as a source code and then you use tools like GitLab or CICD tools and um, and also, and then deploy these pipelines. So instead of just deploying the model itself, you're now deploying the pipelines that you can now retrain when you feed with new data and all that. Yeah. So what are the benefits? Yeah, so we have more time to develop new models. Because think of it this way. Um, a machine learning engineer or a data scientist, I build a model, right? And how long does it take me to do that process itself? It's a very long time because you still need to do all the hyperparameter tuning, model evaluation, trying to figure out which algorithms I'm going to use. So if I, if you, if I have to keep on doing this all the time, it's going to take, we'll, never more, we'll more or less never be able to build like new models. We're always focusing on, okay, I need to improve this and that. But if you have a pipeline, if you have MLOps, you can always deploy like these pipelines and just, you know what, this is an automated process. If we need to change it, we just need to change one thing or another, but you can always have time to now focus on other things. Apart from that, it also brings about better collaboration. So think of it this way. Um, 
if you know DevOps, we have like software engineers building the applications, then you have a DevOps engineer, then you might have, what else do we have in DevOps, you know? <laughs> yeah, so um, in collaboration here, I mean is, um, I'm a data scientist, we need to deploy a model, you know, so MLOps will help us like streamline this process where we'll not be working in silos, which was mentioned initially, because we need to know, or like the IT people need to know, or like MLEs need to know what data scientists are working on and how we can help them improve on this, not just work on this and throw it to us and we'll deal with it, yeah. Oh, oh okay. Okay, so how can we ad adopt this? Um, so there are, there are a couple of principles and components that are required to ensure that um, you, you can successfully implement MLOps in your ML workflow. And one of the major principles that we have to ensure that you have is uh, ensure that you have CI-CD automation. You have to ensure that um, your, your code or your model can be reproduced. Versioning is very, very important of both the code data and the model. You have to ensure that there is collaboration between all the, all the different um, engineers who are working on the, deploying the model. Um, you have to ensure that there is continuous training. Um, you have to ensure that there is continuous tra tra training even um, after deploying your model. Okay, I'm going to give you an example, yeah? How many of you have, have been requested by a social media platform to follow someone that you don't even like? <laughs> There's no, yeah, you, you're told to follow someone like, like you've not liked since primary school. The model should be able to, to train all, continuously, even after deployment. Um, there has to be continuous monitoring to ensure that the accuracy of the model is still very accurate even after your model has been uh, taken to production. Yes. So some of the tools that you can use for the MLOps process, as you can see, we have a lot of them. But like one we would like to highlight is from one of our sponsors, <laughs> so AWS SageMaker. So you can use it to more or less do the entire flow of the MLOps cycle. So from um, model development, uh, op operationalization of like these pipelines, and all the way to like monitoring your, your algorithms. And some few um, open source tools that you can think of too are like Kubeflow and MLflow. We can also help us with like do, um, deal with stuff like this, yeah. So some of, these are like a bunch of tools. So if you'd like to know more about them, you can just <laughs> take a picture and Google them or something. Yeah. Or join yeah. the engineering community. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we will true, be talking true, more true, on true, this. True, true, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, OK, so the kind of talent that should be, um, impl OK, should collaborate um, in the ML ops workflow is data scientist, data engineer, software engineer, DevOps engineer, and backend engineer should all work to, uh, and collaborate with the ML engineer or, or ML ops engineer to ensure that the model is taken um, smoothly into production. They should not, uh, we should ideally try as much as possible as organizations to avoid working in silos. Yes. Okay, so now this is more or less our last slide. So like, what is the state of ML ops at Safaricom? Yeah, so I'd say this all boils down to the vision that we have at Safaricom, which is to be a purpose-led technology company whereby we have our customers at the center of everything that we do, right? So how does this customer obsession translate to, um, like, when it comes to thinking about um, big data and, um, and AI? So it all boils down to one thing, like trying to understand our customers better. Yeah, and machine learning with the help of like, okay, with the help of machine learning and, um, and all the data that we collect from our applications, um, platforms like Zuri, your interactions with Zuri, and also calls to a call center, like they are key. So ML is key for us to utilize this particular data. And ML flow, not, yeah, ML ops fits into this particular, fits in well with this because it helps us automate the process of training our models, 
um, retraining our models, evaluating our models, reevaluating our models in order for us to constantly be improving on how we service our customers. Yeah. And other than that, we also partner with, um, we're also trying to foster partnerships in order to like, support us for the future. And AWS, as I mentioned, is, also, is one of our key partners when it comes to, to this. Yeah. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Rosanne and, and, uh, and Martin. I think I'm very excited when I see, let me just call it young blood, you know, really pushing the envelope. This is what, this is what uh, Kamocho was speaking about earlier. Us being at the forefront of scratching our own itch. We know we have the data sets and we know we can build out the yeah, models that will actually help us realize some of the business benefits. You realize that they said that they are also in the experimental phase. We are always in this state of mind that you know, big organizations have kind of like figured it out, but clearly not. So can you move the same speed as, a, as an SME or as a medium enterprise, move at the same speed with all this new technology that uh, some of the big companies are? Yes, you can, because apart from there being open source solutions, there's also you know, partner solutions like you've seen from AWS that you can quickly, uh, quickly jump on. Now to close out this session for, uh, for developer, the developer community, I'd like to call Iman from Safaricom Financial Services to just give a quick highlight and some clarifications on the Daraja ecosystem. And then I will tell you how we close out the day by making money. Iman Karibu. Hi, good evening. Good evening. So I'm not going to do a presentation. I think we've had enough of them. Um, earlier on, we got a um, presentation from Elijah. I remember Elijah on Daraja. So I just wanted to clarify that, um, I mean, as we work on Daraja as uh, Safaricom, um, we can see the excitement within the community, and it's growing by the day. And uh, it's interesting to see such people, such as Elijah, who are out there and trying to drive this to the rest of the community for um, awareness and all that. But uh, just a clarification that tomorrow we're going to be having a deep dive uh, with the actual uh, Daraja squad, which is the team within Safaricom uh, Financial Services that is working on this uh, platform. And I think we might have interacted with them from time to time for the developers. So we're going to be having a deep dive in it and they're going to be around um, in the room where you're going to ask all kinds of stuff that you want to ask and also get to engage them as the experts who are developing this platform. So I hope uh, you're excited about that and it's just a clarification we wanted to put out that uh, the team working on this is going to be here tomorrow to uh, bring that clarification and uh, just make you appreciate it from the guys who are actually doing it. So I hope that is good enough and uh, Yep, see you tomorrow. Uh, back to you, Mbogo. Asante, even for that clarification. So it gives you something to look forward to tomorrow where the, um, the Daraja team will be, will be here, like you heard, a deep dive, any questions that you may have, anything that you may need clarified, any issues that you may have as a developer and you have and you've never quite gotten answered, the team will be here to, um, to answer those. Now, heading towards the close of our day, I'd like to speak about the Mozilla Coding Challenge. And this is about something called Common Voice. So now Common Voice is a crowdsourcing project started by Mozilla to create a free database for speech recognition software. And this project is supported by volunteers who contribute um, or who record sample sentences with a microphone and also review uh, the recordings of others. So Mozilla is actually inviting you who are part of the Safaricom engineering community to help in training the data in local languages, specifically Kiswahili, okay? And by contributing uh, during, this, um, during this, this Mozilla Coding Challenge, you know, the first prize will be 50,000 bob, second prize will be 30,000 bob, and third prize will be 20,000 shillings. I'd like to invite Kathleen from Mozilla to walk us through what that coding challenge would look like. Karibu Kathleen, let us know what the coding challenge would look like. Well. 
Um, and I don't know how many of you noticed or shared the sentiment, but I was a bit worried that it would remain a boys' club. So as the day has progressed, things have changed. But then as a leader in the space and having created this space for engineering, don't settle for maintaining the status quo. It may be that, yes, female representation in engineering is 20% or 30%. But build a narrative. I challenge you to build a narrative where we speak of 50% participation and at all levels of, of engineering, of tech in general. That being said, I'm now going to go into the section where I speak about common voice and the coding challenge, which is, you know, for you participants. Um, so what is common voice? Uh, common voice is a project that was launched in June of 2017. Um, it's, it's a project that aims to build open and publicly available data sets of labeled audio that anyone can use to create voice-enabled applications. It's part of Mozilla's efforts to help teach machines how real people speak. Um, it's a bet that we're making about the future of human-machine interaction. And it's a project that is aimed at making voice recognition open and accessible to everyone. So the current status quo in voice, in voice recognition or speech recognition is such that big tech leads it because they hold access to all the data sets. But with Mozilla Common Voice, what we'd like is for those data sets to be open, to be accessible, and for literally anyone who cares about language to be able to get on the platform, incentivize the community around them to start creating a data set and at the end of the day to be empowered enough to train a speech recognition system. Um, for Kiswahili, um, in the latest release of the data sets, oh, actually, <laughs> there we go. In the, in the latest release of the data set, we now have 732 hours of data, and our target is to get this data set to between 1,000 and 2,000 hours of data in the, in the coming year. And also being cognizant of the fact that voice recognition systems have been biased and have poor performance on women as well as older populations, we're working to ensure that these demographics, which are likely to be underrepresented in the corpus, are intentionally included, not only at the point of data collection, but then also through the whole pipeline. So as we think about who we are empowering to be able to build tools um, and end user applications, as well as what problems those tools are solving, we are centering everyone who is likely to be underrepresented, and that is women, um, older populations who may not be as tech savvy as the young ones, and where Kiswahili is concerned, there's a lot of diversity in Kiswahili speakers, so people with, diff with varying accents, people who may speak some of the relate related dialects, which are smaller, um, just to name a few. Uh, community is core to the Mozilla Common Voice project. Therefore, a large component of our work focuses on community building efforts. Um, we found great success in engaging with individuals who we have termed community champions. And these are individuals in the community that have already shown an interest in the language and in growing a more diverse data set with regards to use in technology. So, we worked to identify different champions within countries that are speaking Kiswahili, or countries within which Kiswahili is spoken. So, so far we have champions in Kenya, in Tanzania, and in the DRC. Um, and there are a wide variety of events that community champions are resourced to host. Uh, and all these are centered around growing a community around the Kiswahili language, and also around thinking about more inclusive uh, use technology for voice as a use case. So on to our coding challenge today. Uh, if you would like to participate, this is the slide of this presentation that you should take a screenshot of or take a picture of. Um, so there's a notebook that's provided. And the task or the challenge of the day is to train our kids that have been confirmed for tomorrow that could be. Um, and you'll be using the Mozilla Common Voice data sets. Uh, you'll be using a subset of the data set. The data set is, itself is, is too large to expect you to download and train an actual model using the entire thing. So what we've done is created a toy sample, which is about um, 200 instances of audio accompanied by transcribed text. Uh, we'll be using a, a toolkit known as Corky AI, which is based on Mozilla's deep speech model. 
And the challenge lies in training the best performing model. So um, thank you, MC, for introducing the challenge. So we'll be ranking people based on how well their model performs. We'll be using the uh, character error rates in particular. Um, and then first, second, and third prize get awarded the, the amounts that have already been mentioned. Uh, so yeah, first place gets 50K, second place gets 30K, and third place gets uh, 20K. Um, beyond the coding challenge today, um, we have a wider ongoing competition. Uh, it's termed our, it, or it's dubbed Our Voices. So the Our Voices competition is intended to fight bias in voice technology. And the goal is to seek more diverse and inclusive speech recognition tools. Uh, it has a prize pool of 20K USD. And I think the max that any one individual can win or any one team can win is about 2,000 USD. The four categories that uh, you can submit to participate in are gender, variant and accent, methodologies, and open call. So beyond training and optimizing models, which is what the toy challenge that we have set up today is about, the core of this work is to ensure good performance on users with diverse demographic characteristics. So part of this needs to be contributing towards the actual Mozilla Common Voice dataset itself. And the more the diverse a data set we can build together, the better. So we encourage you to first check out our booth today on the far left of the room, right next to the entrance, if you haven't already, um, where you can be walked through how to contribute your own voice. Um, and then for those intending to participate in the wider challenge, a recommendation from us would be to include community engagement as part of your strategy, such that if you're looking to address inclusion from a gender or age perspective, or perhaps an accent or variant perspective, because we know that as Kiswahili speakers, again, there's a lot of diversity amongst us, you first begin by mobilizing individuals from the demographic group that you're focusing on to contribute their voice, and then this can be used to train or to fine tune and finally to test. So it may be that you have access to a community that speaks the Kimvita dialect. Uh, basically what we're saying is that a starting point is to get those people in a room and to get them contributing before you move on to the stage where you're actually training models. Uh, all that being said, I'm now going to switch to the notebook and quickly walk you through it. Um. So in the back, please allow me to change to my display. Hello? Is anyone going to switch to my demo, please? Okay, they say one second. Um, this is not intended as an introduction to ML or NLP. We're sort of throwing you into the deep. I promise it's a very simple notebook. The most challenging thing is just downloading the data set and putting it in a folder and then directing your notebook to access that folder. So 
the notebook is going to walk you through installing Koki AI. It's a notebook on Google's Colab platform, so you don't need to install anything on your local machine. Um, it walks you through installing the libraries that you need, um, and then it goes into accessing the data set. So that's located in a Google Drive. All I'll ask you to do is that you add it to your own Google Drive, and then there's code there which walks you through um, mounting your Google Drive location, your Google Drive, and then navigating to the particular location where that data is. Um, where that data is located. The data is already formatted to be used in Koki AI, but then if you're participating in the wider challenge, then you'll have to dig into Koki and discover the intricacies of actually getting the data. Okay, yay, we finally have it. Um, yeah, it's a very short notebook again. I've already la run <laughs> all of these cells because you know the, the thing they say about live demos, everything that can go wrong will go wrong. So this is one that I've already run. Uh, first step is to install the Koki speech to text libraries, um, which happens. Then you'll need to go ahead and run the next cell which mounts a Google Drive. No, actually, I've skipped a part. So, Go through the text that are included between the cells because um, as you discover, we have pre-formatted the data already, which means that all you need to do is go to this drive location, add it to your own drive, and then mount your drive. So with this cell, you mount your Google Drive. Uh, with this cell, you give it the um, directory location where you've put that particular folder. So this is probably the only cell that I would expect you to change at the first run of the notebook. Uh, if that runs successfully, you can take a look at the data. You'll see that it is in WAV format. And then within the folder, there's also three CSV files. One contains your, your training data, one contains your test data, and one contains your dev data. And of course, all of that is the files that we have in this folder. So the CSVs themselves is just the, the file names. Then configuring and setting the hyperparameters. In subsequent runs of this uh, notebook, as you're working on the challenge, this is where I'll expect you to do most of the work. Uh, as of now, we're only defining our train dev and test. We're asking it to create a checkpoint directory so that as you train, progress is saved at different stages. Uh, we're creating an initial model with 200 hidden layers. We are training for one epoch. Of course, one epoch is not going to give us any reasonable results, and you'll see that towards the end of the, of the notebook. But at this point, our intention is just to make sure that everything actually runs beyond which you can be independent and play with a bunch of things. And then we're using Beam as a decoding algorithm with a width of one. You, there's a lot of other hyperparameters available in Koki AI that you can play around with and see if you can tune your model to get better performance. So just to see what is available, um, that's what the intention of this cell is, so that you can view all the config settings. So play around with dropout rates, play around with um, the landing rate, see if you, if you use a different regularizer, whether that will give you um, better results. And the whole idea of this is that as you are doing the challenge, if you don't know or haven't encountered some of this terminology or some of this stuff, then it's a learning opportunity. So please, by all means, explore, but then the intention is to find the ideal settings that give you the, the best um, performance. After which you'll train the model. So you'll see here that it first does a test run where it says if the following process crashes, you will likely have uh, batch sizes that are too big. Um, but then it, it starts, okay, so it's, it performs a couple of checks. Um, if you have enough memory, uh, if all the variables are in order before doing an actual epoch. And we've, because we've set it to train for only one epoch, you see that it does epoch zero and then it stops. So if you're actually training, depending on how much time you have on your hands, it may be that you want to do 10 epochs and see how long that takes. And then you say, okay, now I'll do 100 epochs and see how long that takes. Each time taking note of whether your metrics are actually improving and whether your model is learning something of use. And then at the end, we have the test the model um, cell, where as of now, you see the output is 
it's not anything useful. And we expect that because we've only trained it for one epoch. But then um, in the first example, we see that the sentence is Urefu wake ni sawa na urefu utaka ujitokeza baada ya kupanga magari tisa marefu kiasi. But then the result that the model gives us is ah, 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 etc. So chain it longer, see if you, when you add more layers, does that lead you towards better performan, performing metrics? Um, but the three things we'll be looking at is the word error rate, the character error rate, and the loss. And then finally in the notebook, we also give details on how you can submit to the challenge if you are participating. There's a form we've created. Within the form, you'll be expected to take two screenshots that we would like you to upload. The first screenshot is going to be of the cell where you define your hyperparameters. Uh, so that is this cell over here. Um, it can get very long. As you have seen, the hyperparameters can almost be endless. So because it's one screenshot, we ask that you zoom out and screenshot everything um, and not take a screenshot of only a subsection of it. Second part that we would like you to screenshot and upload in the form is the output from your test uh, cell, just to ascertain that the, the metrics you report is stuff that you actually got. So here we ask that you take a screenshot of the top part, because that's where the, the best metrics are reported. Um, yeah, beyond that, there'll be um, some text inputs or some text boxes where you now manually input the word error rate, character error rate, and the loss, and we'll be using that to determine our first, second, and third prize winners. Um, and then finally, to conclude, remember that this is part of a wider challenge, and we have much more money up for grabs in the coming months in the year. So we encourage you to participate. Please reach out if you would like to and if we can support you in any way. Um, yeah, and I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. And here I was thinking that it was going to be an easy 50K. I go home, get my kamusi, adopt my best Swahili accent. Uh, and then the, the 50K for, for Sato checks in. Kumbe, it is, a, it, is, it is work. Actually, what is the name of the toolkit that um, Kathleen mentioned? I don't have a thousand on me today, now, 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 but I will get it. So what was the name of, that, of the toolkit? Yes? Um, spell, spell cookie. Yes, you got it right. I thought people are not paying attention. So yeah, it's, it's Koki, C-O-Q-U-I. OK? Not Koki. Don't go say, learn me jifunza Koki, kukua Koki. No, no, it's not that. It's a different Koki. And I think, like you've been told, the Mozilla Challenge is it's part of a much bigger one. So I'm also really excited to see uh, you know, who gets to, to, um, to win those prizes. Because do you know, do you know how, many, how many Swahili speakers there are on the continent? So remind me, that, that's, that's, a, that's a G in airtime for you. How many Sohili speakers do we have on the continent, and why should this project excite you? Yes. Sorry? 142 million. I don't know if to apply that error rate. Another one, another try. How many Sohili speakers do we have on the continent? Yes. 200. 200 million, yes. That is, the, that is the given estimate of Swahili speakers across 14 possible uh, countries, and this is either as a first or second language. So this should tell you that the project that Mozilla is on is onto something, because it would be nice to eventually switch on your Google Maps and then I be a Peter Hapokando, Naksha, Upinde Hivi, you know? We, try the Nigerian one, it's, 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 it's exciting, or the Indian one, you know? It, uh, it's a high time we had uh, you know, some of this Swahili stuff actually enabled on, on quite a number of our platforms. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the close of the larger part of, um, of the day. And I'd like to call on stage Peter Kowetsky Tanui, who's the Dev, Dev, DevSecOps engineer at Safaricom, to give us his summary of how he felt the day went. And then we can close the day from there. Peter, Karibu.
Hello. Hello. Hi, developers. This is developers, innovators, founders, eh? a lot of exciting people in the community. And we're really glad that today we have launched officially the Safaricom, uh, the Safari, the engineering community, Safaricom engineering community. Very excited, very glad. We don't know what seed we have sowed. We don't know what it will come out to be, yeah? So Mozilla is an open source big community as well. And shout out to our presenter from Mozilla, as well as other, other, other sponsors that we've had today. And so today has been quite an exciting day, starting from George, who gave us the journey of Safaricom, from having us deploy, uh, develop our products from vendors to coming in-house. We have really uh, had milestones in terms of growing our engineering fact our software factory. And also we had a talk from Paul Kasimu, and it is quite important that we have a pipeline of, of innovative developers so that we never run dry of, of that resource. And we have to really capitalize on the young demographic that we have as a country. Also, we had a talk from Michael. So Michael gave us a rich history of tech. He's a guy with white hair, so he's quite seen a lot in this space, and he's quite a, an authority in the space itself. So he spoke about Kuza Lab and how it all started, and his emphasis was on skill. So if you're in the tech space, skills do matter, much as also your certificate matters, right? So it is important that even within this community, we empower and lift each other, because there are some things, like Koki, I do not know how to use it, but probably maybe I can learn from someone here who's played with the tool. So it is quite exciting that even us as a community, as the engineering community, Safaricom, we are going to shape each other and sharpen each other's skills. And yes, we had Kamochu with his elaborate demo on HTTP. I think we are right now in version 4, he said. But that was quite good. He was telling us you know, how we should push for software engineering. And yeah, I think I should also commend him. I think Tuna Jenga has a series of hackathons uh, for the guys who are into GSM. So the guys, the, what are they? The, 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 I'm in the telco, but these things also confuses me. Uh, things like what, HLR and those kind of things, yeah? Uh, there's some protocols there I don't even know. Even USSD, I didn't even know exactly how it works, and the all USSD gateway. So, Thank you very much, um, Kamosh. And then we deep dive into the segue that was dubbed Maverick. Here, there's a movie out, by the way, uh, called The Maverick. Uh, but here, the guys who are pushing at, at the front. So, like, I know most guys here are like F1 fanatics. Me, I'm like, you know, the jet fighters and stuff. So Tom Cruise has that like a, a video. So when, when, when I saw Maverick, I was just reminded of that. So these are the people who push, who, who've really pushed edges in the, like the, the frontier of, of, of their space. And we actually saw uh, Chaos Engineering by my colleague Javan Oyugi here. We had the RPA team showcase, you know, how they can uh, automate processes. And of course, uh, yours truly, we had a segment with the DevOps. It didn't go too well. Promise you, we'll pick it up tomorrow, and then you'll see how awesome our demo was. And then we also had a presentation from the DXL by David Kazi. So David Kazi showed us how DXL was built and, and sort of like how they expose APIs and how you know, third parties interact with the APIs and even how we internally consume our APIs through applications like my Safaricom app, which was quite amazing. And then we had the Daraja team. So we have Daraja 2.0 and a lot of new APIs you're going to see tomorrow. One that fascinates me a lot is the dynamic, the dynamic UR. So if you go to Naivas right now, you're able to scan and pay seamlessly. Quite interesting. But tomorrow come, expect to see from this code themselves as they showcase to us the vast array of APIs, both internally and externally, that are exposed to you. And we want their community to come and inform us, take feedback from you of how we can actually improve our APIs and which APIs should we also expose further. Yes, and then there was the My Safaricom app. Brian showed us uh, the features and, and, and their workings within the My Safaricom app, which is a very novel product that we have uh, at Safaricom. Not only does it attract high ratings on the Play Store, but also it is always up. I don't think My Safaricom app has ever disappointed anyone in this room. So, to top it, all, uh, to top it up, so there is a new space called IoT. So the IoT guys came here and they showed us how they are able, you know, to yeah, uh, you know, track and like sort of like have intelligence in our, in our ERPs or in our systems like our refrigerators. They even showcase us how they were able to track the safari rallies, which is quite uh, something attractive in, in, in our market. And then let me take this opportunity to also register um, 
the talk by our HOD, Liz. So Liz took us through the different chapters that we have, and we were able to be presented to us the chapter leads for those particular chapters within the engineering community. So there are vast number of, of communities where you can plug in, yeah, anytime. So we're going to have events, outreach, and we hope that you will get interested, the people who are very passionate about certain, certain spaces within the tech, like for example, the IoT, uh, there's performance, there's, AWS, there's cloud, I was about to say AWS cloud, but there's cloud space. So you can come and you can yeah, join on board. We'll soon be hitting um, uh, your campuses. We're going to do the, those outreach. We are going to hold conferences and we're gonna like shape each other and, 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 and spar you know, technology within our community. So um, yeah, we celebrate the leads who took up those positions and we look forward to the conferences you know, and of course, the hackathons. We are really looking forward to those. Yes. And let me finally point to Mbogo and Jihia. Uh, very, I actually like, this guy is very informative, yeah? I mean, after every presentation, he had an opinion about that. Like, this guy knows IoT, he knows machine learning, he knows software engineering. Like, what doesn't he know? This guy is an authority in technology, and I think it was actually a best fit to be our MC. And for that, let us just appreciate our MC once more, Bugwa G here. An amazing job, an amazing job, an amazing DJ. I don't get any to some things, man. But all right, thank you so much, Bugwa. So today, that is what we were able to showcase. I promise you, come tomorrow, we're going to have hackathons, and we are going to also have, as I've mentioned, the Deraja team. But much, much more awaits you tomorrow. So for our guys, even online, those who are able to make it, we really appreciate your time. We really appreciate the comments there on YouTube and also on, what's this other thing? What's the other thing, what's the other space? Slack, not Slack, what's the other thing? What's, D Discord, yes, Discord it is, man. Keep tuned, keep tuned. Tomorrow, I promise, going to be hella fire. It's going to be crazy tomorrow. Turn up on time from 8 a.m. We're going to take it, and then there's a cocktail tomorrow, I'm told, in the evening, so if you find time, driving, there's parking in Sarit, come, let's have fun, let's engage, let's network, let's see where we can grow as a community. That wraps it all. I've been your uh, vote of thanks giver. And shout out to all our sponsors, by the way. We have Mozilla, Dell, Technology, AWS, Huawei, iTalent, Oracle, TDG, all the sponsors, we really appreciate it. And from me to you, goodbye, see you tomorrow, cheers. Santa Sana Peter for what I call a rapid fire recap. Rapid fire recap. And um, nothing more to add from what he said, just maybe to give you a promise about tomorrow. We shall have live coding sessions courtesy of AWS. We shall also have, um, um, of course, the outcomes from the hackathons, so you don't want to miss that. See the teams that are working away the money. There'll be a lot more people in the room. We expect um, the Safaricom CEO to grace us tomorrow. And tomorrow we start at 9, 9 a.m. promptly, both on the, both on the socials and, and, and in person. So I'd urge you to keep the conversations going. There can be different types of trivia looking at, at engagement that we have on, um, on the social media network. Remember, the hashtag is Safaricom Decode. So that said, from myself and my co-host, Mariam, who was handling the, the, the virtual audience and the technical crew that has made today possible, I'd like to say, Thank you, good evening, and see you tomorrow. Asante, DJ Mish.